Gildan Media presents Your Coach in a Box, affordable, life-changing audio programs. The End The Defiance and Destruction of Hitler's Germany, 1944-1945 to By Ian Kershaw Narrated by Sean Pratt Preface As disastrous defeat loomed in early 1945, Germans were sometimes heard to say they would prefer an end with horror to a horror without end. An end with horror was certainly what they experienced, in ways and dimensions unprecedented in history. The end brought destruction and human loss on an immense scale. Much of this could have been avoided had Germany been prepared to bow to Allied terms. The refusal to contemplate capitulation before May 1945 was, therefore, for the Reich and the Nazi regime not just destructive, but also self-destructive. A country defeated in war almost always at some point seeks terms. Self-destruction, by continuing to fight on to the last, down to almost total devastation and complete enemy occupation, is extremely rare. Yet that is what the Germans did in 1945. Why? It is tempting to give a simple answer. Their leader, Hitler, persistently refused to entertain any thought of surrender, so there was no option but to fight on. But this simply poses other questions. Why were Hitler's self-destructive orders still obeyed? What mechanisms of rule enabled him to determine Germany's fate when it was obvious to all with eyes to see that the war was lost and the country was being utterly laid waste? How far were Germans prepared to support Hitler to the end, even though they knew he was driving the country to destruction? Were they in fact still giving him their willing backing, or were they merely terrorized into doing so? How and why did the armed forces continue fighting and the government machine keep on functioning to the end? What alternatives did Germans, civilians and soldiers, have in the last phase of the war? These and other questions soon arise, then, from what seems at first to be a straightforward query inviting a simple answer. They can only be tackled by examining structures of rule and mentalities as the catastrophe inexorably engulfed Germany in 1944 to 1945. That is what this book seeks to do. I first thought of writing such a book because, to my surprise, I couldn't think of another book which had tried to do what I had in mind. There are, of course, libraries of books about the end of the war, written from different perspectives and widely varying in quality. There are important studies of the top Nazi leaders, and increasingly, of some of the regional chieftains, the Gauleiter. Biographies exist also for many of the leading military figures. There are literally thousands of accounts of events in the final climactic weeks of the Third Reich, both at the front and, it sometimes seems, for practically every town and village in Germany. Many local studies give graphic, often horrific, descriptions of the fate of individual townships, as the unstoppable advance of the Allied and Soviet military juggernauts enveloped them. Memoirs of experiences at the front or in the homeland, in cities pounded by Allied bombs, or facing the ordeals of flight and homelessness abound. Detailed, often localized, military histories or accounts of specific Wehrmacht units or major battles are also commonplace while the battle for Berlin, in particular, has naturally been the focus of numerous works. The sixth volume of the German Democratic Republic's official history of the war, produced in the 1980s, despite its obvious ideological slant, provides a valuable attempt at a comprehensive military history, not confined to events on the front. And more recently, the last volumes of the Federal Republic's own outstanding official military history series, offer excellent detailed studies of the Wehrmacht, often stretching far beyond operational history. Even so, these and other fine works on military history touch on only some, if important, aspects 
of what I thought was necessary to answer the question I wanted to tackle. My initial intention had been to approach the problem through exploring the structures of rule in Nazi Germany in its last phase. It seemed to me that the major structural histories of the Third Reich tended to peter out largely by late 1944, dealing quite superficially with the final months of the regime. This applies also to studies of the Nazi party and its affiliates. It rapidly became plain to me, however, that a mere structural analysis would not be enough, and that my examination had to be extended to the mentalities, at different levels, that underpinned the continued functioning of the regime. A comprehensive study of German mentalities in the last months has not yet been attempted. Reconstructing them has to be done, therefore, from fragments. I have tried to take into account the mentalities of rulers and ruled, of Nazi leaders and lowly members of the civilian population, of generals and ordinary soldiers, and on both the eastern and the western fronts. It is a wide canvas, and I have to paint with a broad brush. I can, of course, present only selective examples to illustrate the spectrum of attitudes. For not least of the problems in trying to generalize about mentalities is that during its final months, and at a highly accelerated pace in its last weeks, the Nazi regime was splintering as well as shrinking. Germany was a big country, and while, obviously, the extreme pressures of war afflicted all of its regions, they did not do so at the same time or in exactly the same ways. Experiences of the civilian population in the different parts of the country and those of soldiers in different theaters of war naturally varied. I have tried to mirror the differing mentalities rather than resort to superficial generalizations. The book mainly relates to what we might call the majority German population. There were, however, others whose experiences, themselves not reducible to easy generalization, were quite separate from those of most Germans, since they did not and could not belong to mainstream German society. The fate of the horribly persecuted pariah groups in the clutches of the Nazis forms a further important part of the story of the continued functioning of the Nazi regime, amid the inexorable collapse and gathering doom. For, unenviable in the extreme as the situation was for most Germans, for the regime's racial and political enemies, ever more exposed to vicious retribution as it imploded, The murderous last months were a time of barely imaginable horror. Even when it was faltering and failing in every other respect, the Nazi regime managed to terrorize, kill, and destroy to the last. The history of the Nazi regime in its final months is a history of disintegration. In trying to tackle the questions I posed to myself, The main problem of method that I faced was the daunting one of trying to blend the varied facets of the fall of the Third Reich into a single history. It amounts to trying to write an integrated history of disintegration. The only convincing way to attempt this, in my view, had to be through a narrative approach, though thematically structured within each chapter, that covered the last months of the regime. One logical place to begin would have been in June 1944, as Germany was militarily beset in the West by the consolidation of the successful Allied landings in Normandy, and in the East by the devastating breakthrough of the Red Army. However, I chose to start with the aftermath of the attempt on Hitler's life in July 1944, because this marked a significant internal scissura for the Nazi regime. From there, I look in successive chapters at the German reactions to the Wehrmacht's collapse in the West in September, the first incursion of the Red Army onto German soil the following month, the hopes raised, then promptly dashed by the Ardennes Offensive in December, the catastrophe in the eastern provinces as they fell to the Soviets in January, the sharp escalation of terror at home in February, the crumbling of the regime in March, the last desperate attempts to hold out accompanied by uncontrolled violence toward German citizens and especially perceived enemies of the regime in April 
and the efforts of the Donuts regime, even in early May, to fight on until troops in the east could be brought westwards. The book ends at the German capitulation on the 8th of May, 1945, and the subsequent arrest of members of the Dönitz administration. Only through a narrative approach, I felt, could the dynamic and the drama of the dying phase of the regime be captured, as it inexorably fell apart in the wake of gathering military defeat. Only this way, too, I thought, was it possible to witness the ever-despairing, but nevertheless for months partially effective, attempts to stave off the inevitable. The improvisation and scraping of the barrel that allowed the system to continue to function. The escalating brutality that ultimately ran amok, and the imploding self-destructiveness of Nazi actions. Some important elements of the story necessarily recur in more than one chapter. Bombing of cities, desertion of soldiers, death marches of concentration camp prisoners, the evacuation of civilian populations, collapsing morale, the ramping up of internal repression, the increasingly desperate propaganda ploys are, for example, not confined to a single episode. But the narrative structure is important in showing how devastation and horror, if present throughout, intensified over the passage of time in these months. I have tried, consequently, to pay close attention to chronology and build up the picture essentially through going back to archival sources, including plentiful use of contemporary diaries and letters. It is important to emphasize what this book is not. It is not a military history, so I don't describe what took place on the battlefield in any detail and provide only a brief overview of developments on the fronts as a backcloth to the questions that are central to the book. Nor does my book attempt to provide a history of Allied planning or of the stages of the Allied conquest. Rather, it views the war solely through German eyes in the attempt to understand better how and why the Nazi regime could hold out for so long. Finally, the book does not deal with the important question of continuities beyond the capitulation and into the occupation period, or the behavior of the German population once a territory was occupied before the end of the war. It is impossible to recapture the reality of what it must have been like in those awful months, how ordinary people survived through extraordinary and horrifying circumstances. And though I have worked on the Third Reich for many years, I found it hard as well to grasp fully the sheer extent of the suffering and death in this climax of the war. Suffering should not and cannot be reduced to bare numbers of casualties. Even so, simply the thought that the losses, dead, wounded, missing and captured, in the Wehrmacht, not counting those of the Western Allies and the Red Army, ran at about 350,000 men per month in the last phase of the war itself gives a sense of the absolute slaughter on the fronts, far in excess of that of the First World War. Within Germany, too, death was omnipresent. Most of the half a million or so civilian victims of Allied bombing were caused by air raids on German cities in the very last months of the war. In these same months, hundreds of thousands of refugees lost their lives fleeing from the path of the Red Army. Not least, the terrible death marches of concentration camp internees, most of them taking place between January and April 1945, and accompanying atrocities, left an estimated quarter of a million dead through exposure, malnutrition, exhaustion, and random slaughter. The extent to which Germany had become an immense charnel house in the last months of the Third Reich is barely imaginable. At least by the end of writing the book, I did think, however, that I had come closer to an answer to the question I had set myself. How and why, given the scale of the mounting calamity, Hitler's regime could function, if, naturally, with diminishing effectiveness, for so long? If others think that after listening to this book they too understand that better, I shall be well satisfied. Introduction.
going down in flames. Wednesday, the 18th of April, 1945. American troops are at the gates of the town of Ansbach, administrative capital of central Franconia. The Nazi district leader has fled during the night. Most German soldiers have been moved to the south. The citizens have been camped out in air raid shelters for days. Any rational thinking signals surrender. But the military commandant of the town, Dr. Ernst Mayer, a 50-year-old colonel of the Luftwaffe with a doctorate in physics, is a fanatical Nazi insistent on fighting to the end. A 19-year-old theology student, unfit for military service, Robert Limpert, decides to act to prevent his town being destroyed in a senseless, last-ditch battle. Limpert had witnessed the complete devastation through Allied bombs of the beautiful city of Würzburg the previous month. This had prompted him to the dangerous venture of distributing leaflets earlier in April, pleading for the surrender of Ansbach, its picturesque Baroque and Rococo buildings still intact, without a fight. He now takes an even bigger risk. Around 11 a.m. on that lovely spring morning, he cuts the telephone wires which he thinks connect the Commandant's base with the Wehrmacht unit outside the town. A futile attempt at sabotage, in fact, since unbeknown to him the base had just moved. He is spotted doing so by two boys, members of the Hitler Youth. They report what they have seen, and the matter is urgently taken up by the local constabulary. A policeman is sent to Limpert's house, who finds the young man in possession of a pistol and incriminating evidence, and arrests him. The local police report the arrest to the head of the remaining civil administration in Ansbach, who telephones the military commandant, currently out of town. Predictably, enraged by what he hears, the commandant hastens to the police station and peremptorily establishes a three-man tribunal consisting of the head of the constabulary, his deputy, and the commandant's own assistant. After a farcical trial, lasting a mere couple of minutes, in which the accused is not allowed to speak, the commandant pronounces him sentenced to death, the sentence to be carried out immediately. As a noose is placed round his neck at the town hall gate, Limpert manages to struggle free and make a run for it, but within a hundred meters is caught by police, kicked and pulled by the hair before being hauled back, screaming. No one in the assembled crowd stirs to help him. Some, in fact, also punch and kick him. Even now his misery is not over. The noose is again put round his neck, and he is hanged. But the rope breaks, and he falls to the ground. The noose is once more put round his neck, and he is finally hoisted to his death in the town hall square. The commandant orders the body to be left hanging until it stinks. Shortly afterwards, he apparently requisitions a bicycle and immediately flees the town. Four hours later, the Americans enter Ansbach without a shot being fired and cut down the body of Robert Limpert. As this grim episode shows, in its terroristic repression, the Nazi regime functioned to the last. But it was not only a matter of the rabid Nazi military commandant, Colonel of the Luftwaffe, Dr. Mayer, ruthlessly dispatching a perceived traitor and saboteur, an agent of the regime imposing his will through superior force. Even faced with such fanaticism, the policeman, aware that the Americans were on the verge of entering the town, might have acted to save themselves future trouble with the occupying force by dragging out the arrest and interrogation of Limpert. Instead, they chose to follow regulations and carry out their duty as they saw it as expeditiously as possible continuing to function as minor custodians of a law that, as they later claimed to have seen at the time, was now no more than the expression of the Commandant's arbitrary will. The same could be said for the head of the local civilian administration. He, too, could have used his experience and awareness of the imminent end of the fighting to procrastinate. Instead, he chose to do what he could to hasten proceedings and cooperate with the Commandant. The townsfolk who had found their way into the town hall square and saw Limpert escape could have rallied to his aid at such a juncture. Instead, some of them even helped the police to drag the struggling young man back to his execution place. At every level, then, in these extreme circumstances and in these final moments of the war, 
as far as Anspach was concerned. Those wielding power continued to work in the interests of the regime, and in doing so, were not devoid of public support. Incidents as harrowing as this case, where local inhabitants attempted to prevent futile destruction at the very end and encountered savage reprisals, while others were still prepared to back the repression of the regime's functionaries, were no rarity in these final stages of the most terrible war in history. Dozens of other cases could be chosen as illustration of the continued functioning of the regime's terror, now, in the last months of the conflict, leveled at its own citizens as well as at foreign workers, prisoners, Jews, and others long regarded as its enemies. It was not just in the ever wilder displays of terror by fanatics and desperados that the regime kept going to the last. Most important of all was the behavior of the military. If the Wehrmacht had ceased to function, then the regime would have collapsed. The signs of dissolution and disintegration in the Wehrmacht were manifold in the later stages of the war, most obviously so in the West. Soldiers deserted, despite the threat of brutal punishment. By early 1945, certainly in the West, most felt that to continue the struggle was senseless, and yearned only to be back with their families. Yet the Wehrmacht continued the fight. Generals and field commanders still issued their orders, even in the most hopeless of circumstances, and the orders were obeyed. Beneath the hail of bombs, in the mayhem of destruction of towns and cities, as the Reich collapsed to immensely superior force in East and West, a semblance of normality in the mounting chaos was sustained as bureaucracy strained every sinew to continue functioning. Of course, the Reich was shrinking by the day. Channels of communication were collapsing. The transport network was as good as at an end. Basic utilities like gas, electricity, and water were no longer available to millions of homes, and bureaucratic administration faced any number of huge practical problems. But where Germany had not yet fallen under occupied rule, there was no descent into anarchy. Civil administration continued, however, ineffectively, in the face of extreme adversary and immense dislocation. Military, as well as civilian courts, continued to hand out ever more severe sentences. Wages and salaries were still being paid in April 1945. Grants awarded by a leading academic body in Berlin were made down to the last weeks of the war to foreign students, even now regarded as an investment for continued German influence in the new Europe. Despite mounting handicaps, distribution of the ever more restricted food rations was maintained with difficulty and, increasingly by improvised means, posts continued after a fashion to struggle through. Limited forms of entertainment still somehow functioned as a conscious device to sustain morale and distract attention for a short while from the unfolding disaster. A last concert by the Berlin Philharmonic took place on the 12th of April, four days before the Soviet assault on the Reich capital was launched. The finale from Richard Wagner's Gotterdammerung was, of course, on the program. Some cinemas remained open. Only a week before Stuttgart capitulated on the 22nd of April, its citizens could find momentary distraction from their trauma through a visit to the cinema to see The Woman of My Dreams. Even football matches were still played. The last game of the war took place as late as the 23rd of April, 1945, when FC Bayern Munich, Gaumeister of 1945, beat their local rivals, TSV 1860 Munich, 3-2. Truncated newspapers still appeared. The main Nazi paper, The People's Observer, was published in the unoccupied part of southern Germany to the very end. Its last edition, on the 28th of April, 1945, two days before Hitler's suicide in the Berlin bunker, carried the headline, Fortress Bavaria. The reasons for Germany's collapse are evident and well known. Why and how Hitler's Reich kept on functioning till the bitter end is less obvious. That is what this book seeks to explain.
The fact that the regime did hold out to the end, that the war ended only when Germany was militarily battered into submission, its economy destroyed, its cities in ruins, the country occupied by foreign powers, is historically an extreme rarity. Wars between states in the modern era have usually ended in some kind of negotiated settlement. The ruling elites of a state facing military defeat have generally sued for peace at some point, and eventually, under some duress, reached a territorial agreement, however disadvantageous. The end of the First World War fitted this pattern. The end of the Second was completely different. The rulers of Germany in 1945, knowing the war was lost and complete destruction beckoned, were nevertheless prepared to fight on until their country was practically obliterated. Authoritarian regimes facing defeat in unpopular wars and seen to be heading for disaster do not usually survive to preside over outright catastrophe. Some in the past have been overthrown by revolution from below, as in Russia in 1917 and Germany in 1918. In the latter case, after the military elite had already taken steps to end a lost war. Others, a more usual development, are toppled by a coup from within, by elites unwilling to be taken down with the falling regime and wanting to salvage something. The deposition of Mussolini by his own fascist Grand Council in 1943 is a prime example. In Germany, by contrast, the regime, though universally recognized, not just by ordinary people but by those in positions of power, civilian and military, to be heading for the buffers, fought on until it was completely destroyed and, unlike 1918, under foreign occupation. Approximate parallels come to mind only in the cases of Japan in 1945, which, however, surrendered while the country was still unoccupied, and more recently, and in this case very faintly, given the very short-lived and militarily one-sided war, in Saddam Hussein's Iraq. The contrast between 1918 and 1945 in Germany again raises the question, how and why was Hitler's Germany able to fight on to the bitter end? Was no other conclusion to the terrible conflict possible? And if not, why not? The real puzzle, it has been aptly remarked, is why people who wanted to survive fought and killed so desperately and so ferociously, almost to the last moments of the war. Of course, in the First World War, there had been no Allied demand for unconditional surrender. The formula produced by U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt at the Casablanca Conference in January 1943, and agreed by the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, was the first time that a sovereign state had been formally offered no terms short of total and unconditional capitulation. This was often seized upon in the early post-war years, particularly by German generals, as the sole and adequate explanation for Germany's prolonged fight, since, it was claimed, the demand for unconditional surrender ruled out any alternative. Some former soldiers, long after the war ended, still insisted that it had helped to motivate them to keep on fighting. It is certainly possible to argue that the demand was counterproductive and that it simply played into the hands of Nazi propaganda. As such, it contributed, at least initially, to strengthening the will to hold out. But it is doubtful whether attributing blame to the Allies for a mistaken policy of unconditional surrender amounts to any more than what one scholar has called a flimsy excuse. According to General Walter Varlamont, Deputy Chief of Operations in the OKW, hardly any notice was taken of it in the high command of the Wehrmacht and there was no examination by the OKW operations staff of its military consequences. In other words, it made no difference to the strategy, or lack of one, adopted by the German military leadership in the last phase of the war. Answers to the question of why Germany fought on have consequently been sought less in the Allied demand, whatever its merits or failings, than in the structures of the German regime in its dying phase and the mentalities that shaped its actions. Why, unlike in 1918, did the German people not rise up against a regime so obviously taking them to perdition? In the early post-war era, 
For the German people just starting to pick up their lives again after the trauma of such death and destruction, and not anxious to dwell upon any deeper causes of the catastrophe that had beset their country, it seemed unnecessary to look much further for explanation than the terroristic nature of the Nazi regime. It was easy, and in some ways reassuring, for Germans to see themselves as the hapless victims of ruthless oppression by their brutal rulers, stifled in any scope for action by a totalitarian police state. The feelings were understandable, and, as subsequent chapters will show, certainly not without justification. Of course, there was an undeniably apologetic strain to the way such an explanation could be and was used in post-war Germany to exculpate almost the whole society from the crimes placed at the door of Hitler, the all-powerful dictator, and a clique of criminally ruthless Nazi leaders. But scholarly interpretation, too, in the post-war era, placed the overwhelming emphasis upon terror and repression in the totalitarianism theorem that dominated so much historical and political science literature at the time, though without direct focus on the last phase of the war. A society coerced into acquiescence, unable to act because of the comprehensive coercion of the highly repressive totalitarian state, provided it seemed sufficient explanation. Terror is unquestionably critical to the question of how and why the regime continued to function to the end. As we shall see, the level of terroristic repression, which now boomeranged back from the treatment of conquered peoples to be directed at the German people themselves, as well as perceived racial enemies, does indeed go a long way towards explaining why there was no revolution from below, why an organized mass uprising was not possible. Given the level of repression, together with the immense dislocation in the last months, a revolution from below, as at the end of the First World War, was an impossibility. But terror cannot completely explain the regime's capacity to fight on. It was not terror that drove on the regime's elites. Terror does not explain the behavior of the regime's paladins, both those who shared Hitler's Gotterdammerung mentality and were ready to see Germany go down in flames, and the far greater number of those seeking to save their own skins. It does not explain the continued functioning of a government bureaucracy, both at central and local levels. Not least, it does not explain the Wehrmacht's readiness, at any rate the readiness of the Wehrmacht leadership, to continue the fight. Nor, finally, does terror explain the behavior of those in the regime at different levels prepared to use terror to the very last, even when it served no further rational purpose. Although after the end of the Cold War, the totalitarianism theorem underwent something of a renaissance, its emphasis upon terror and repression in controlling the total society has never regained the ground it held in the early post-war era as an interpretation of the behavior of ordinary Germans during the Third Reich. On the contrary, recent research has increasingly tended to place the emphasis upon the enthusiastic support of the German people for the Nazi regime and their willing collaboration and complicity in policies that led to war and genocide. One question remains, a German writer remarked. What was it actually that drove us to follow Hitler into the abyss like the children in the story of the Pied Piper? The puzzle is not Adolf Hitler. We are the puzzle. Such a comment, leaving aside the suggestion of bamboozlement, presumes an essential unity, down to the end, between leader and led. Whereas the emphasis used to be placed on society and regime in conflict, essentially presuming a tyranny over a mainly reluctant but coerced people, this has shifted to a society in harness with the aims of the regime, largely in tune with and supportive of its racist and expansionist policies, fully behind its war effort. Relentless Nazi propaganda had done its job. It was the war that Hitler won, according to an interpretation advanced many years ago. The Nazis were successful, it is now frequently claimed, in inculcating in people the sense that they were part of an inclusive, national, racist, people's community, 
integrated by the exclusion of Jews and others deemed inferior and unfit to belong to it, unified by the need to defend the nation against the powerful enemies surrounding it and threatening its very existence. Notwithstanding the disillusionment and bitterness of large parts of the German population in the last war years, the people's community remained intact to the bitter end, one scholar has asserted. Moreover, Hitler's regime had bought off the German population, securing loyalty through a standard of living sustained by plundering the occupied territories. Though it is usually acknowledged that this people's community was starting to crumble in the face of impending defeat, lasting support for Nazism, bound together through knowledge of terrible German crimes, is still advanced as a significant reason why Hitler's regime was able to hold out to the end. The basic legitimacy of the Third Reich remained intact, another historian has claimed, because Germans could not envision a desirable alternative to National Socialism, demonstrating remarkable commitment to National Socialism in the war. Their subsequent sense of betrayal by Nazism rested on a strong identification with the Third Reich right up to the moment of abandonment. In perhaps the apogee of this approach, it has been suggested that the great majority of the German people soon became devoted to Hitler, and they supported him to the bitter end in 1945. Some, it is acknowledged, hinting at a tiny minority, had had enough. But the consensus that had underpinned the dictatorship from the outset, the argument runs, held up to the end. The chapters which follow will provide a good deal of evidence to cast doubt upon this interpretation. They will question whether either the scale of terror or the extent of support for the regime can provide an adequate explanation for its ability to hold out until Germany was smashed to smithereens. Yet if neither terror nor support fully explains it, what does? A number of questions immediately arise. Beyond the significance of the Allied demand for unconditional surrender, one could ask how far Allied mistakes in strategy and tactics, which certainly occurred, weakened their own efforts to bring the war to an early end, and temporarily boosted the confidence of the German defenders. But whatever significance might accrue to such factors, the determining reasons for Germany's continued fight have surely to be explained internally, from within the Third Reich, rather than externally through Allied policy. What weight, for instance, should we attach to the feeling of Nazi leaders that they had nothing to lose by fighting on? since they had, in any case, burnt their boats. How significant, indeed, was the greatly expanded scope of the Nazi Party's powers in the final phase, as it sought to revitalize itself by evoking the spirit of the period of struggle before 1933? In what ways did a highly qualified and able state bureaucracy contribute, despite increasing and ultimately overwhelming administrative disorder, to the capacity to hold on? How important was the fear of the Red Army in sustaining the fight to the end? Why were German officers, especially the generals in crucial command posts, prepared to fight on even when they recognized the futility of the struggle and the absurdity of the orders they were being given? And what role was played by the leading Nazis beneath Hitler? In particular, the crucial quadrumvirate of Bormann, Himmler, Goebbels, and Speer, and the provincial viceroys, the Gauleiter, in ensuring that the war effort could be sustained despite mounting then overwhelming odds until the regime had destroyed itself in the maelstrom of total military defeat. In particular, how indispensable was the role of Speer in continuing to defy enormous obstacles to provide armaments for the Wehrmacht? Finally, though far from least, there is the part played by Hitler himself and the lasting allegiance to him within the German power elites. A simple, though self-evidently inadequate, answer to the question of how and why Germany held out to the bitter end is in fact that Hitler adamantly and at all times refused to contemplate capitulation, so that there was no alternative to fighting on. Even catacombed in his bunker, the borders of fantasy and reality increasingly blurred, Hitler's hold on power was not over until his suicide, on the 30th of April, 1945. A central tenet of his career, 
had been revenge for the national humiliation of 1918. The 1918 syndrome was deeply embedded in his psyche. There would, he frequently and insistently declared, be no repeat of 1918. No new version of the cowardly capitulation at the end of the First World War. Destruction with honor intact through fighting to the end. Upholding the almost mythical military code of battling till the last bullet. Creating a legend of valor for posterity out of the despair of defeat. And above all enshrining in history his own unique, self-perceived heroic legacy. Was in his mind infinitely preferable to negotiating a disgraceful surrender. Since he personally had no future after defeat, a suicidal approach was not hard to adopt. But it was not just personally self-destructive. It meant personally condemning his own people and country to destruction. The German people, in his eyes, had failed him, had not proved worthy of his leadership. They were expendable. Without him, in fact, his monstrous ego told him, everything was expendable. In his crudely dualist way of thinking, it had always been victory or destruction. He unwaveringly followed his own logic. Hitler's own central part in Germany's self-destructive urges as the Reich collapsed is obvious. Above all, his continued power provided a barrier to any possibility, which his paladins were keen to explore, of negotiating a way out of the escalating death and destruction. But this only brings us back to the question, why was he able to do this? Why did his writ continue to run when it was obvious to all around him that he was dragging them down with him and taking his country to perdition? Accepting that Hitler was a self-destructive individual, why did the ruling elites below him, military, party, government, allow him to block all rational exit routes? Why was no further attempt made after the failed coup of July 1944, to impede Hitler's determination to continue the war? Why were subordinate Nazi leaders and military commanders prepared to follow him down to the complete destruction of the Reich? It was not that they wanted to follow him to personal oblivion. As soon as Hitler was dead, they did what they could to avoid the abyss. Almost all Nazi leaders fled, anxious not to follow Hitler's example of self-immolation. Military commanders were now prepared to offer their partial capitulations in rapid succession, fighting on only to get as many of their men as possible into the western zones and away from the Red Army. Some harbored fantasies of being of future service to the western allies. Total capitulation followed in just over a week from the final act of the drama in the bunker. The mopping up of Nazis on the run, now with nothing left to fight for, swiftly ensued. The occupation began its job of sorting out the mayhem and trying to set up new forms and standards of government. So Hitler was without question crucial to the last. But his lingering power was sustained only because others upheld it, because they were unwilling or unable to challenge it. The issue stretches, therefore, beyond Hitler's own intractable personality and his unbending adherence to the absurdly polarized dogma of total victory or total downfall. It goes to the very nature of Hitler's rule, and to the structures and mentalities that upheld it, most of all, within the power elite. The character of Hitler's dictatorship is most appropriately depicted as a form of charismatic rule. Structurally, it resembled in some ways a modern form of absolutist monarchy. Like an absolute monarch, Hitler was surrounded by fawning courtiers, even if his court lacked the splendor of Versailles or Sans Souci. It depended upon satraps and provincial grandees, bound to him through personal loyalty, to implement directives and see that his writ ran, and he relied upon trusted field marshals, handsomely rewarded with large donations of money and property, to run his wars. The analogy rapidly fades, however, when crucial components of the modern state, an elaborate bureaucracy and mechanisms, here chiefly in the hands of a monopoly party, to orchestrate popular support and control, are included. For an important part of the edifice, 
crucially bolstering Hitler's authority and creating for him untouchable, almost deified status. Towering above all the institutions of the Nazi state was the mass plebiscitary backing that a combination of propaganda and repression helped to produce. However manufactured the image was, there can be no doubt of Hitler's genuine and immense popularity among the great mass of the German people down to the middle of the war. From the first Russian winter of 1941, nevertheless, everything points to the fact that this popularity was sagging. From the following winter, the winter of the Stalingrad debacle, for which he was directly held responsible, it was in steep decline. In terms of mass appeal, therefore, Hitler's charisma was terminally undermined as the war turned sour and the defeats mounted. Structurally, however, his charismatic rule was far from at an end. Even compared with other authoritarian regimes, Hitler's was personalized in the extreme, and had been from the outset, back in 1933. No Politburo, War Council, Cabinet since 1938, Military Junta, Senate or gathering of ministers existed to mediate or check his rule. Nothing approximated, for instance, to the Fascist Grand Council, which triggered Mussolini's deposition in 1943. A vital hallmark of this personalized charismatic rule had been, from the start, the erosion and fragmentation of government. By mid-1944, when this book begins, at a point of intense shock and internal restructuring in the immediate aftermath of the failed bomb plot of the 20th of July, 1944, the process of fragmentation had become greatly expanded and magnified. No unified body posed a challenge to Hitler. Put another way, the structures and mentalities of charismatic rule continued, even when Hitler's popular appeal was collapsing. They were sustained in the main not by blind faith in Hitler. More important for arch-Nazis was the feeling that they had no future without Hitler. This provided a powerful negative bond. Their fates were inextricably linked. It was the loyalty of those who had burnt their boats together and now had no way out. For many of those who by this time were lukewarm, if not outrightly hostile to Nazism, it was often as good as impossible to separate support for Hitler and his regime from the patriotic determination to avoid defeat and foreign occupation. Hitler represented, after all, the fanatical defense of the Reich. Removing Hitler, as was attempted in July 1944, could be, and was, seen by many, in a rehashing of the 1918 myth as a stab in the back. Not least, as everyone was aware, the dictator still had a ruthless apparatus of enforcement and repression at his disposal. Fear, or at least extreme caution, played an obvious part in the behavior of most. Even the highest in the land knew they needed to tread warily. Whatever the range of motives, the effect was the same. Hitler's power was sustained to the very end. As the end neared, the central government fragmented almost completely. Life and death decisions passed ever further down the hierarchy to the regional, district, and local levels to the point that individuals like the military commandant at Anspach acquired arbitrary and lethal executive power. But this radicalization at the grassroots, crucial though it was to the mounting irrationality of the final phase, would have been impossible without the encouragement, authorization, and legitimation provided from above, from the leadership of a regime in its death throes facing no internal challenge. Perhaps the most fundamental element in trying to find answers to the question of how and why the regime held out to the point of total destruction revolves, therefore, around the structures and mentalities of charismatic rule. Linking such an approach to a differentiated assessment of the ways in which ordinary Germans responded to the rapidly gathering Armageddon offers the potential to reach a nuanced assessment of why Nazi rule could continue to function to the end. The chapters that follow proceed chronologically, beginning with the aftermath 
of the failed bomb plot of the 20th of July, 1944, a scissura in the governmental structures of the Third Reich, and extending to the capitulation on the 8th of May, 1945. By combining structural history and the history of mentalities and dealing with German society from above and below, the narrative approach has the virtue of being able to depict in precise fashion the dramatic stages of the regime's collapse, but at the same time its astonishing resilience and desperate defiance in sustaining an increasingly obvious lost cause. The focus throughout is exclusively on Germany. What the Allies, often puzzled themselves by the German willingness to carry on fighting under hopeless circumstances, were thinking, planning, and doing, forms no part of the analysis. Of course, this was scarcely unimportant for the course of the war, and what happened on the battlefield in the various theaters of war was ultimately decisive. But this is no military history, and the relevant stages of the Allied advance on Germany, east and west, are tersely summarized, primarily in order to provide a framework for the subsequent assessment. Since we know the end of the story, it is hard not to ask why contemporaries do not see as obviously as we do in retrospective that the war was plainly lost, at the absolute latest by the time the Western Allies had consolidated their landings in France and the Red Army had advanced deep into Poland in the summer of 1944. But until surprisingly late, that was not how they did see it. Certainly they knew that the great vistas of 1941-42 could not be realized. But the German leadership not just Hitler, thought there was still something to be gained from the war. Strength of will and radical mobilization, they thought, could prolong the conflict until new miracle weapons came along. The war effort would be sustained so far that the Allies would look for a negotiated way out of mounting losses as advances were blocked or reversed. A split between East and West would materialize and Germany would still be able to hold on to some territorial gains and eventually, with Western aid, turn against the common enemy of Soviet communism. Such hopes and illusions, if harbored by a rapidly dwindling number of Germans, especially once the Red Army reached the Oder in late January 1945, lingered almost to the end. So even in the final terrible phase of death and devastation, Faced with insuperable odds, the fight went on amid a mounting series of regional collapses, driven by increasingly irrational, but self-sustaining, destructive energy. Trying to explain how this could be so, how the regime, torn apart on all sides, could continue to operate until the Red Army was at the portals of the Reich Chancellery, is the purpose of this book. Chapter 1. Shock to the System It takes a bomb under his arse to make Hitler see reason. Joseph Goebbels, the 23rd of July, 1944 1. It was the beginning of the end for the Third Reich. By late July 1944, the D-Day landings of the Western Allies that had taken place in Normandy on the 6th of June 1944 had been consolidated. Troops and arms were being shipped over to the continent in ever greater numbers. Direct ground attack on the Reich itself was now in prospect. On the Eastern Front, the Red Army, in its massive offensive, Operation Bagration, launched just over a fortnight after D-Day, had smashed through the defenses of the Wehrmacht's Army Group Center, an immense formation of 48 divisions in four armies and pivotally placed over a 700-kilometer stretch of the enormous front, inflicting huge losses, and had advanced more than 300 kilometers. To the south, Rome had fallen to the Allies, and German troops were engaged in fierce rearguard fighting near Florence. Meanwhile, ever more German towns and cities were exposed to relentless devastation from the air. With resources and manpower stretched to the limit, and hugely inferior to the combined might of the enemy, now forcing back the Wehrmacht from the east, west, and south, the writing was on the wall for the Hitler regime. At least that was how the Western Allies saw it. 
They were confident that the war would be over by Christmas. Viewed from Germany, it was a different matter. Here, attitudes about the state of the war and Germany's prospects varied widely, whether at the elite level, among the civilian and military Reich leadership, or among the public, on the home front and the millions of men under arms. Defeatism, reluctant acceptance that the war was lost, realistic acknowledgement of overwhelming enemy strength, waning belief in Hitler, and fears for the future were more evident by the day. On the other hand, support for the regime, not just among Nazi fanatics, was still widespread. And many in high places and low still refused to contemplate the prospect of defeat. Their thinking ran along the following lines. The enemy, the unholy coalition of the Western democracies and the communist Soviet Union, could still be repulsed if the war effort could be revitalized. In the event of a serious reverse, the enemy could be split apart. New, devastating weapons were on the way and would bring a sharp turn in war fortunes. And, if subjected to significant military setbacks, the Allies would be forced to entertain a settlement, leaving Germany some of her territorial gains and peace with honor. Such thoughts were by no means morbid in the summer of 1944. Among the mass of the population, however, the predominant feeling by mid-July 1944 was one of mounting worry and anxiety. Whatever their carefully couched criticisms of the regime's leaders, including Hitler himself, and in particular of the Nazi Party and its representatives, the great majority of ordinary citizens were still unhesitatingly loyal in their support for the war effort. The mood was anxious, not rebellious. There was no trace of anything similar to the growing unrest that eventually burst into open revolution in 1918, despite Hitler's pathological fixation with the internal collapse of that year. There were contingency plans to cope with the possibility of an uprising by foreign workers, numbering by this time, together with prisoners of war, more than seven million. But there was no serious expectation of revolution by the German population. Regional reports of the SD, the Security Service, indicated an increasingly apprehensive mood, falling to zero point, producing deep depression, and amounting to an anxiety psychosis and creeping panic in the light of the Red Army's advance in the East. There was intense worry about the likely fate of East Prussia. People feared that, once on German soil, the Russians would never be forced out. Women, in particular, were profoundly apprehensive. The Eastern Front will probably soon collapse, ran one reported comment. If the Bolsheviks get in, we might as well all hang ourselves with our children. The Fuhrer should make peace with England and America. The war can no longer be won. It was not an isolated sentiment. Though overshadowed by events in the East, attitudes toward the Western Front were also gloomy with widespread acknowledgment of the enemy's overwhelming superiority in men and resources. There were still hopes of the promised miracle weapons, though earlier exaggerated expectations of the impact of the V-1 missile in air raids on London had left disappointment and skepticism about propaganda claims. And the inability of the Luftwaffe to offer protection against the terror raids which were taking place in broad daylight offered a constant source of anger, as well as constant and mounting anxiety. The collapse of the Wehrmacht in the East left many searching for both explanations and scapegoats. Reports from soldiers on leave of the morale of the troops, alleging their lack of belief in victory, and of the inability of their officers, used to material comfort in their rare positions, to provide proper defense, also had a negative impact on mood and more and more families were receiving the dreaded visit from the local party leader with the news that their loved one had fallen at the front. How long can we still hold out? was a question frequently asked. At the other end of the opinion spectrum, among the regime's elite, such views were unspoken, whether tacitly entertained or not. Leading Nazis continued to give their full support and loyalty to Hitler, not least since their own power was solely dependent upon his. But there were frustrations, as well as the continuous jockeying for position that was endemic 
to the Third Reich. Hermann Göring was still Hitler's designated successor. His early popularity had, however, vanished, and within the Nazi elite, his star had been waning for months, in the light of the Luftwaffe's failings. Hitler fell into repeated paroxysms of rage at the impotence of the commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe to prevent the destruction of Germany's cities. Characteristically, however, he was unwilling to dismiss Göring, conscious, as usual, of the loss of prestige this would constitute and the gift it would provide to enemy propaganda. Another who had lost his earlier prominence was the once influential foreign minister, Joachim von Ribbentrop, whose every prediction and initiative had proved catastrophically mistaken. He, too, was now little called upon, not least since there was, in effect, no longer any foreign policy to conduct. As some Nazi paladins lost face, others profited from the adversity. Martin Bormann, head of the party chancellery, could exploit more than ever his constant proximity to Hitler. Controlling the portals, to the dictator's presence and serving as his master's mouthpiece. Bormann, born in 1900, an unpretentious figure in his ill-fitting party uniform, short, squat, bull-necked, with thin receding hair, was hated and feared in equal measure by leading Nazis, well aware of his ruthlessness, capacity for intrigue, and his opportunities to influence Hitler. He had long been Hitler's indispensable man behind the scenes for years managing his private financial affairs, and in the mid-1930s organizing the building of the Berghof, the dictator's palatial retreat on the Obersalzberg near Berchtesgaden. His absolute trustworthiness in Hitler's eyes was his prize asset. Bormann had risen almost unnoticed in the party's central office in Munich, where, through tireless energy and efficiency, along with the necessary elbow power, he attained mastery of the party's bureaucratic apparatus. He was, however, no simple functionary. He had been involved in anti-Semitic and paramilitary organizations in the 1920s before he found his way to Hitler, and had served time in prison for his involvement in a political murder. His ideological fanaticism never wavered to the end. In 1929, he had married Gerda, herself a fanatical Nazi, and daughter of the head of the party court, which adjudicated on matters of party discipline, Walter Buch. Together they had ten children, nine of whom survived, all but one of them after the war becoming Catholics, one even a priest, despite or because of their parents' radical detestation of the church. The Bormans appear, from their surviving letters, to have been devoted to each other. Yet the marriage was far from conventional, Goethe positively welcomed Martin's news in January 1944 that he had succeeded in seducing the actress Manya Behrens, hoped that she would bear him a child, and even went so far as to draft a proposed law to legalize bigamy. By this time, Bormann was one of the most powerful men in Germany. In the immediate aftermath of Rudolf Hess's flight to Britain in May 1941, he had been the obvious choice to take over the running of the party, and, once Hitler made him head of the party chancellery, rapidly consolidated his control over its bureaucracy. His role as Hitler's trusted factotum finally gained its formal recognition when, in April 1943, he was granted the title of Secretary of the Führer. As Germany's fortunes declined, Bormann used his command of the party's central administration, backed by the fanatical Robert Ley, the Reich organization leader, and head of the German Labour Front, to reinvigorate the party and extend its reach, underpinning his second source of power and making him a figure of crucial importance. There were limits, nevertheless, to Bormann's power. He could not prevent other leading figures in the regime having direct access to Hitler and exerting their own influence on him. And even within the party organization he faced constraints. He was not wholly successful in extending his power over the forty or so regional party bosses, the Gauleiter. Though nominally his subordinates, some of the Gauleiter, trusted old fighters who had proved their worth since the early days of the party, in many cases had a direct line to Hitler, which limited Bormann's control. In 
One Gao lighter who epitomized the difficulties in imposing any centralized control, or any control at all, for that matter, even from the Wehrmacht authorities in his region, was Erich Koch, who ran his domain in East Prussia as if it were his personal fiefdom. Like most other Gauleiter, Koch had been appointed a Reich Defense Commissar, giving him extensive powers in the organization of civil defense, and the possibility, therefore, which he readily exploited, to interfere in non-party matters in his province. Already in mid-July 1944, Koch was using his direct access to Hitler to block a proposal by Goebbels, which the propaganda minister and Gauleiter of Berlin had negotiated with the railway authorities, to evacuate from the endangered East Prussia around 170,000 Berliners, who had taken refuge there from the bombing in the capital city. Koch gained Hitler's approval to restrict the evacuation to 55,000 women and children from a small number of districts most threatened by Soviet air raids. It was the first of a number of interventions by Koch to prevent evacuation from his region, causing administrative confusion and, more importantly, with fateful consequences for East Prussians. The massive accretion of power by Heinrich Himmler, head of the SS, chief of the German police, Reich Commissar for the Strengthening of German Nationhood and Reich Minister of the Interior, had given him mastery of the regime's entire, elaborate, repressive apparatus throughout occupied Europe. The sinister figure wielding such immense power was still only in his early forties, a strange, cranky individual, but also a fanatical ideologue. He was unimpressive in appearance, no more than medium height, slender in build, his pale face dominated by his trimmed moustache, rimless glasses, receding chin, an extreme variant of the short back and sides haircut. He treated his SS leaders with fussy paternalism and urged upon them the virtues of decency at the same time as presiding over the orchestrated murder of millions of Jews in the final solution. As the most feared Nazi leader beneath Hitler, Himmler had even expanded his power within Germany itself when he replaced Wilhelm Frick as Reich Minister of the Interior in August 1943. This move had rendered redundant his aim to create a Reich Ministry of Security, detaching the police from the Ministry of the Interior and placing them under his leadership. In July 1944, the power-hungry Reichsführer SS was edging towards new important extensions of his empire, this time in the sphere of the Wehrmacht. Rivalry with the Wehrmacht had always held in check the growth of Himmler's own military wing, the Waffen-SS. But on the 15th of July, Hitler gave Himmler responsibility for the indoctrination of Nazi ideals and control over military discipline of 15 planned new army divisions. It was a significant inroad into the domain of the Wehrmacht. Josef Goebbels, Reich Minister of Propaganda and head of the party's propaganda organization, and Albert Speer, Reich Minister for Armaments and War Production, had utilized the needs of the war to emphasize their own indispensability to Hitler. Losses at the front had left troop numbers severely depleted. Destruction of equipment urgently required a concentrated armaments drive. Labor had to be combed for all possible sources for Wehrmacht recruitment, as well as for armaments work. Not least, new efforts in propaganda were vital to mobilize the population compelling them to recognize the need for utmost self-sacrifice in the interests of the war. Yet here the frustrations with Hitler's leadership, within a framework of unquestioned loyalty, were evident. They centered on Hitler's unwillingness to move to the requirements of all-out, total war, meaning much more drastic measures to maximize recruitment to the Wehrmacht and war production. Goebbels, a diminutive figure in his late forties, with a pronounced limp in his right foot, a deformity of which he was very self-conscious, one of the most intelligent Nazi leaders, possessed of a cruel wit, ruthless and dynamic, organizationally able, a fervent Hitler acolyte who, in his mastery of propaganda, managed to combine utter cynicism with extreme, brutal ideological fanaticism, had been pressing for a move to total war, 
meaning to maximize every conceivable resource of hitherto unused manpower and drastically curtail any activity not essential to the war economy. Since February 1943, in the immediate aftermath of the disastrous defeat at Stalingrad. Speer had joined him at that time in urging a reorganization and revitalization of the war effort at home. Goebbels, most of all, aspired to take over the running of the home front, leaving Hitler to concentrate on military matters. But Hitler had commissioned little beyond token steps, and total war had remained largely a propaganda slogan. In a long private meeting with Hitler on the 21st of June, 1944, just before the Soviet breakthrough on the Eastern Front, but with the successful Allied landings in northern France plainly constituting a major threat, Goebbels once more vehemently pressed for the case for total war and a drastic overhaul of the political and military command structure. Again, Hitler demurred. He wanted, he said, to proceed for the time being along the evolutionary, not revolutionary way. The depletion of labor resources as a consequence of the enemy inroads from the West and the East had prompted Albert Speer temporarily to join forces with Goebbels in July in the attempt to persuade Hitler to adopt total war measures aimed at dredging out remaining reserves of manpower. Speer, only 39 years of age, good-looking, cultured, and highly intelligent, a superb manager and organizer, and from the outset intensely ambitious, had rapidly established himself in the 1930s as a court favorite by exploiting Hitler's passion for grandiose building projects. Before he was 30, he gained Hitler's commission to design the Reich Party Rally Stadium at Nuremberg. In 1937, he was given responsibility for turning Berlin into a capital befitting a master race. In the last year of peace, he delivered, on time and at breakneck speed, Hitler's imposing new Reich Chancellery. Hitler saw in Speer the architect of genius he himself had wanted to become. Speer, for his part, revered Hitler, and he was intoxicated by the power that the favor of the dictator brought. When Fritz Tott, in charge of weapon and munitions production, mysteriously died in an air crash in February 1942, Hitler, somewhat surprisingly, appointed Speer to be his new armaments minister, endowed with extensive powers. Since then, Speer had masterminded an astonishing rise in armaments production. But he knew the limits had been reached. He could not compete with Allied superiority. In a memorandum written to Hitler on the 12th of July, Speer purported to accept the dictator's claim that the current crisis could be overcome within some four months through new weapons, notably the A-4 rocket, soon to be renamed the V-2 and he agreed that, despite all difficulties, new recruits were potentially available from different sectors of the economy, including armaments to replenish the Wehrmacht. At the same time, Speer argued, everything had to be done to strengthen the workforce in the armaments industry, and not simply through more foreign workers conscripted from across the Nazi empire. It was essential to make total war demands on the population, People were ready to make the necessary sacrifices to their daily lives, he stated, a point that internal SD opinion reports seemed to back up. He suggested that women could be freed up for work in great numbers, and that organizational improvements could produce new labor supplies. He recommended tough measures to revolutionize living conditions. A proclamation on the mobilization of last reserves would produce enthusiasm of a kind not experienced since the wars of liberation from Napoleon in the early 19th century, he thought. Hitler finally gave an indication that he accepted the need for action. The somewhat colorless head of the Reich Chancellery, Hans Heinrich Lammers, gave notice on the 17th of July that Hitler wanted a meeting of ministerial representatives most directly concerned about a further strengthened deployment of men and women for defense of the Reich, to take place four days later. Leaving no stone unturned in the presence of total war measures, Goebbels took up the charge on the 18th of July, following Speer's lead, in a maneuver plainly coordinated with the armaments ministry, and pushing in the same direction. In his memorandum to Hitler, Goebbels urged wide-ranging powers to be invested in one man— 
meaning himself, of course, who could work through the Gao lighter at regional level to galvanize action. He claimed that through the rigorous measures he had in mind, he could produce 50 new divisions for the Wehrmacht in under four months. Speer then added his own second memorandum just over a week after the first, providing figures on current manpower in armaments, administration, and business, pointing out the organizational mistakes that had allowed large-scale, unproductive hoarding of labor, and indicating potential sources of recruitment to strengthen the Wehrmacht. He estimated, though the figures were hotly contested by those who would have to yield manpower, that as many as 4.3 million extra men could be found for the Wehrmacht through an efficiency drive. Though there was a need to protect the skilled workforce in armaments, a self-interested plea, he was adamant that the manpower problem for the needs of the front could be solved, but only if responsibility were given to a personality endowed with the plenipotentiary powers and prepared to work with energy and dynamism to overcome vested interests and coordinate the necessary organizational changes in the Wehrmacht and Reich bureaucracy to allow for a rigorous exploitation of available human resources. Speer was making a scarcely veiled request to be handed control over the coordination of armaments and personnel within all sections of the Wehrmacht to add to his existing powers over the production of arms. Had this ambition been fulfilled, Speer would, through his armaments empire, have become the supremo of the total war drive. What impact this memorandum might have had on Hitler, and on the meeting planned for the 21st of July to discuss total war, at precisely this juncture cannot be known. For there was no time to present this second memorandum to Hitler, before events on the very day it had been composed, the 20th of July, 1944, concentrated the dictator's mind. 2. What hopes Germans still harbored as they reeled from the events on the western then the eastern front in summer 1944, crystallized in what had emerged as the last remaining war aim, defense of the Reich. The grand utopian ideas of German rule, stretching from the Atlantic to the Urals, had long since been forgotten, except by lingering fantasists. Gradually, almost imperceptibly, and almost surreptitiously, the once heady vistas of a glorious final victory, however inchoate they had been, had yielded to bitter reality and to a limited and defensive objective, keeping the enemy from German soil. At the time of the devastating Blitzkrieg offenses, when the Wehrmacht would cut through the weaker enemies like a knife through butter, was long past. In a war that had become a protracted rear guard against powerful enemies with immense resources, Hitler's limitations as a warlord became ever clearer. At the same time, what he saw as the aim of the war, or how it might end, had become utterly opaque. He symbolized, of course, an indomitable will to hold on to every inch of territory, never to capitulate. And he could still enthuse those in his presence, with the strength of his own will, and with his unquenchable optimism. Hardened military commanders could begin an audience with Hitler skeptically and come out of it reinvigorated. Others, however, were struck by the absence of clear thinking on strategy and tactics. When General Friedrich Hofsbach met Hitler on the evening of the 19th of July, 1944, to be given command of the Fourth Army, he saw the dictator, whose Wehrmacht adjutant he had once been, as bent and prematurely aged, unable to offer any far-reaching strategic goal and highly superficial in his comments on the tactical position. Hofsbach simply accepted the commission, told Hitler he would act on his judgment when he assessed the situation, and would do his utmost to recover a position lost in the destruction of Army Group Center. Numerous military commanders had by this time contested Hitler's decisions to no avail. It was impossible to sustain a reason counter-argument to his domineering presence. As supreme leader, he would brook no opposition. His right of command was accepted by all, 
and those in positions of authority continued to try to implement his orders. But heady rhetoric and sacking generals for failing to achieve the unachievable hardly amounted to a strategy, let alone a clearly defined set of aims. In particular, and crucially, he had no exit strategy from the war in which he had embroiled his country. Repelling the Allied invasion, he had once told his military advisers, would be decisive for the war. When the invasion proved successful, however, he drew no conclusions other than to fight on. Outright victory was no longer attainable. Even Hitler could see that. But negotiating with the enemy from a position of weakness could not be entertained for a second. That left fighting on and hoping something would turn up. And that meant playing for time. Hitler's military right hand and mouthpiece, General Alfred Jodl, head of the Wehrmacht Operations Staff, reflected the absence of clear strategic goals in addressing his staff on the 3rd of July, 1944. He wrote, Our own war leadership, on all fronts, focuses now on gaining time. A few months can prove simply decisive for saving the fatherland. Our own armaments justify great expectations. Everything is being prepared with results in the foreseeable future. So the demand is for fighting, defending, holding, psychological strengthening of troops and leadership. Nail down the front where it now stands. There were many in high positions in the Wehrmacht who shared such a stance. Shoring up stretched defenses, holding on, keeping the enemy at bay, rebuilding lines while feverish attempts were made to maximize armaments production, find troop reinforcements and produce new weapons, became ends in themselves, rather than stages on the way to an accomplishment of a preconceived military and political strategy. Colonel General Heinz Guderian, the redoubtable tank commander, now Inspector General of Panzer Troops, thus approvingly remarked that in replacing Field Marshal Ernst Busch, an ultra-loyalist, but made the scapegoat for grave mistakes in the disaster that had befallen Army Group Center, by the tough Field Marshal Walter Model, Hitler had found the best possible man to perform the fantastically difficult task of reconstructing a line in the center of the Eastern Front. This was, however, not a strategic goal, but merely a firefighting operation by the man who, for the number of difficult positions he was asked to rescue, became known as Hitler's firemen. Most military commanders, whatever their varied level of enthusiasm for Hitler's regime, acted similarly to Model in doing their utmost to carry out their duties professionally, and with iron discipline to the limits of their ability, and, at least publicly, to ask no questions about political objectives. Those bold enough to voice any views that, however realistic, did not fit the prescribed optimism demanded by Hitler, found themselves replaced. As did the highly experienced Commander-in-Chief West, Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt, and the able commander of Panzer Group West, General Geyer von Schreppenberg, at the beginning of July. In private, leading Wehrmacht officers were divided in their views on war prospects. Alongside the loyalists and the front commanders, who seldom had the time for lengthy contemplation, and in any case had little perspective on the overall position, were those whose views on Germany's military and political prospects were far from rosy. Hitler himself had for years castigated the allegedly defeatist and negative attitudes that, in his jaundiced opinion, characterized the general staff of the army, responsible for overall operational planning in the East. His mounting and bitter disagreements with the chief of the general staff, Franz Halder, had led to the latter's replacement in September 1942 by the energetic and dynamic Kurt Zeitzler. But, worn out by the constant conflict with Hitler that had reached its climax with the destruction of Army Group Center, Zeitzler suffered a nervous breakdown at the end of June 1944. He had just told Hitler that the war was militarily lost and that something had to be done to end it. Zeitzler was expressing a sentiment then widespread within the general staff, according to a letter composed in his defense 
by his adjutant, Oberstleutnant Gunter Schmed, on the 1st of August, 1944. Schmed had been arrested for his connection with the Stauffenberg plot and would be sentenced to death on the 14th of August and executed on the 8th of September. His letter may well have been preceded by torture and somewhat exaggerated the subversive feeling at General Staff Headquarters. It gives, nevertheless, a clear insight into the mood. Facing almost certain execution, Schmed had no obvious reason to dissemble. Doubts about a final victory had mounted, wrote Schmed, since the catastrophic defeat at Stalingrad in February 1943. The widening gulf between the recommendations of the general staff and Hitler's decisions had given rise to strong criticism of the Führer, notably in the operations section, and this had not been dampened by senior officers. Indeed, the head of the section, General Adolf Heusinger, had himself been party to the condemnation of Hitler's war leadership. There was no longer any firm belief in Hitler. The mood in the entire general staff was one of despair, prompted especially by the disasters in the East, but also by the bad news on all fronts, leading to the conclusion that the war was lost. Critical mistakes had been made, and Hitler was seen as a military liability. On the day of his breakdown, Zeitzler had, according to Schmed, been blunt in his assessment of the situation in speaking to Hitler. He had recommended the appointment of Himmler as a homeland dictator to drive through the total war effort that had been propagated, but not implemented, with the necessary rigor. Thereafter, with Zeitzler out of action, and the general staff effectively leaderless for almost a month, the mood grew that the Fuhrer can't do it. Opinion hardened that it's all madness. Young officers, especially, held Hitler responsible. It was common knowledge, wrote Schmed, that ideas of eliminating Hitler were in circulation. On the 20th of July, 1944, such ideas, engendered, adumbrated, and elaborated in a conspiracy involving prominent figures in the armed forces, military intelligence, the foreign ministry, and other sectors of the regime's leadership, culminated in the attempt on Hitler's life undertaken by Count Klaus Schenkgraf von Stauffenberg and the subsequent failed coup d'etat launched from the headquarters of the replacement army in Berlin. Stauffenberg had placed a bomb under Hitler's table at a military briefing just after noon that day at Führer headquarters in East Prussia. The bomb had exploded, killing or badly injuring most of those present in the wooden barrack hut but Hitler had survived with only minor injuries. Once it had been plainly established that Hitler was alive, support had drained away from the coup planned to follow his presumed death, which collapsed in the course of the evening. Stauffenberg and three other close collaborators were shot by a firing squad late that night. The other plotters were soon rounded up. Most were tortured, subjected to appalling show trials, and then barbarously executed. Stauffenberg's assassination attempt marked an internal shift in the history of the Third Reich. With the failure of the plot came not only the fearful reprisals against those involved, but also a sharp radicalization of the regime, both in repression and in mobilization. The aftermath of the failed plot had a significant impact on the governmental structures of the regime, on the mentalities of the civilian and military elite, to some extent, too, on the ordinary public and on remaining possibilities both for regime change and for ending the war. 3. Looking back during his post-war interrogations in May 1945, Goering thought it had been impossible to organize an effective anti-Hitler movement at the time of the bomb plot. So, in the same month, did General Hofsbach, Hitler's one-time Wehrmacht adjutant, According to Hofsbach, the attempt on Hitler's life had no basis of support in the mass of the people or the Wehrmacht. Despite all setbacks, Hitler still enjoyed high popularity in 1944, he adjudged. The association of Hitler with patriotic support for the country at war was a strong bond, making it extremely difficult to topple the god. Indeed, those engaged in the plot to kill Hitler knew only too well that their actions lacked popular backing. 
Stauffenberg himself accepted that he would go down in German history as a traitor. The immediate reactions to the events of the 20th of July lent credence to such views. Among ordinary Germans there was a widespread sense of deep shock and consternation at the news of the failed assassination. Effusive outpourings of loyalty and support for the Fuhrer were immediately registered in all quarters, alongside furious outrage at the tiny clique of criminal officers, as Hitler had labeled them, who had perpetrated such a vile deed, and rank disbelief that such base treachery could have been possible. It would, of course, have been near suicidal to voice regrets in public that Hitler had survived, though certainly that was the private feeling of a good many people. So the recorded expressions of support inevitably provide a distorted impression of attitudes. This was even more the case with the extremes of pro-Hitler fervor emanating from the big loyalty rallies, staged within days all over Germany by a revitalized Nazi party, straining every sinew to mobilize the population by orchestrating spontaneous demonstrations of joy at the Fuhrer's survival and outrage at the monstrous attempt to assassinate him. Even so, all the indications are that there was an upsurge of genuine pro-Hitler feeling in the immediate aftermath of the attack on his life. The SD took immediate soundings of opinion on the day after the assassination attempt. All reports agree that the announcement of the attempt has produced the strongest feelings of shock, dismay, anger, and rage ran the summary of initial reactions. Women were said to have broken into tears of joy in shops or on the open streets in Konigsberg and Berlin at Hitler's survival. Thank God the Fuhrer is alive, was the common expression of relief. What would we have done without the Fuhrer? People asked. Hitler was seen as the only possible bulwark against Bolshevism. Many thought his death would have meant the loss of the Reich, it was at first surmised that the strike against Hitler was the work of enemy agents, though this presumption soon gave way to recognition that it had been treachery from within, and fury at the fact that this had come from German officers. Reports from the regional propaganda offices across the country told the same story. People were shaken by what had happened, but it had strengthened trust in the Fuhrer. Some officers, it was said, felt the reputation of the army had been so besmirched by the treachery that they wanted to transfer to the Waffen-SS. There was much speculation about how the attack could have happened. The Wehrmacht had been given too much freedom, and the Fuhrer kept uninformed about what was happening. He had been too lenient towards his generals, simply dismissing rather than executing them when they had failed in their duties. It was taken for granted that a new wind would now blow. There was a demand for severe reprisals against the traitors and for them to be publicly named. Wild rumors circulated implying the involvement of a number of leading military figures, including the former commander-in-chief of the army, Walter von Brauchitsch, Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt, who had recently been replaced as commander-in-chief West, and even Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel, the head of the high command of the Wehrmacht. People could not understand how such a plot could have gone unnoticed. They were disturbed that at the very heart of the army there had been those working against the Fuhrer's intentions and actions. It was not long before sabotage from within came to be seen as the obvious reason for the recent disastrous collapse of Army Group Center. Colored though such reports were, they nevertheless represented strands of genuine opinion. People sent in money and thanksgiving for Hitler's survival. Substantial amounts were collected and passed to the NSV to provide for children orphaned by the war. One woman, the wife of a worker and mother of several children, accompanied her gift of forty Reichmarks to the Red Cross with a note to her local party office, stating that her donation was out of great love of the Fuhrer, because nothing happened to him. She was happy, she wrote, that our Fuhrer has been preserved for us. May he live long yet and lead us to victory. A corporal apologized to his wife for being unable to send any money home at the beginning of August since he had donated it all to a Wehrmacht collection to show gratitude for the Fuhrer. 
many, he said, had given much more. However obliged they might have felt to contribute to the collection, the level of generosity was beyond what was necessary. Many letters and contemporary entries in private diaries reflect unforced pro-Hitler feelings. I don't think I'm wrong when I say in such a sad hour for all of us, Germany stands or falls in this struggle with the person of Adolf Hitler, ran one diary entry from the 21st of July from a young pro-Nazi, a prisoner of war in Texas. If this attack on Adolf Hitler had been successful, I am convinced that our homeland would now be in chaos. This was no exception. More than two-thirds of prisoners of war in American captivity indicated their belief in Hitler in the weeks after the assassination attempt, a rise on levels prior to the bomb plot. Faith in the Fuhrer was also still strong among serving frontline soldiers. The high number of joyful expressions about the salvation of the Fuhrer in letters home from soldiers at the front was remarked upon by the censor. It was as well to be extremely careful in expressing any negative views in letters that might be picked up by the censor. But there was no need for effusive pro-Hitler comments. Similar sentiments could be read in the letters that soldiers received. I cannot imagine how things would have developed without the Fuhrer in view of the present situation in our country, wrote one woman in Munich to her husband. A major in the supply unit of an infantry division behind the lines headed his diary entry for the 20th of July. Evening. Bad news. Attack on the Fuhrer. Noting next day, after hearing Hitler's late-night broadcast, that it was only a small clique of officers, and that a purge would follow. It's a crying shame, he added, that this should take place, and with the Russians at the gates. Another officer on the Western Front, and evidently skeptical about the course of the war, next day revised his initial view, that it had been merely a small officer's clique, and saw the attack as an entire plot against Adolf Hitler denoting a split in the Wehrmacht between loyalists and opponents. He recalled someone who had known Stauffenberg speaking of him as an excellent officer and courageous soldier. But he was evidently politically stupid, he added. In the upper ranks of the army, too, the response was highly supportive of the regime. There was immediate dismay and condemnation of Stauffenberg's strike at the head of the armed forces in the midst of a world war. The reaction of Colonel General Georg Hans Reinhardt provides a telling example. He was an experienced and capable commander who remained a Hitler loyalist despite having to comply with the absurd orders from the Fuhrer in late June 1944 that prevented the retreat of his 3rd Panzer Army, resulting in its destruction by the Soviets. He was distraught at the news of the attempt on Hitler's life. Thank God he is saved, was his immediate reaction, in consternation and disbelief that such a thing had been possible. Completely broken, he added next day. Incomprehensible. What has this done to our officer class? We can only feel deepest shame. His belief in Hitler remained intact, as did his sense of duty at fulfilling the will of the Fuhrer. Duty calls. I will go where the Fuhrer commands he wrote on taking over command of the remnants of Army Group Center a month later. It's a matter of justifying his trust. General Hermann Balk, a teak-hard tank commander and seasoned campaigner on the Eastern Front, a strong loyalist and highly regarded by Hitler for his dynamic leadership of armored formations, had known and admired Stauffenberg, but was forthright in his condemnation of him as a criminal. His act, which Balk regarded as comparable to the killing of Caesar by Brutus, had made Germany's difficult situation worse. He saw the causes in a long-standing inability within the officer corps to place oath and honor above all else. The general staff's revolt was shameful for the officer corps, but it appeared to be a cleansing storm at just the right time. Now there would have to be a merciless purge of all conspirators, a tabula rasa. For us it means attaining victory despite everything under the banner of the Fuhrer, he concluded. 
officers who were far from outright Nazis in their sentiments, still faced the perceived dilemma that, even in the plight that had befallen Germany, killing Hitler appeared an intensely unpatriotic act which undermined the fighting front, was morally wrong in itself, and constituted a betrayal of the oath of loyalty to the Führer. Such attitudes, whatever the doubts about Hitler's leadership qualities, made Germany's military leaders for the most part instinctive loyalists. Proxy for many who felt this way was General Hofsbach, later to be sacked by Hitler as commander of the Fourth Army during the last battles for East Prussia in early 1945. Reflecting on the bomb plot less than a fortnight after Germany's capitulation, in May that year, and in full recognition of the calamitous losses and colossal destruction of the last months of the war, Hofsbach offered no realistic alternative to what had taken place. He accepted the patriotic need for the armed forces to redeem Germany from the domination of a criminal clique, but how this might be achieved he left uncertain. He condemned the attempt to overthrow Hitler's regime by assassination and coup d'etat as immoral and unchristian, a stab in the back, and the most disgraceful treason against our army. In rejecting force, however, his only alternative seemed to resuppose a collective challenge to Hitler's disastrous leadership by the generals. Since he acknowledged that the bonds with Hitler, both within the Wehrmacht and among the people generally, were still very strong in 1944, it is not clear how he imagined that such a collective challenge might have been possible. The revival of support for Hitler personally, and the corresponding shrill demand for severe reprisals against the traitors, and a drastic cleansing of those allegedly sabotaging the war effort crucially gave the regime a new lease on life at a most critical juncture. It offered the opportunity, which Nazi leaders were only too keen to grasp, for a thoroughgoing radicalization of every aspect of regime and society, aimed at imbuing in a country with its back to the wall the true national socialist ideals and fighting spirit necessary to fend off rapacious enemies. 4. The days immediately following the failed assassination attempt saw extended power pass to Himmler, Goebbels, and Bormann. Speer, the fourth big baron, found himself squeezed in the contest dominated by this trio. Even so, his own position, in charge of armaments, still left him irreplaceable and retaining formidable influence. Between them, these four men controlled most of the avenues of power and did much to direct the course of the regime in its final months. They did so, however, within the framework of Hitler's own supreme authority, which none sought to challenge. On the contrary, their own individual power bases were derived directly from it. In this way, the bonds with the Führer, which had been a decisive element of his charismatic authority from the early days of the Nazi movement, and had become a constituent element of the regime after 1933, remained intact and prevented any internal collapse. The corrosive impact of charismatic authority on the structures of government was also undiminished. Still, now as before, there was no unified government beneath Hitler. The quadrumvirate, far from acting as a coherent body, were to the last effectively at war with each other, trying to use access to Hitler to jockey for power and compete with each other for resources and expanded areas of competence. Hitler took the first major step in radicalization within hours of surviving the bomb blast in his East Prussian headquarters by appointing Himmler to replace General Friedrich Fromm as commander-in-chief of the replacement army. The headquarters of the replacement army had been the epicenter of the plans for the intended coup d'etat, and, despite his endeavors to prove his loyalty, once he knew Hitler had survived, by turning on the plotters and having Stauffenberg and three of his co-conspirators shot by a firing squad late in the evening of the 20th of July, Fromm was himself soon arrested and, some months later, executed. The replacement army was viewed as the Aegean stables that had to be cleansed. In Himmler, the man was at hand to take on this task. 
Himmler had, in reality, failed as head of security in the Reich to protect Hitler from the assassination attempt or to uncover the plot that lay behind it. Hitler either ignored or overlooked these omissions, and turning now to Himmler to place his stamp on a central office of the Wehrmacht. Himmler, as we noted, had already a foot in the door of the replacement army's sphere of competence on gaining responsibility for ideological education on the 15th of July. His influence was now, however, substantially extended as he brought under his aegis one of the most important positions within the Wehrmacht. On taking charge of armaments, army discipline, prisoners of war, reserve personnel, and training. With the replacement army, almost two million men in conventional military service were placed under Himmler's control. It was a significant addition to his already enormous range of powers. Himmler's impact was soon felt. He immediately countermanded Fromm's orders of the 20th of July and started to fill the key positions in his new domain with trusted SS lieutenants, making the head of the SS operations head office, Hans Jutner, his deputy in running the replacement army. He then embarked upon a series of pep talks for army officers. While short on specifics, these speeches gave a clear impression of the changed climate. As early as the 21st of July, Himmler addressed officers under his command as Chief of Army Armaments, an area which had now fallen within his own imperium. In 1918, he began, the revolt of the soldiers' councils had cost Germany victory. This time there was no danger of anything similar happening. The mass of the people, in bombed-out cities and factories, were of unprecedented decency one of Himmler's favorite words, in their behavior. But now, for the first time in history, a German colonel had broke his oath and struck at his supreme warlord. He knew it would come to this one day, he said, vaguely glossing over what he might have been expecting to have gleaned of the background to the plot. The attempt to kill the Führer and overthrow the regime had been suppressed, but it had been a grave danger. It had been more like Honduras or South America than Germany. The previous afternoon he had received the mandate from the Führer to restore order and take over the home army. He had accepted, as an unconditional follower of the Führer, who had never in my life been guilty of disloyalty and never will be. He had taken on the task as a German soldier, and not as the commander-in-chief of a rival organization, the Waffen-SS. He now had to clean up. He would, he went on, restore trust and bring about a return to values of loyalty, obedience, and comradeship. It was sometimes necessary to go through hell, he declared, but the supreme leadership had strong nerves and knew how to act brutally when necessary. He ended by outlining the meaning of the war, confirmation of Germany as a world power, the creation of a Germanic Reich to grow to 120 millions, and a new order within that Reich. An invasion from Asia would recur every fifty, hundred, or two hundred years, but there would not always be an Adolf Hitler to help repel it. The necessity, therefore, was to prepare a bulwark against future attacks by colonizing the East through German settlement. We shall learn to rule foreign peoples, he stated. We would have to be deeply ashamed if we were now to become too weak. Two further speeches by Himmler to officers in the next few days had much the same tenor. The recourse to the baleful precedent of 1918, the fulfillment of duty this time by the people and almost all the army, but the shame a colonel had brought on the officer corps, the lack of loyalty of some officers, and the need for ruthless action against those guilty of cowardice. The emphasis was once more on the war aims that could not be given up, including now, mastery over the continent to afford protection in future wars through the extension of defense frontiers. The unbounded ruthlessness that was more than ever to become the Reichsfuhrer SS's trademark in subsequent months was evident in his message to his liaison officer in Hitler's headquarters, Hermann Fegelein, that at the sign of any disintegration among divisions serving in the East, 
which he put down to sedition spread by communist infiltration. Reception detachments of the most brutal commanders were to shoot anyone opening his mouth. Himmler's authority to intervene in what had hitherto been army matters was widened still further by another Führer decree on the 2nd of August, giving the Reichsführer SS powers, through radical restructuring, to inspect and simplify, meaning reduce in size, producing savings and manpower, the entire organizational and administrative basis of the army, the Waffen-SS, the police, and the organization taught to produce more manpower for the army. The last of these bodies, the OT, was the huge construction complex, whose massive workforce Speer had now agreed to expose to the Reichsfuhrer SS's new powers for labor savings. Cuts in what he saw as a bloated army administration had been part of Himmler's intention from the start, and he was able, through his excisions, to raise another 500,000 troops for the front and create 15 Volksgrenadier, or People's Grenadiers, divisions from new recruits. With his new authority, Himmler was now a party to the power struggle at the top of the regime for control of the now total war drive. Goebbels was a second key winner from the events of the 20th of July. The crucial role that he played in crushing the uprising in Berlin was acknowledged by Hitler. Under the impact of the attack on his life and the shock to the system that this represented, Hitler was now at last prepared to grant his propaganda minister the position that Goebbels had been seeking for well over a year, and finally make him Reich plenipotentiary for the total war effort. The meeting of ministers or their representatives, chaired by Lammers, that took place on the 22nd of July, a day later than had originally been arranged, amounted, practically, to a ritual acclamation of Goebbels as the new total war supremo. At the very outset of the meeting, Lammers, safe in the knowledge that the Reich Chancellery, over which he presided, had been exempted by Hitler from any inroads into its personnel, proposed the propaganda minister for the task of mobilizing the civilian sector. Keitel, Bormann, and all others present supported the proposition. Goebbels spoke for an hour, portraying the issue as threefold providing new manpower through cutting back on Wehrmacht administration, drastically reducing the state bureaucracy, and a vaguely couched reform of public life. The party, Goebbels acknowledged, did not fall within his purview. That was Bormann's domain, for him alone to handle. Coming out the military sector was also ruled out of the proposed operations. This was set aside for the new commander-in-chief of the replacement army, Heinrich Himmler. Speer, who had tried hard in mid-July to press for total war, found himself now largely on the sidelines. His memorandum of the 12th of July received, on Hitler's instructions, only little attention to prevent the meeting becoming immersed in detail. When Speer spoke, in fact, the figures he gave for potential savings from state bureaucracy were immediately contradicted by Lammers and the state secretary in the Reich Ministry of the Interior, Wilhelm Stuckart, Vested interests came into play straight away, as Stuckert emphasized how little spare capacity for manpower savings existed in the state bureaucracy. Goebbels steered the meeting away from a likely descent into detail and back to the general issue. For the propaganda minister, as he plainly stated, total war was not only a material but especially a psychological problem, and he acknowledged that some of the measures taken would impart have merely optical character. Ideological mobilization was, as ever, his chief concern. The meeting ended, predictably, with Lammers agreeing to propose Goebbels for the position as plenipotentiary next day, when most of those present would gather again to report to Hitler at his East Prussian headquarters. Goebbels was happy. All those taking part, he jotted in his diary, are of the opinion that the Führer must provide the most extensive plenipotentiary powers, on the one hand for the Wehrmacht, on the other for the state and public life. Himmler is proposed for the Wehrmacht, I, myself, for the state and public life. Burman is to get corresponding full powers to engage the party in this great, totalizing process, 
and Speer has already received the powers to intensify the armaments process. When the meeting reassembled in Hitler's presence the following afternoon, Goering and Himmler were also in attendance. Goering protested, in vain, at yet a further diminution of his power in handing Himmler responsibility for matters which should properly, he claimed, be those of the commanders-in-chief of the Wehrmacht. Hitler intervened to back Himmler. The resulting experience could then be utilized by Goering and Grand Admiral Karl Donitz, who, as commanders-in-chief of the Luftwaffe and Navy, continued to be responsible for their own domains. The compromise was accepted. For the rest, Hitler, who evidently carefully read Goebbels' memorandum of the 18th of July, backed the propaganda minister and the proposal for drastic new measures in the total war effort. The Fuhrer declares that there is no further use in debating specific points, Goebbels recorded. Something fundamental has to be done or we can't win this war. Hitler's position, he noted, was very radical and incisive. In what would become a cliché in the last months, Hitler spoke of the new radicalization as a return to the party's roots. Characteristically, too, he played on the populist assumption that the people wanted a total war in the most comprehensive fashion and that we cannot contradict the will of the people in the long run. Goebbels was delighted at the outcome and at Hitler's changed approach. It is interesting to observe, he commented, how the Führer has changed since my last talk with him on the Obersalzburg on the 21st of June. Events, especially on the day of the assassination attempt, and those on the Eastern Front, have brought him to the clarity of the decisions. Two days later, on the 25th of July, Hitler signed the decree making Goebbels plenipotentiary for total war. Goebbels was elated over his triumph, a far greater success, he claimed, than he had imagined. His press secretary, Wilfred von Oven, thought he was now the first man in the Third Reich after Hitler. Three times in his diary, the propaganda minister himself spoke of an internal war dictatorship, implying that this, his coveted goal, would now be in his hands. It was a fine conceit, but Goebbels was aware that he would remain, if, with strengthened authority, only one, not the sole, source of power beneath Hitler, and that, as ever, this power would be wielded in competition, not unison. The very wording of the decree, as he recognized, limited the scope of his powers. He could issue directives to the highest Reich authorities, but any decrees of implementation that arose had to be negotiated with Lammers, Bormann, and Himmler. In his capacity as general plenipotentiary for Reich administration, which had fallen to him when he became Minister of the Interior. He was dependent upon Bormann's support for measures involving the party, and in the case of unresolvable conflict arising from his orders, Hitler reserved his own authority to make any necessary decision. Some exemptions were made on Hitler's express authority. The personnel of the Reich, presidial and party chancelleries, the Führer's motor vehicle staff, and those involved in planning the rebuilding of Berlin, Munich, and Linz were excluded. And a major area, the army, had, of course, from the beginning been carved off and given over to Himmler. Undeterred, Goebbels presided over a veritable torrent of activity in subsequent weeks, dispatching instructions to all Gauleiter in a telephone conference each midday. He had to contend with numerous obstacles and vested interests, which he did not always surmount. And, however drastic his interventions, there were, in fact, fewer slack areas of the economy able to provide extra manpower than he had anticipated, while some of his rationalizations proved to be inefficient. In some cases, Hitler himself intervened to limit the cuts that Goebbels sought to impose. Through Bormann, he requested that the propaganda minister consider, in each case, whether the ends justified the means. If this entailed significant disturbance to public services, such as postal deliveries. Even so, Goebbels raised nearly half a million extra men for the Wehrmacht by October, and around a million by the end of the year. Many were, in fact, far from fit for military service, and were in any case outweighed by German losses at the front over the same period. <laughs> 
As a means of countering the massive Allied superiority in numbers, it is obvious that Goebbels' total war effort, scraping the bottom of the barrel, was doomed. But in terms of prolonging the war and enabling Germany to fight on when beset by disaster on all fronts, the total war mobilization that flowed from Goebbels' new powers certainly played its part. Through his measures, the German population were more dragooned, corralled, and controlled than ever. Few people were inwardly enthused for long. Most, where they could gain no exemption, had little choice but to fall in with the new demands. Dislocation, atomization, and resignation usually followed. Though the appetite for the ever more desperate struggle was diminishing, there was scant room for any alternative. Martin Bormann, head of the party's administration, was the third big winner from the military disasters of the summer, and especially of the radicalization of the regime that followed the shock of the attempt on Hitler's life. He exploited the new crisis atmosphere to reinvigorate the party and massively expand its power and his own power and influence in the process. Even before the assassination attempt, he had started to sift through the party organization to make manpower available for the Wehrmacht or the armaments industry. Goebbels' total war initiative was, therefore, both timely for him and could be used to his own advantage. Goebbels set up a relatively small coordinated staff in Berlin, but envisaged the crucial work of the total war effort being carried out through the party agencies at regional level. This was grist to the mill for Bormann. He could utilize the changed climate to bolster the power of the Gauleiter in the regions at the expense of the state bureaucracy. The Reich Defense Commissars, or RVKs, the Gauleiter already possessed the scope to interfere in matters deemed to pertain to the defense of the Reich in their regions. This had been widened, a week before the assassination attempt, by a decree from Hitler stipulating what would prove to be unclear guidelines for collaboration of Wehrmacht and party in military operational zones within the Reich. The decree opened the door to future interference by the RVKs in crucial issues within the operational zones, such as the evacuation of the civilian population and immobilization or destruction of industry. Bormann was now able to extend their power substantially in what was, in effect, a permanent crisis assumed under the mantle of total war, authorizing them to issue directives to the state administration in areas which had previously been beyond their remit. The Gauleiter, each of whom had acquired his position through readiness to use elbow power, were only too happy to comply with the invitation to throw their weight around more than ever. The decentralization of power that this implies was, however, only one strand of what had been dubbed, slightly awkwardly, a policy of partification. While backing the Gauleiter against the state authorities, Bormann was keen to extend the control of the party chancellery over the regional chieftains, and to hold all reins of authority in crucial policy areas in his own hands. The dominance of the party, which was happening with his backing in the regions, also took place in central administration. Increasingly, the party chancellery pushed the Reich Chancellery, under Lammers, out of key areas of policy. Lammers' office as head of the Reich Chancellery, once so important as the link between the Reich ministers and Hitler, now lost all significance, serving from now on as little more than a postbox and distribution agency for orders laid down by Bormann. Lammers, completely sidelined, was to see Hitler for the last time in September. In despair, he would, from the following March, be incapable of work and driven to near-nervous breakdown. But in the second half of 1944, there was already no central government, in any conventional sense of the term. Bormann had usurped the Reich administration, combining his control over the party with his proximity to Hitler to create an enhanced powerhouse in Fuhrer headquarters. Even so, it was, however important, not the only powerhouse. Partification at the expense of state bureaucracy 
created neither a streamlined administration nor an alternative central government as the Reich started to fragment. What it did do, however, was to enhance the organizational capacity of the party, and above all to strengthen massively the grip of the party over government and society. The key positions in the Nazi movement of Himmler, Goebbels, and Burman enable them to take advantage of the climate of crisis. Amid the shrill cries of treachery and thirst for revenge after the Stauffenberg plot, to promote their own power. Speer, in contrast, enjoyed no position or special standing within the party. He lacked both a populist touch, such as Goebbels instinctively had, and the organizational base of Himmler or Bormann. There was much more of the technocrat of power than party activist about him. He had joined forces with Goebbels in the attempt to persuade Hitler to introduce radical measures for total war but that was before Stauffenberg's bomb had gone off. His hopes of gaining control over the entire arena of army armaments were immediately dashed when Himmler was made head of the replacement army. Speer even had to contend with suspicions, in the immediate aftermath of the assassination attempt, that he himself had been implicated. And, in the swift moves to create a plenipotentiary for total war, Goebbels' populism and Elan caught Hitler's mood, while Speer's drier assessment of the needs of the armaments industry took a back seat. Bormann's control of the party machinery and his conscious push to widen the remit of the Gauleiter, as RVKs, also weakened Speer since his own armaments drive invariably encountered the rooted interests of the provincial party bosses and their frequent interventions at regional level. Moreover, once the total war push was underway, Speer quickly found himself up against his former ally Goebbels and the new alliance that the propaganda minister had forged with Bormann, who could usually engineer Hitler's backing. The obvious question of demands on the scarce manpower located by the various rationalization measures, whether this should be allocated to the Wehrmacht or to armaments production, had been characteristically avoided during the time of the short-lived Goebbels' Speer axis. As soon as the issue of power over the total war effort had been resolved and the question of labor allocation became acute, Speer found himself on the defensive. He had made powerful enemies in fighting for his own domain. Goebbels' laconic comment on the armaments minister immediately after winning the battle was, I think we have let this young man become somewhat too big. Speer standing with Hitler had also weakened. Not only was he no longer so obviously Hitler's favorite, he had to struggle against the increased influence of his own ambitious subordinate, Karl Otto Sauer, head of the technical office in Speer's ministry, who earlier in the year had been placed by Hitler in charge of air defense. It would be as well, nevertheless, not to interpret Speer's relative loss of power in the top echelons of the regime, which the former armaments minister was keen to emphasize for posterity, as meaning that he had been ousted from all significant spheres of influence. He continued, in fact, to occupy a decisive position at the intersection between the military and industry. The military needed the weaponry he made available. Industry needed his driving force to produce the weapons, in the face of severe and mounting difficulties. No amount of propaganda or oppression by the party's populists and enforcers could supply the army with weapons. On the 1st of August, Speer was, moreover, able to extend his already sprawling empire when Goering was compelled to hand over to him control of the Luftwaffe's armaments production. Whatever the internal struggles he had to undertake in the power jungle of the Third Reich during the phase of its inexorable decline, Speer remained indispensable to Hitler and the regime. Writing to Hitler near the end of the war, he claimed... Without my work, the war would perhaps have been lost in 1942-43. He was surely right. His achievements constitute an important element in the answer to the question of how Germany held out so long. To this extent, Speer, notwithstanding a weakening of his internal position, was a crucial, possibly even the most important, member of the quadrumvirate that directed Germany's path into the abyss in the Third Reich's last months. 5. The combined efforts of the quadrumvirate, 
would have served little purpose had the armed forces shown signs of disaffection and wavered in their backing for the regime. We already saw, however, that amid the shocked response to Stauffenberg's assassination attempt, military leaders were keener than ever to demonstrate their loyalty to Hitler and disassociate themselves from the uprising against the regime. The arch-loyalist, Jodl, his head bandaged after being slightly wounded in the bomb blast, and in deep shock at what had happened, set the tone. He told Goebbels that the loyal generals who worked closely with Hitler would help him ruthlessly hunt down the defeatists, putschists, and assassination instigators. So outraged was he at the treachery from within that he favored disbanding the general staff altogether. The 20th of July, he told officers of the Wehrmacht operations staff, was the blackest day in German history, worse even than the 9th of November 1918, unique in its monstrosity. Now there would be pitiless reprisals against those responsible. When everything rotten has been weeded out, there would be a new unity. Even if luck should be against us, we must be determined to gather round the Fuhrer at the last, so that we may be justified before posterity. Jodl sought a personal show of loyalty from the officers present who were to seal their commitment to sharing their destiny with the Fuhrer by a handshake. Fear of any connection with the plotters, and the dire consequences such a discovery would entail, naturally played a significant part in the new rush to demonstrate loyalty beyond question. But the support for Hitler and denunciation of treachery by the army against their supreme commander and head of state was, for the most part, spontaneous and genuine. Even so, Hitler and the regime leadership were leaving nothing to chance. The upsurge of bile vented at the officer corps by party fanatics, which Bormann even had to dampen down, now offered the perfect atmosphere in which new controls could be introduced and new efforts made to improve the ideological indoctrination of the army. The introduction, initiated by the commanders-in-chief of the armed forces, not by Hitler, on the 23rd of July of the Heil Hitler greeting, instead of the military salute, provided an external sign of the reinforced bonds with the Führer. Hitler's immediate step, within hours of the assassination attempt, was to restore order in what he had regarded, long before the plot, as the army's most critical weak spot. For three weeks since Zeitzler's breakdown at the beginning of July, the army had, in effect, lacked a chief of the general staff. With the imminent danger of the Red Army breaking through into East Prussia, a new chief was a vital necessity. And since, in Hitler's eyes, the source of the cancer that had led to the attempted uprising lay in this key center of army operational planning, a reliable new chief was essential to make the general staff both militarily effective and politically sound. Hitler's intended choice, General Walter Bula, had been injured in the assassination attempt. He turned, therefore, to the highly experienced and well-respected tank specialist Heinz Guderian, since early 1943 Inspector General of Panzer Troops. A fervent nationalist and anti-communist, a personality of great drive and dynamism, extremely forceful in his views and a daring strategist, Guderian had played a notable part in persuading Hitler, whom in earlier years he had greatly admired, of the tactical value in modern warfare of concentrated and swift panzer attack. He had gained plaudits for the great panzer thrust through the Ardennes in 1940 that had played a major part in the spectacular collapse of Allied forces in France. A year later, his panzer forces had spearheaded the initially notable advances in Russia. Conflict with the commander-in-chief of Army Group Center, Field Marshal Hans Gunther von Kluge, over tactics, and Guderian's fiery temperament had brought his dismissal in the winter crisis of 1941, but he had been recalled by Hitler in February 1943 in the wake of another crisis, the catastrophe at Stalingrad. Though increasingly skeptical about Hitler's conduct of the war, and despite being approached by the conspirators, Guderian had the following year kept his hands clean in the plot, and still condemned Stauffenberg's attempt after the war. In 
He certainly had Goebbels' imprimatur. The propaganda minister described him as insurpassable in loyalty to the Führer. In his dealings with Hitler, Guderian would learn in the months to come that loyalty and sound military judgment seldom went hand in hand. But following his appointment on the 21st of July, he was keen to display his credentials as a loyalist and establish unconditional loyalty in an almost entirely reconstructed general staff, which had seen so many of its former officers arrested under suspicion of complicity in the plot. He rapidly denounced what he depicted as the defeatism and cowardice that had led to the disgrace of the general staff, and guaranteed an officer corps now completely loyal to the Führer. One of the early steps he took was to ensure that not merely the high level of ability associated with the general staff, the intellectual elite of the army, but ideological commitment to Nazi ideals was now required. On the 29th of July, he issued the order that every general staff officer should be a National Socialist Leadership Officer, or NSFO, that he must demonstrate and prove, as well as in tactics and strategy, through an exemplary stance in political questions, through active direction and instruction of younger comrades in the intentions of the Führer, that he belongs to the selection of the best. The general staff having failed disastrously and criminally in the eyes of the regime's leaders, was now particularly exposed to Nazification. No further disaffection could be expected from that quarter. Hitler had established a corps of NSFOs within the high command of the Wehrmacht in December 1943 and placed it under the charge of General Hermann Reinecke. Its task was to instill the Nazi spirit into troops who, he feared, were being affected by subversive Soviet propaganda. For Hitler and the regime's leadership, breathing fanaticism into the troops was the road to victory. There was little lacking for the new institution among the officer corps, and the NSFOs had a hard time gaining acceptance. The failed uprising of July 1944 drastically changed the situation. It was not that the NSFOs were now greeted with open arms by most soldiers, or that their message was warmly welcomed and taken to heart. On the contrary, their presence often remained resented, and their pep talks frequently still fell on deaf ears. Even so, much of the Wehrmacht's mass base was still potentially receptive to Nazi ideals, since around a third of ordinary soldiers were, or had been, members of some party affiliate. In any case, the new circumstances meant that there was now no protection against the extended deployment of these military missionaries of Nazi ideology. Their chief, General Reinecke, indicated the possibilities in August. With the traitors wiped out, the last opponents of the decisive politicization of the Wehrmacht have been eliminated. There must be no more obstacles in the way of national socialist leadership work. By the end of 1944, there were more than a 1,000 full-time and as many as 47,000 part-time NSFOs, most of them members of the party working in the Wehrmacht. The task accorded them was to educate the soldiers to an unconstrained will to destroy and to hate. Guidelines for the NS leadership, distributed on the 22nd of July, offered a glimpse of this doctrinal intrusion. Troops were to be fully informed of the cowardly, murderous strike against the Führer and the events of the 20th of July. The addresses that evening by Hitler, Goering, and Donitz were to be read out. Every soldier was to be clear that any sign of insubordination would be punished by death. It was the duty of any soldier of honor, conscious of his duty, to intervene as strongly as possible against Symptoms of unsoldierly and dishonorable behavior. National Socialist Germany would know how to prevent a repeat of the stab in the back of 1918 or anything similar to the pitiful treason in Italy at the toppling of Mussolini in July 1943. Only the united strength of all Germans could fend off the threat of the whole of Europe from the Reich's enemies. One man alone could save Germany from Bolshevism and destruction, our Führer Adolf Hitler. 
The message was, therefore, to stand all the more solidly and fervently behind the Fuhrer, and to fight still more fanatically. A fateful, lasting consequence of the bomb plot was the elimination of any possibility of the armed forces constituting an agent of regime change in the last months of the Third Reich. At the pinnacle of the military system in the high command of the Wehrmacht, Keitel and Jodl remained totally behind Hitler, emotionally committed to him in a way that surpassed their functional positions. Wilhelm Keitel, tall and well-built, an officer during the First World War, and excellent organizer with long experience of army administration, had been deeply impressed by Hitler from the time he had first encountered him back in 1933. At the complete reorganization of the Wehrmacht leadership in early 1938, Hitler, on establishing the OKW, had made Keitel its administrative head. Therefore Keitel, in whom obedience to the will of the ruler had long been ingrained, was wholly enthralled to Hitler, so much so that he was widely lampooned as being simply his lackey. Alfred Jodl, a tall, balding Bavarian, had also served as an officer in the First World War and, like Keitel, in the small German army during the Weimar Republic. Well-versed in operational planning, he had been appointed chief of the Wehrmacht operations staff just before the invasion of Poland in 1939. He had impressed Hitler a few months later with his part in planning the invasion of Scandinavia, then the major Western offensive, in spring 1940. Jodl himself had been full of admiration for Hitler's leadership during the great victory over France. He thought Hitler was a genius, and despite later disagreements with him on tactical matters, did not change his mind. Beyond the OKW, the Army General Staff, under Guderian, could no longer incubate any source of disaffection. Nothing but ultra-loyalty could be expected of the Luftwaffe under Göring's command, and the Navy was headed by the radically pro-Nazi Grand Admiral Donitz. With the replacement army under Himmler's tight control, and the General Staff purged and brought into line, any new moves to resist the self-destructive course of the Nazi leadership from the two areas most closely associated with the assassination attempt, were ruled out for the duration. And no insurrection could be expected from top generals, the frontline commanders-in-chief, or their subordinate officers. The chief waverer among Army Group commanders, Field Marshal von Kluge, commander-in-chief West, had blown hot and cold on the resistance movement eventually turning his back on the conspirators, but falling nonetheless under deep suspicion in Hitler's headquarters. He was to kill himself, still protesting his loyalty to the Führer some weeks later. Dissident officers in Paris, Vienna, and Prague had fallen victim to the purge that followed the quashed uprising. The other army group commanders and leading generals, whatever their disagreements with Hitler's orders, were outright loyalists and remained so. Field Marshal von Rundstedt and Colonel General Guderian served, the latter he subsequently claimed with great reluctance, on the court of honor which dismissed from the army officers implicated in the bomb plot, throwing them onto the tender mercies of the People's Court and its notorious presiding judge, Roland Freisler. Field Marshal Walter Mordel, commander-in-chief at different times of three army groups in the East, an excellent tactician, good organizer, and stern disciplinarian, who had stood up to Hitler on a number of occasions but remained high in the dictator's favor, saw himself as purely a military professional, standing aside from politics. But whatever the self-image of the unpolitical soldier, a delusion he shared with other generals, he, of course, acted politically in a system that made it impossible to do otherwise. He refused to believe the plotter's claim on the 20th of July that Hitler was dead. He was the first military leader to send a declaration of loyalty to the dictator on hearing of his survival, and he never wavered in his support. At the end of July, he sought, through a combination of renewed trust in Hitler and straightforward fear, to restore wavering morale and discipline in the devastated Army Group Center, which had lost 350,000 men killed or captured. The enemy stands at East Prussia's borders, his proclamation to his troops ran, 
but his own men still held a position enabling them to defend the holy soil of the fatherland, to repel the danger of murder, fire, and plundering of German villages and towns, as the Fuhrer, people, and comrades fighting on other fronts expected. Cowards have no place in our ranks, he went on. Any waverer has forfeited his life. It's about our homeland, our wives and children. Intense concentration of all forces could combat the temporary superiority of the enemy in numbers and materiel. The new responsibilities given to Himmler and Goebbels had provided all the necessary prerequisites for this. No soldier in the world is better than we soldiers of our Führer Adolf Hitler. Heil to our beloved Führer, he ended. If each of these examples illustrates the corruption of military professionalism in the Third Reich, the last is of a commander, Colonel General Ferdinand Schorner, of a different type, a fanatical loyalist from ingrained Nazi conviction, a believer in triumph of the will, and the need for a revolution of the spirit in the army. An indicator of Schorner's acknowledged fanaticism was that he served for a brief spell in March 1944 as chief of the NS leadership staff of the army, responsible for coordinating relations between the military and the party. He brought to Army Group North on his transfer there on the 23rd of July an unprecedented level of ferocious internal discipline that produced, as in his other commands, countless executions for cowardice, defeatism, and desertion. He made it plain at the outset that the slightest show of disobedience would be mercilessly punished. In an early declaration to his generals, he expounded his belief that the war was not to be won by tactical measures alone. Belief, loyalty, and fanaticism were increasingly necessary as the enemy neared German borders. Everyone had to realize that the aim of Bolshevism was the destruction of our people. It was a struggle for existence in which the only alternatives were victory or downfall. To stop the Asiatic flood wave, as he described the Soviet advance, faith in victory was the strongest life force. He ended his communique, Heil to the Fuhrer. Ten years after the war, an officer who had served under him described Schorner as trying to replace energy through brutality, operational flexibility through inflexible principles of defense, a sense of responsibility through lack of conscience. With such ruthless leadership, the slightest sign of insubordination, let alone any hint of mutiny, was tantamount to suicide. Quite apart from their personal loyalty to Hitler, and whatever the individual variation in their views on his conduct of the war, or Germany's prospects, these and other leading generals saw their unconditional duty as doing all they could to defend the Reich against enemy inroads. Nazi values intermingled, often subliminally, with old-fashioned patriotism. As the pressure on the fronts, east, west, and south, mounted inexorably, Field commanders had little time for other than urgent military matters. Had they been of a single mind, and even dreamt of staging another putsch to end the looming catastrophe, organizing one would have proved impossible. So would confronting Hitler with an ultimatum to stand down or negotiate peace terms. In practice, however, such thoughts never entered the heads of the military elite. Jodl summarized the stance at the top of the military establishment. He wrote, Fortunately, the Allied demand for unconditional surrender, laid down at the Casablanca Conference in January 1943, has blocked the way for all those cowards who are trying to find a political way of escape. Doing what was humanly possible to prevent destruction of the Reich was seen as the unquestioned imperative. In adhering to such a goal, of course, the generals ensured that precisely this destruction would happen. 6. At a time when Germany was rocked by disastrous military defeat, amid soaring anxieties over the superiority of enemy forces, Hitler's war leadership and the prospects for Germany's future, the assassination attempt and uprising had the effect of strengthening the regime, at least in the short term. In the aftermath, mentalities, structures of control, and possibilities for action were all changed.
Attitudes were adjusted, to some extent reshaped. Hitler himself was changed. His paranoia had never been far from the surface. Now it knew no bounds. He sensed treachery on all sides. Treachery gave him the explanation of military failure and of any trace of what he saw as weakness in those around him. It prevented any need for the narcissistic personality to contemplate his own part in the catastrophe. Anyone who speaks to me of peace without victory will lose his head, no matter who he is or what his position. He was later claimed to have repeatedly threatened those in his vicinity as the fronts were collapsing. Such a mentality, at the head of the regime, percolated outwards and downwards. Blind fury, not just at the conspirators, but at the officer corps as a whole, fueled by a hate-filled tirade by Robert Ly, head of the Labor Front and organization leader of the Nazi Party, which advocated the extermination of the aristocracy, described as degenerate, idiotic filth. Many of the plotters had aristocratic backgrounds, ran in the veins of party fanatics in these days, but spilled over, too, into the wider public. Bormann even had to contain it in the interests of retaining his own control rather than pour oil onto the flames. Wise and cautious voices kept quiet. Signs of anything that could be interpreted as defeatism now invited fearful reprisals. Within the armed forces, leading officers of Schorner's kind needed no encouragement. But the change in mentalities went beyond soldier fanatics. Belief in victory, commitment to the last reserves of will to hold out, rejection of anything that smacked of the slightest doubt in the struggle, became more than ever incontrovertible tenets of all public parlance, constantly reinforced by the more widely deployed NSFOs. Private doubts were best not aired. At whatever rank, anyone voicing criticism of the war effort was taking a risk. Even close circles of friends and comrades had to take care, lest any comment that could be seen as subversive should reach prying ears. From the top downwards in every division, every battalion, every company, officers felt the need to demonstrate loyalty and clamp down on the slightest sign of dissent. It was little wonder that the numbers of executions in the military, as in the civilian sphere, started to soar. The failed uprising also brought the changes we have examined to the structures of rule. Some of these changes had already been initiated in the light of the intensified pressures of the war when Stauffenberg's bomb went off. The extended role of the RVKs, and with that the increased scope for intervention by the party into state bureaucracy, and spheres of military responsibility offers one example. Goebbels saw this as a further sharp incision into the power of the generals. But even where developments were already in train, the events of the 20th of July and their aftermath served as a sharp accelerator. Radicalization along the line acutely intensified. It was as if the dam had broken, and now finally a revolutionary war could be fought on truly National Socialist lines. The pillars of the regime had been shaken by the events of the 20th of July, but were left not only standing, but buttressed. Hitler's charismatic appeal had long since been weakened, but had been temporarily revived by the attempt on his life. More importantly, his hold over the regime was undiluted. The major wielders of power were divided among themselves, but united in their dependence upon Hitler's favor. Each general of the Wehrmacht, too, knew his command lasted only until Hitler took it away. Beneath Hitler, the regime's grip had been strengthened. The key controls of the regime were in the hands of Nazi leaders with nothing to lose. They knew, and had participated in, its crimes against humanity, most obviously the extermination of the Jews. Hitler's empire extended into the Wehrmacht itself, his ruthless repression, now increasingly against members of the people's community, as well as conquered Untermenschen and racial enemies, plumbed new depths. Mobilization for total war underwent a frenzied phase of activity under Goebbels, who at the same time cranked up the propaganda machine into overdrive for the backs-to-the-wall effort 
Bormann revitalized the party, finally offering it the prospect of the social and political revolution its fanatical activist core had always sought. And Speer defied adversity in new exploits of mobilizing the armaments industry. Military power, too, had been consolidated in the hands of loyalists. As fortunes on the battlefield worsened, the military leadership had bound itself to Hitler more tightly than ever. In the process, it had cut off any possibility of extricating itself from those bonds. It had committed itself to the very dualism that Hitler himself embodied, victory or downfall. Since victory was increasingly out of the question, and Hitler invariably and repeatedly ruled out any attempt at a negotiated settlement, that left downfall. Possibilities had changed. There was now no exit route. From the comfortable distance of imprisonment just outside London, the recently captured Luftwaffe officer, Lieutenant Freyer von Richthofen, said in early August, in a conversation secretly bugged by British intelligence, that he was glad the assassination attempt on Hitler had failed. If it had succeeded, he claimed, there would have been a stab-in-the-back legend such as had bedeviled German politics after 1918. This time, he added, it was politically necessary for the nation to go down the road to the bitter end. This assessment was to leave out of the equation the millions of lives that would have been saved had the bomb plot succeeded and the war been rapidly ended. But it was surely correct in its assumption that a new stab-in-the-back legend would have arisen, posing a threat to any post-Hitler settlement. And it was undoubtedly correct in its assumption that the failure of the attempt to topple Hitler from within in July 1944 meant that the regime could, from now on, be overthrown only by total military defeat. Just how the regime might sustain its war effort until that point, as it turned out, still over eight months away, was a question, however, that Richthofen did not pose. Chapter 2. Collapse in the West we want to build a new Europe, we, the young people, facing the old. But what are we? Famished, exhausted, and drained by madmen. Poor and tired, worn out and nerve-ridden. No, no, no. It's not on any more. An Officer on the Western Front, September 1944 Victory must be ours. One does one's duty and it would be cowardice not to fight to the end. We don't give up hope. It is all up to the leaders. Something quite different will happen from what everybody expects. If we don't win, Germany ceases. Therefore we shall win. Views of Captured German Soldiers on the Western Front September 1944 At the time of the attempted uprising on the 20th of July, the progress of the American and British armies in Normandy had, from an Allied viewpoint, remained disappointingly slow and arduous. They had still not broken out of a relatively constricted area of northwestern France. From the German perspective, it still looked in mid-July as if the Allies could be held at bay. By winning time, new possibilities could open up. All was far from lost. The landing in early June had by now been fully consolidated. The Americans had pushed westwards that month to take the important port of Cherbourg. But it had taken 23, not the expected 15, days, and they found the harbor so wrecked that it was six weeks before it could be opened up to Allied cargoes. The city of Caen had been a D-Day objective, but its environs were fully secured by the Allies in the teeth of fierce German resistance only in mid-July. Then, as the British pushed southwards towards Falaise, they became embroiled in further heavy fighting before their advance in the ill-fated Operation Goodwood was called off, amid torrential rain and heavy losses of men and tanks, on the very day that Stauffenberg's bomb had exploded in Hitler's headquarters. Five days later, the big offensive Operation Cobra, starting with a huge carpet-bombing assault on German lines, aimed at a strong thrust by American troops, to punch through numerically inferior German defenses, further pulverized from the air southwestwards 
to Avranche, near the French coast. By the 30th of July the offensive had succeeded. Late that night Avranche was in Allied hands. A major breakthrough was now possible. The road westward to the coastal ports of Brittany lay exposed, though it was to be weeks before stiff German resistance was overcome and the ports captured. To the south lay the Loire, eastwards towards Paris itself. Only weakened German forces now stood in the way of the Allies. Hitler's thinking so far had been to play for time. He had reckoned that further dogged German resistance would ensure that the Allies continued to make only slow progress. His priority in the West was to hold the U-boat bases on the French coast, essential for the war in the Atlantic on which so much still hinged in his view, and fanatical defense of the harbors to deny the Allies the possibility of large-scale troop reinforcements. Containing the Allies in northwestern France and gaining time would allow defenses to be strengthened and preparations made for a major German offensive, an idea already germinating in Hitler's mind. Inflicting a defeat on the Western Allies and halting their presumed march to victory would then force them into armistice negotiations. He was now faced, however, with the implications of the Allied capture of Avranche. It was an ominous development. Characteristically, he chose not to respond by withdrawing German troops to new lines to the east. Instead, he commissioned Field Marshal Hans Gunther von Kluge, whose idea it had originally been, to launch a quick counteroffensive westwards through Mortain, aimed at retaking Avranche, splitting the American forces and re-establishing the German lines. Kluge's attack took place in the early hours of the 7th of August, but was effectively over after a single day. German troops did succeed in regaining Mortain and advancing about 11 kilometers, but, subjected to ceaseless bombardment, they could get no further. By insisting on Kluge, continuing the attack long after wisdom dictated swift withdrawal, Hitler invited disaster. Since Kluge faced increasing danger of encirclement by American forces, Hitler eventually allowed a retreat from the Mortain area on the 11th of August, but as late as the 15th of August, refused Kluge's entreaty to withdraw 100,000 troops in great peril near Falaise. Hitler's suspicions of his field marshal boiled over when he could not reach him by radio that day, and he peremptorily dismissed him from his command, replacing him by the trusted troubleshooter, the tough and unyielding field marshal Model. Soon afterwards, Correctly fearful that he would be put on trial before the dreaded People's Court for his connection with the conspiracy against Hitler, even though he had been careful not to join the plot, Kluge committed suicide. Model eventually extricated around 50,000 men from the rapidly tightening Falaise pocket, but roughly the same number were captured and another 10,000 men killed, while huge quantities of armaments and equipment had to be abandoned. During August, the German army in Western Europe had, in all, lost over 200,000 men killed, injured, or captured. It had been a disaster. A full-scale German retreat turned into little short of a rout. It could even have been worse had the Allies pressed home their advantage, closed the pocket enveloping the German troops, and prevented so many hardened warriors and seasoned officers from escaping to fight again another day. Even so, the Allies could now race northwards and eastwards. German morale seemed on the verge of collapse. When Paris fell on the 25th of August, it was without a fight. Withdrawal was also underway from parts of Belgium and Luxembourg. By the end of August, some two million Allied soldiers were already in France, others rapidly adding to that number. To the north, the Allies could drive on to the Channel ports, the Allied push into Belgium brought the liberation of Brussels on the 3rd of September, and the next day, the capture of Antwerp. Meanwhile, American and French troops had landed on the coast of southern France on the 15th of August. By late that month, they had taken Marseille and advanced on Lyon. It was little wonder, then, that Allied optimism peaked around this time. The Germans, it seemed, could not last through the winter. The war was approaching its final stages, it would all soon be over.
Unexpectedly, however, the Allied advance stalled. The aim evinced at the beginning of September by the Allies' Supreme Commander, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, of pressing forward on the Reich borders on a broad front before German defenses could be consolidated, soon proved an impossibility. The Allies fared worst in the northern sector. Serious tactical errors brought the advance there to a halt. The arrogant British commander, Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, impatient to exploit the German disarray and press boldly ahead into the Ruhr and on to Berlin, made costly mistakes that vitiated his aims. Headstrong and immensely risky, as these would have been anyway. The conflict of strategy and personality between Montgomery and Eisenhower was unquestionably damaging to the Allies at this vital time. Montgomery's failure to exploit the important capture of the undestroyed Antwerp port by pressing forward to secure the Skelt estuary left the crucial port unusable until the end of November and allowed large numbers of German troops who could have been cut off in the area to escape. This was compounded by the disaster at Arnhem, where Montgomery's insistence on a daring airborne assault to cross the Rhine resulted in high British losses. The risky offensive, Market Garden, began on the 17th of September, but was in effect already over three days later. From then on, hopes of a rapid advance across the Rhine and into Germany's industrial heartland, the Ruhr, had to be abandoned. On the southern sector of the front, the U.S. Third Army, under General George Patton, had sped eastwards during the second half of August, crossed the Meuse, and reached the Mosul. Patton was optimistic that he could drive on into Germany, and that the war could be rapidly won. The first step was to press over the Mosul into Lorraine. The important industrial belt of the Tsar beckoned thereafter. In early September, Patton's advance slowed almost to a halt. His supply line to Cherbourg was almost 650 kilometers long. His tanks were simply running out of fuel. And Eisenhower had given priority for the time being to Montgomery's intended drive into the Ruhr. A furious Patton was held back. As his rapid advance became almost immobilized, German defenses facing his attacking forces were urgently strengthened and placed under the command of the redoubtable General Hermann Balk, battle-hardened from the Eastern Front and high in Hitler's favor. The momentum had been lost. It would be a further two months and much hard fighting before fierce German resistance at Metz, the fortress heartland of Lorraine, would be overcome. The best prospects lay in the central sector of the front. The U.S. First Army, under General Courtney Hodges, advancing northeastwards from the Paris area in late August, had destroyed several German panzer divisions, taken 25,000 prisoners, before reaching Mons in Belgium. Part of the army, the 5th U.S. Corps, then turned southeast to advance through Luxembourg and almost to the German border near Trier by the 11th of September, while the 7th U.S. Corps drove directly eastwards towards Aachen. Around 6 p.m. on the 11th of September, the first American troops set foot on German soil, just south of Aachen, a city by now largely free of defending troops and with a panic-stricken population. But the Americans pressed their advantage over too wide an area. German forces regrouped and through tenacious fighting blocked the larger and stronger American forces. Within five days, reinforced German units had succeeded in repulsing the American attack. German authorities were able, for the time being, to restore their control over Aachen and prevent any American breakthrough in the direction of Cologne. Another chance had been missed. It would take a further five weeks of bitter fighting before Aachen became the first German city to fall into Allied hands, on the 21st of October. And it would be nearly six months before Cologne, only 90 kilometers or so away, was taken. Meanwhile, Rundstedt had been recalled as Commander-in-Chief West, in overall command of the army in that theater, on the 5th of September, leaving Model, a brilliant defense strategist, to take charge of Army Group B, one of two army groups on the Western Front. The other, Army Group G, was commanded by Colonel General 
Johannes Blaskowitz. Under Model's command, the German defenses, helped by shortened supply lines and hardened reinforcements, both salvaged from Normandy and brought across from the Eastern Front, had been strengthened. By mid-September, the Allies stood close to the German border over a long stretch of the front from Belgium almost to Switzerland. But it was now clear that expectations, which the Allies had held for months, drawing on the experiences of the First World War, of the sort of German collapse that had happened in 1918, were misplaced. The war was set to drag on. The Allies had shown hesitation and made costly errors at crucial junctures, but the Germans had made their own major contribution to prolonging the war. For Germany, despite fierce and courageous fighting by the outnumbered forces of the Wehrmacht, the collapse in France had come as a dreadful shock. Within a little over three months, the Allies had liberated France and reached Germany's borders. Soon, it was evident, the war would be fought on German soil. Under Model's able command, however, they had survived the critical, but not fatal, defeat near Falaise. Since then, they had surprised the Allies with the tenacity, even fanaticism, of their fighting. Though outnumbered, they had shown energy and initiative, and they had some technically superior weaponry and tanks, if in insufficient quantities. The main weakness was not on the ground, but in the air, where the Luftwaffe was increasingly paralyzed, and Allied superiority immense. Even so, German defense was stubborn, and not easy to break down. Unlike the Russian army in 1917, the German army the following year, the Italian army in 1943, or other instances where heavy defeats had produced a collapse in morale with devastating political consequences, the German armed forces in late summer and autumn of 1944 were far removed from the point at which they were unwilling to fight on any further. What lay behind the extraordinary tenacity of the fighting front in the West? 2. Had the Allies seen reports that were reaching the German leadership at this time on the demoralization among the German civilian population on the western borders of the Reich and within the Wehrmacht produced by the disastrous military collapse in the West, they might have been encouraged in their collapse theory based upon the events of 1918. Such reports certainly did not give the impression that Germany was capable of fighting on for a further eight months. A sense of relief in Germany that the Eastern Front appeared to be stabilized was said to have been dissipated in mid-August through the depressing news of the Allied breakthrough in the West, for which the population had been completely unprepared. Optimists, suggesting that the war could yet be won with a supreme effort, had a hard time in the gathering gloom of opinion about the huge superiority of enemy forces, skepticism about the promised new wonder weapons, and feelings that the total war effort, though generally welcome, had come too late and would in any case not be evenly spread in its burdens. Letters from loved ones at the front, and even official news bulletins from France, were cited as indicators that Germany could not compete with the Allied supremacy in men and weaponry. I don't believe we'll be able to stop the storm of the enemy. One quoted letter home ran, Their superiority is far too great, in the air, and above all with tanks, tanks and still more tanks. Where are the great reserves that have always been talked about? People were asking. In the depressed mood, the desire for an early end to the war was all the stronger, and with it the view that the consequences of defeat would be less dreadful than claimed. Skepticism and defeatism were becoming inseparable. By early September, reports from propaganda offices across the country were indicating that the mood of the people had reached its lowest point during the entire war. Since the general tenor of such reports, more so than those of the SD, was to emphasize the pro-Nazi sentiments of the population, the clear indication of depression and hopelessness conveyed at this time is all the more striking. A sense of insecurity was widespread. Those with negative attitudes were gaining in numbers, 
and undermining morale through defeatist comments and concealed criticism of the leadership. Many were asking why the Allied landing had not been halted, why total war had not been proclaimed earlier, and why the poison that had produced the uprising of the 20th of July had not been spotted earlier and destroyed. The criticism was aimed at the Führer himself, even if people were too wary to mention him directly. Those holding such views could see no way to improve the situation and repel the enemy. The wounded soldiers and refugees streaming in from the West only bolstered their pessimism. Ordinary soldiers and the homeland were not to blame, they were saying, if it all went wrong and Germany were to lose the war. It was not a matter of fate. The ability of the generals was called into question, and the leadership had not done everything necessary. Above all, the sense of powerlessness in the face of immense enemy superiority in numbers and equipment was dispiriting. Women with children were especially prone to anxiety about the future, it was said. Thoughts of suicide were increasingly common. Hopes in the new weapons were fading, particularly since it felt that everything had been done too late to make a difference. People were saying that if Lorraine and the Tsarland could not be held, the loss of centers of vital armaments production would force Germany to surrender. Few thought that the West Wall, the huge line of German fortifications that had been built in 1938, known to the Western Allies as the Siegfried Line, would hold up the enemy advance any more than the French Maginot Line that stopped the Wehrmacht's march into France in 1940. With the enemy at the borders of the Reich, the desertion of Germany's allies, Romania had sued for peace and joined the war against Germany on the 25th of August. Finland was on the verge of breaking off relations with Germany. Other countries were about to follow suit. And exposure with no defense to intensified terror from the skies, it was difficult to avoid pessimism. Refugees from Rombach in Lorraine contributed to a worsening of the mood in factories in the border area with rumors that they had been shot at during their evacuation by train, that enemy parachutists had dropped near Metz, and that the German retreat had been a rout, with officers leaving their soldiers in the lurch as they fled eastwards in whatever vehicles they could find. On top of that, they were saying, the V-1 was no longer being fired. Predictably, the report was dismissed in Berlin as mere exaggeration. That did not diminish, however, the damage that was being done by such rumors. A similar story was provided by Reichsfuhrer SS Heinrich Himmler, by his friend from school days and now of the SS Sanatorium in Hohenlichen, north of Berlin, Professor Karl Gebhardt, during a visit to the Western Front in early September. The population of Trier, he reported, had been disturbed by the numerous rumors in circulation, and by the unpleasant sight of Wehrmacht vehicles streaming in from Aachen. The ordered evacuation of Eupen Malmedy, a former enclave of Belgium annexed by Germany in 1940, had turned into a panic flight of the German population, in the company of party functionaries who evidently had no intention of returning. The party's evacuation of Aachen, the first major German city in Allied sight, and the adjacent areas close to the West Wall on the approach of the Americans had been nothing less than a shambles. Evacuation plans had been laid, and on the 11th of September, Hitler's approval had been given. The evacuation began around midday on the 12th of September. It had scarcely begun, however, when, as it seemed amid the start of heavy artillery attacks and repeated air raids, that the fall of the city was imminent, panic had broken out among the population. It was impossible, amid gathering chaos, to carry out an ordered evacuation. By mid-evening, some 10,000 frightened civilians were crowded into Aachen stations, desperate to get away but with transport made extremely difficult by the bombs raining down on adjacent tracks. Thousands took matters into their own hands, rushing eastwards from the city on foot in long columns, jamming nearby roads. The Nazi authorities themselves estimated shortly afterwards that some 25,000 had managed to leave between the 11th and the 13th of September, to add to the 20,000 who had left the previous week. 
Soon afterwards, on the late evening of the 12th of September, party officials, Gestapo, police and fire service, joined the panic and fled, leaving the people of the city leaderless. Precisely at this juncture, the divisional staff of the 116th Panzer Division arrived, under the command of General Gerd Graf von Schwerin. In the absence of party leaders, Schwerin took responsibility on the 13th of September for restoring order, not least to allow for troop movements. Wild evacuation was halted. Citizens were directed into bunkers. Reckoning that the Americans were about to arrive, Schwerin left a note, written in English, informing the commanding officer of the U.S. forces that he had stopped the stupid evacuation of the population. At the time, there were still between twenty and 30,000 people in the city, most of whom were in fact evacuated in the following days. When German forces unexpectedly proved able for the time being to repel the American attack and prevent the occupation, the Nazi authorities seized upon Schwerin's note, which had come into their hands, to cover their own lamentable failings. The matter was taken as far as Hitler himself. Schwerin was promptly dismissed, and Hitler ordered the utmost radicalism in the defense of the city. An investigation found, however, that Schwerin had acted properly within his responsibilities, and that the failure had plainly lain with the party authorities. Schwerin was converted, in fickle post-war memory, into the savior of Aachen. In fact, there had been no defiance of orders or humanitarian action on Schwerin's part. He had undertaken no act of resistance. In crisis conditions, he was simply carrying out to the best of his ability what he saw as his duty in line with the military demands of the regime. Goebbels noted extraordinary difficulties in the evacuation of the territories close to the West Wall and the population of the border districts being thrown here and there, but saw this as unavoidable at such a time of crisis. A few days later, Acknowledging that the situation in Aachen had become critical, he advocated the principle of scorched earth in the question of evacuation. With the future of the nation at stake, little consideration could be given to the people of the area. Goebbels was put fully in the picture, if in a scarcely unbiased account, about the desolate situation and the evacuation of Aachen by the Gauleiter of Cologne Aachen, Josef Grohe whose authority had been badly damaged by the flight of his subordinates. Party and Wehrmacht had stood at loggerheads. The party had left the city. A general chaos had ensued. Unprecedented scenes had taken place on the roads eastwards from Aachen. The situation there, and in Trier, whose center, including the great hall of Emperor Constantine dating from the early 4th century, had been badly damaged by bombs in mid-August, and which, in the night of the 13th to the 14th of September, was under sustained artillery attack, had to be regarded as extremely serious. Speer, returning from a visit to the region, where he had been driven through the masses streaming away, echoed the accounts of the debacle. The troops he had seen were exhausted. The newly established Volksgrenadier divisions contained many older recruits who could not cope with the physical demands. There was a big drop in the effective strength of the fighting forces and a growing crisis of confidence. Party functionaries labeled officers in general criminals of the 20th of July and blamed them for the military setbacks in both East and West. Soldiers themselves dubbed officers saboteurs of the war and accused them of lack of fighting spirit. The troops had been badly affected by the mishandling of the evacuation of Aachen. The trains had been stopped without any notice and women, children, and old people had been forced to leave on foot. Columns of refugees were to be seen everywhere, sleeping in the open air and blocking roads. There was a chronic shortage of munitions, weapons, and fuel. In the report he sent to Hitler, Speer noted the contrast between soldiers in shabby and tattered uniforms and party functionaries in their gold-braided peacetime uniforms, and sarcastically dubbed golden pheasants, who had not been visible in organizing the evacuation of Aachen's inhabitants or helping to reduce the misery of the refugees. Xaver Dorsch, one of Speer's leading subordinates, in charge of fortifications, 
and offering his own impressions of a visit to the area on the 12th and 13th of September, commented on the damaging impression left by the botched evacuation, and how striking it had been that so few party functionaries had bothered about the refugees. The unnecessary evacuation could, he thought, lead to a catastrophe if the Allied advance continued during subsequent days. He feared disintegration in the army through the anger stirred up by party officials blaming Wehrmacht officers for the retreat in France. Ernst Kaltenbrunner, head of the security police, left Himmler in no doubt about the disastrous situation when he wrote at length in mid-September about the mood of the population during the evacuation and occupation of the western border regions. The evacuation in Luxembourg, annexed by the Reich in August 1942, and attached to the domain of the Gauleiter of Koblenz-Trier, Gustav Simon, had been carried out in an atmosphere of total panic. The Gauleiter's measures had been overhasty, and the civilian administration had broken down. Following Simon's order to evacuate, fortification work on the West Wall had ceased, and the workers had left. The mood of these workers had in any case been poor. They had been badly organized by the party officials, who had then set the worst kind of example by merely supervising but not working themselves. The failings of the Gao administration were evident in the evacuation of 14,500 citizens in the Zarburg district, where there was panic and chaos. The transport laid on was hopelessly insufficient. The lucky ones left by special train, some of the women, children, and sick by bus. But most trudged away by foot, in long, wretched columns, who occupied the roads for days, their possessions trailing along in horse-drawn wagons. Clothing, shoes, and blankets for the evacuees were in short supply. As a result of the chaos, there was a good deal of anger directed at the party. Many people refused to follow the party's orders to leave, which were often confused and contradictory. Others could not find accommodation and came back. In Aachen, where thousands of citizens had defied the evacuation orders, pictures of the Fuhrer had been taken down, and white bedsheets hung from windows in gestures of surrender. The party had lost face through the flight of its functionaries. Organization was poor. Women and children became separated in the evacuation and there had been little sign of anything resembling a people's community. Those with access to cars sped away, unconcerned for anyone else. It was every man for himself. Kaltenbrunner listed some prominent individuals who had left Luxembourg and Trier prematurely to bring their families to safety. The Gauleiter himself and the district leader of Metz were among those noted as deserting their posts in a separate report to Himmler about the uncontrolled refugee movements in Lorraine, endangering troop movements. The railways had stopped running because the German personnel had left, and the civilian administration had detonated essential installations before pulling out, so there were electricity and water shortages, and the telephones did not function. Russian prisoners of war had been left free to roam the countryside, posing a threat to security. One officer, Lieutenant Julius Dufner, stationed at Keilberg, a small spa town in the Eiffel in the Bitburg area just north of Trier, jotted his own first-hand account of the desolate conditions in his diary. The war is lost, he stated, baldly, on the 1st of September. In Trier itself, he observed a day later, there was nothing more to be had. Fuel was in such short supply that vehicles would soon be unable to move. We want to build a new Europe, he wrote. We, the young people facing the old. But what are we? Famished, exhausted, and drained by madmen. Poor and tired, worn out and nerve-ridden. No, no, no. It's not on any more. When reproachful citizens asked soldiers why they were retreating, they answered that they, too, wanted to go home to the Reich. It had all been a bluff, he wrote, alluding to the miracle weapons. That was what happened when an advertising boss, he meant Hitler, became supreme commander of the Wehrmacht. Files and papers were being destroyed in huge quantities. Everything that seemed at one time indispensable 
is today valueless and nothing at all. Who was to blame for it all? the diarist asked. Not those in lowly places, was his answer. Those who simply did not want to fight or die for a lost cause. Everything had become crystal clear. All that talk of the new Europe, of young and decrepit peoples, of Germanic leadership, of revolutionary zeal, it was baloney, a swindle. He would not have said such things out loud. As enemy artillery started firing on Trier in the evening of the 13th of September, and the evacuation of the inhabitants began next day, hundreds of emergency workers, a column of wretched-looking, careworn old men, and also young lads from the Hitler Youth, traipsed into the city through the rain to dig fortification ditches. These might have fended off Huns and Mongols, Duffner mused, but it seemed doubtful that they could hold up modern tanks. Few of the workers had anywhere to sleep, but there was no complaining, just resigned acceptance. It looked as if the last reserves were being summoned up. As Bitburg itself came under fire, officers still managed to celebrate the birthday of one of their comrades with fine czar wine and zecht. It was a case of drink today, there might be no tomorrow. Such partying with the enemy on the doorstep would have confirmed the widespread prejudice among Nazi functionaries, much of the civilian population, and many frontline soldiers, about the spirit of the rear lines, the weak and decadent lifestyle of officers still able to enjoy the good things in life, while others were dying for their country. This was the alleged cause of the collapse in France. Behind the front were the lines of communication, the bases for provisioning, administration, transport, field hospitals, and for the planning staffs of the fighting army. All this constituted the spirit of the rear lines, an essential element in the structure of any military machine. But, as in the First World War, one much derided by the ordinary front soldiers at the dirty end of the fighting, all too ready to spread to their loved ones back home scurrilous rumors of officers enjoying creature comforts and high living, away from the bitter warfare. That our rear-line jackasses flood back in such wild panic, Goebbels commented, can only be put down to their lack of proper discipline, and that they have been more taken up during their long period of occupation in France with champagne and French women than military exercises. He blamed lack of leadership by the generals for the debacle, the Gau office in Baden reported to the party chancellery in early September that the attitude of the retreating units breathed the worst sort of rear lines air, disorderly uniforms, a lot of drunken good-time girls and soldiers hanging together in the worst and most dubious groups, lorries loaded with the most various goods, fittings from apartments, beds, etc. These images reminded war veterans of the conditions of 1918. In the immediate wake of the collapse of the German army in the Allied breakthrough at Falaise, Himmler had issued orders to the higher SS and police leaders, his main agents in security issues, in western areas, through cooperation with military commanders, to abolish once and for all the repulsive German rear lines in France, and send those involved to the front, or put them to work. A few days later, Martin Bormann passed on to Himmler a letter he had received from Karl Holtz, the acting Gauleiter of Franconia, containing reports of ill-discipline, subversion, and lack of responsibility in the rear lines in France. Holtz suggested sending in general inspectors, comprised of energetic and brutal national socialists, to clear up the malaise, though Himmler found it impossible to oblige unless he were given details. A description of the military failings that had led to the Allied breakthrough at Avranche, the most serious event of the summer, found its scapegoat in the alleged cowardly behavior in the rear lines, while praising German efforts that had prevented a worse catastrophe. A report by the secret military police reached a similar conclusion. The failure of officers during the retreat in the West had shaped the mood, reflecting the alleged distrust of officers since the 20th of July.
Instances were adduced from soldiers' accounts of poor behavior of officers. Similar, according to one, to that of the 9th of November, 1918, and indicating signs of disintegration in the army. Among the strongest denunciations was one from the office of General Reinecke, head of the National Socialist Leadership Staff of the Army, based upon a visit to the Western Front in late September and early October to assess the work of the NSFOs. These, it was said, were working well. Conditions earlier in the rear lines in France had been scandalous. For four years, those behind the rear lines had lived in a land of milk and honey. The retreat in 1918, at the time of the Revolution, had been like the proud march of a guard regiment compared with this fleeing troop rabble. For all their obvious bias and the need to find scapegoats for the disastrous collapse in the West, such reports give a plain indication of low morale and signs of disintegration in the retreating German army. Added to the chaos produced by the evacuations in the border region, the panic among the population and the contempt for the party that the flight of its functionaries had sharpened, the potential for a growing full-scale collapse similar to 1918 could not altogether be ruled out. The slowing down of the Allied advance and the accompanying strengthening of German defenses did much to ensure that this did not happen. So did the political measures undertaken to stiffen the resolve to fight on and prevent any undermining of either the fighting or the home front. But these in turn rested on attitudes that were sunk in resignation, not burning with rebellion, and were persuaded at least in part by the cause for which they were told Germany was fighting, and ready therefore to comply, however unenthusiastically, with the ever tighter regulation of their lives and the demands of the war effort. 3. The most crucial step was to shore up the crumbling Western Front. Modell had to do the best he could to regroup a broken army in the immediate aftermath of Falaise. The size of the field army in the West had dropped from 892,000 men at the beginning of July to 543,000 on the 1st of September. The command structures had, however, been left intact. They now served as the basis for the organization of new units. Supply lines were shortened, fortifications strengthened, particularly along the West Wall, and minefields laid. Most importantly, desperately needed reinforcements were rushed to the West. The new divisions created were, to be sure, improvised units, lacking the best equipment and weaponry. They were strengthened, however, in September, when hundreds of tanks and other armored vehicles were sent west from the hard-pressed Eastern Front. New levels of uncompromising enforcement were also introduced on the Western Front, including rigorous measures to round up stragglers and assign them to new units. At the same time, some 200 NSFOs were dispatched into the Western Defense Districts to prop up faltering morale. The NSFOs, military police, and party agencies provided backing for the army in imposing a network of controls along the front to stiffen the shaky discipline. On the 10th of September, Field Marshal Keitel, head of the high command of the Wehrmacht, advocated extreme ruthlessness to stamp out any signs of subversion of morale. Less than a fortnight later, citing Hitler's express instructions, he issued directives to counter the signs of disillusion in the troops through extreme severity, including the use of summary courts with immediate executions in view of the troops to serve as a deterrent. More than a hundred soldiers were shot by SS units while fleeing from the front during the following weeks. On the 14th of September, Field Marshal von Rundstedt, newly reinstated as Commander-in-Chief West, ordered the West Wall to be held down to the last bullet and complete destruction. Two days later, Hitler amplified the command. The war in the West, he declared, had reached German soil. The war effort had to be fanaticized and prosecuted with maximum severity. Every bunker, every block of houses in a German town, every German village must become a fortification in which the enemy bleeds to death or the occupiers are entombed in man-to-man -man fighting, he ordered. The combination of emergency means through organization, supplies, recruitment, and enforcement, succeeded for the time being in bolstering a desperate situation. 
Towards the end of September, the outlook was, if not rosy, at least much better than it had been a month earlier. Just how effective the orders by Hitler and Rundstedt for a do-or-die spirit of last-ditch resistance were, in practice, is not easy to judge. Feelings of helplessness in face of the might of the enemy, resignation, pessimism, defeatism, and blind fear as battle approached, were not easily dispelled. However urgent the appeals to fight to the last, however remorseless the control mechanisms to encourage total commitment, however ferocious the threats for attitudes less than fanatical, however severe the punishment for perceived failure of duty. War weariness was widespread, as it was among the civilian population. Most soldiers on the Western Front were preoccupied with survival rather than fighting to the last bullet. Colonel Gerhard Wilk, the commander at Aachen, forcefully reminded by Rundstedt to hold this ancient German town to the last man, and if necessary be buried in its ruins, repeatedly professed his intention of fighting to the final grenade. His actions did not follow his words. Instead, he made preparations to surrender. Soon after the city's capitulation on the 21st of October, Wilt found himself in British captivity. Speaking to his fellow officers, unaware that his conversation was bugged by his captors, he criticized the last-ditch mentality of the Wehrmacht High Command. Among his troops, the feeling was that the sacrifice of the 3,000 men forced to surrender at Aachen merely to defend a heap of rubble for two or three days longer was a useless waste. Attitudes were, nevertheless, not uniform. The forces on the Western Front in mid-September included armored and infantry divisions of the Waffen-SS, known for their fanatical fighting and imbued with Nazi values. Towards the end of 1944, the Waffen-SS overall comprised 910,000 men and had some of the best-equipped panzer divisions. But fervent Nazis were by no means confined to the Waffen-SS. They were also found in the branches of the much larger conventional armed forces. Some SS men even served there, and not in the Waffen-SS. Alongside critical letters back home from the front, which ran the danger of being picked up by the censors, with drastic consequences, were letters with a strongly pro-Nazi tone. Around a third of the Wehrmacht's soldiers had experienced some socialization in the Nazi party or its affiliates, often greatly enhanced by wartime experience itself. Anyone born after 1913 and serving in the armed forces had been exposed to a degree of Nazified education, if only in the Reich labor service or compulsory military service introduced in 1935. It was not surprising, therefore, to find that Nazi mentalities still found expression. An Allied report from the 4th of September on morale, based on the questioning of captured soldiers, painted a varied picture of attitudes. It found unmistakable signs of low morale among infantrymen. It nevertheless pointed to high morale among paratroopers, junior officers, and SS men. Some representative comments were cited. Victory must be ours. One does one's duty, and it would be cowardice not to fight to the end. We don't give up hope. It is all up to the leaders. Something quite different will happen from what everybody expects. If we don't win, Germany ceases. Therefore, we shall win. Spirit against material. It has never yet happened that mere technology has conquered spirit. I have done my part and have given my Führer, Adolf Hitler, that which can only be given once, ran one soldier's last letter to his wife. The Führer will do it, that I know. I have fallen as a soldier of Adolf Hitler. Faith in German victory, the report concluded, was most strongly correlated with devotion to Hitler personally, identification with national socialist doctrine, and exoneration of Germany from war guilt. Another report, a week later, drew conclusions on the ideological sources of continued Wehrmacht fighting morale from observations during about a thousand interrogations carried out during August. Most prominent were fear of return to a Germany dominated by Russia, conviction in the rightness of the German cause 
and belief that the Allies had attacked Germany, rather than grant her just and necessary concessions. Devotion to Hitler, who had only the welfare of Germany at heart, and feeling that the unconditional surrender policy of the Allies meant that the German people could not expect the Western powers to help in post-war reconstruction. About 15% of captured soldiers, it was said, held such beliefs with fanatical conviction and had an influence on doubters, while up to 50% were still devoted to Hitler. There was a good deal of admiration among combat soldiers for the fighting capacity of the Waffen-SS. As with soldiers at the front, the stance of ordinary citizens towards the war and the regime varied widely. Germany, despite more than a decade of Nazi rule, had remained beneath the veneer of uniformity, in some senses a pluralistic society. Beliefs that were a deeply ingrained product of earlier socialist and communist subcultures could find no expression. But they were suppressed, not eradicated. Fervent Christian beliefs and traditions, institutionally underpinned within the Protestant and especially the Catholic Church, persisted despite relentless Nazi ideological pressure. On the other hand, the years of indoctrination and compulsion to conform had not failed to leave a mark, and the ever more pressing external threat to the country affected, in one way or another, all Germans, and provided its own impulse to conformity. The panic at the approach of the Americans had been confined to the regions in the vicinity of the front. Even there, some had endeavored, Canute-like, to hold back the rising tide of alienation from the regime. Away from the border provinces, there was no indication of collapse. Nothing suggested that the widespread pessimism about the war was likely to result in a popular uprising. Despite the gathering gloom it had described, the weekly propaganda report on the 4th of September concluded that the people were ready for any sacrifice to avoid destruction or enslavement. They would not throw in the towel. The Nazi leadership itself distinguished between mood and attitude, accepting that people were hardly likely to be of sunny disposition if their houses were being blown to bits and their lives upturned by the war, but praising the forbearance and readiness to fight which marked their underlying determination to overcome the hardships and attain victory. This was, of course, a useful internal rationalization of the population's reaction to incessant bad news, and a way of shaping the propaganda of total war. But it was not altogether misleading, for among the pessimists were still many, if a minority impossible to estimate in size, with anything approaching precision and certainly diminishing sharply, who, outwardly at least, upheld the positive lines of propaganda, were loyally supportive of the regime and expressed sentiments redolent of years of exposure to Nazi doctrine. Some, without question, still thought that Hitler would find a way out of the crisis, and wanted him to speak to the people, to provide reassurance. Goebbels was in receipt of a hefty postbag of letters exuding, among genuine National Socialists, deep confidence that the crisis would be mastered. There was still hope, if rapidly dwindling, in parts of the population, that the promised new wonder weapons would reverse war fortunes. Attitudes towards those not seen to be sharing the burdens and wholly committed to the war effort, and especially to anyone perceived in some way to be subversive, were uncompromisingly hostile, and often aggressive in demanding recrimination. The ferocious reprisals against the traitors of the 20th of July were reportedly greeted with satisfaction by many, Despite the widespread worry and anxiety about the war, the slightest hint of opposition still invited terrible retribution, which the police could enforce only through help from ordinary citizens. Listening to foreign broadcasts, increasingly common despite the dangers, frequently led to trouble. Anyone bold enough to make openly defeatist remarks or criticize Hitler's leadership outright was still likely to be denounced to the authorities by zealous loyalists. And the more radical Goebbels' total war measures appeared to be, especially if targeted at the better off and privileged, the more approval they apparently found. More than 50,000 letters had been received by the propaganda ministry by the end of August, 
most of them from workers, the middle classes and soldiers, approving in strong terms the total war measures adopted, but often wanting to go further in their radicalism. Whatever the growing popular fears, anxieties, and depressions about the state of the war, the SD adjudged, with some reason, that the will to resist was still there, though people were doubting whether resistance would be worthwhile. That extensive reserves of loyalist backing continue to exist in the face of increasingly extreme adversity is no surprise. The Nazi party, making strenuous efforts to counter the losses in its ranks of those killed during service in the Wehrmacht, had around eight million members, about a tenth of the population, a significantly higher proportion of adults, in 1944. Not all members, of course, were fervent activists or devoted followers. Increased pressure, for example, on Hitler youth groups to join the party as war fortunes went into steep descent was not guaranteed to produce fanatics for the cause. Even so, members, however they had come to join, had at least superficially shown some commitment to Hitler and the regime, and, once in the party, were more exposed than the rest of the population to demands to conform. The party's organizational tentacles stretched far into community life. The 42 regions, 808 districts, 28,376 local groups, 89,378 cells, and 397,040 blocks into which Germany was divided by the party's administration, ensured that not only members were subjected to invasive controls and routine surveillance, Besides the passive membership, there were the functionaries who, even if they wanted to, could barely escape regular doses of indoctrination during their work for the party. In July 1944, functionaries in full-time employment by the party and its affiliates numbered 37,192 men and as many as 140,000 women. Around 60,000 of those in the Nazi Welfare Organization the NSV, the National Socialist People's Welfare. An estimated three million citizens served the party in some unpaid capacity. This army of apparatchiks constituted a major instrument of social and political control, usually working in close cooperation with the police and other forces of repression, so that for ordinary citizens the space to organize any form of oppositional behavior was simply not available. Beyond that, however, the party functionaries formed a still significant basis of the charismatic community attached to Hitler's leadership. Though Hitler's popular appeal was in steep decline, the functionaries, who had in better times provided the core of the Führer's worshippers, were still less likely than most to break all allegiance. Beyond any lingering, if by now often diluted, devotion, the functionaries had long since pinned their colors to the mast. The party had given them careers, social standing, privileges, financial advantages, and often, in varying degrees, some kind of power, if only at the local level, over their fellow citizens. Not a few felt they had no option but to stand or fall with the party, and with Hitler, on account of their actions in earlier years. Some undoubtedly had bad consciences, or at least qualms, at possible post-war revenge for their involvement in past events. Many had justified fears for a future without Hitler, for what might happen to them when their party positions dissolved, and what fate might hold for them should the enemy succeed in defeating and occupying the country. The higher the position, the greater the zealotry they had shown, the dirtier their hands, the more cause they had to worry. This meant in turn that they had little or nothing to lose as the end approached. For the present, however, other than in the perimeter regions touching on the fighting zone. The party showed no outward signs of crumbling. In fact, its revitalization by Martin Bormann in the second half of 1944 meant that it played a significant role in bolstering the home front. Its activities formed part of an increasingly frenzied effort by the regime to overcome huge and mounting difficulties, and, for the time being, the effort had some success in staving off complete military catastrophe and keeping Germany fighting, at enormous cost, in death and destruction. 4. 
The impetus behind the appointment of Goebbels as plenipotentiary for total war, triggered by the failed bomb plot, had been the destruction of Army Group Center in the Red Army's offensive in late June and July. No sooner had the program been initiated than the additional grave losses through the collapse of the Western Front in August added massively to the demands for huge labor savings, already targeted, to provide men for the front. Goebbels had provided 300,000 men by the 1st of September. But Hitler now wanted another 450,000 men during the following month. The new circumstances brought the breakdown in the earlier coalition of interests between Goebbels and Speer, which had prompted Hitler to agree to the total war effort. From late August onwards, as the implications of the disaster on the Western Front became plain, Goebbels and Speer were increasingly at loggerheads. Goebbels had thrown himself with his customary enormous energy into his new role as plenipotentiary for total war. The planning committee he established, headed by Werner Naumann, his state secretary in the propaganda ministry, had swiftly prepared a raft of measures aimed at manpower savings to provide soldiers for the Wehrmacht. Speed of action and an image of dynamism were objectives in themselves for Goebbels, and the haste and improvisation frequently created rather than solved difficulties. But whatever the doubts about the effectiveness of the measures introduced, they made deep incisions into public life. Postal services were cut back. Theaters closed. The number of orchestras reduced. Film production pared down. University study for all but a few working in disciplines essential to the war or incapable of war service halted. Publishing houses shut down. Newspapers limited to a few pages only, or discontinued. The age for labor conscription for women was extended from 45 to 50. By late August, men were required to work 60 and women 48 hours per week. Goebbels was careful to keep Hitler abreast of the measures he introduced and cleverly played to the dictator's mood. But he did not always have his own way. He eventually succeeded in overcoming Hitler's initial resistance to increasing further the age for women's labor duty to 55, and particularly to the closure of theaters and variety shows, as well as the abolition of some magazines that he liked. Hitler drew the line, however, at Goebbels' plan to stop the production of beer and sweets. Even the Bolsheviks had never halted sweet production, Hitler stated and thought they were necessary not only for citizens at home, but also for soldiers at the front. And, as regards beer, he feared, above all, severe psychological repercussions in Bavaria, and thought the move could provoke popular resentment. Hitler's instinct, much more pronounced than that of Goebbels, for avoiding popular discontent, remained undiminished, and was again demonstrated in mid-August in the directive he gave to finance the provision of 190,000 bottles of egg flip, to be handed by the NSV to those in the West suffering from bomb damage, though why anyone bombed out of house and home would have welcomed the repulsive liquor is another question. Cuts in administration in government offices also proved less easy to implement than Goebbels had imagined. The Reich defense commissars were instructed, for instance, in early September, with recourse to Hitler's instructions, that they should desist from commandeering personnel in ministerial offices or the administrative departments in the Lander for services in the newly established divisions of the Wehrmacht. And while the Prussian finance ministry was finally abolished, a move of little significance, first mooted the previous year, the equally redundant bureau of the Prussian minister-president, one of Goering's panoply of offices, was retained. The combing-out process did produce substantial gains in some areas. More than 250,000 men were let go by the post office, and more than 50,000 from the railways, among other significant reductions. But overall the reductions in staff fell short of expectations, and those released were, predictably, often too old or too unfit for active military service. In fact, able-bodied men were to be found in large numbers only in exempted occupations in the armaments industry, an area in which it made scant sense to lose skilled and experienced workers 
to have them replaced by less well-trained men. The obvious tension between providing men for the Wehrmacht and retaining them for armaments production was bound to lead to conflict between the erstwhile allies, Goebbels and Speer, as the need mounted for men to compensate for the losses on the Western Front, and at the same time the pressures on Speer grew to provide the munitions and weaponry to address the deficiencies created by abandoned materiel, the conflict was not long in coming. Until the collapse in the West, Speer had publicly at least professed optimism. He was, in fact, still telling Goebbels in early September that the armaments industry would be adequately provisioned until the beginning of 1946, even if all the occupied territories were lost, and he had initially been accommodating towards Goebbels' requests for manpower. At the beginning of August, he had offered 50,000 men from armaments production for the total war effort. On the evening of the 9th of August, he had quickly reached agreement with Goebbels and indicated his readiness to make 47,000 hitherto exempted employees in the less critical sectors of the armaments and related industries available, with the assurance that replacements would be found. At this point, he was still optimistic of obtaining the necessary labor for his own domain from the total war effort. But the harmony was soon to end. Control over the entire war economy was at stake. By the beginning of September, Goebbels had come to count himself among Speer's most bitter opponents. Goebbels did not mind whose toes he trod on, to reach by one means or another, the extravagant savings in manpower he had promised Hitler, and the Gauleiter predictably competed with each other to make the highest savings. Speer found himself on the receiving end of high-handed actions which he saw as extremely damaging to armaments production. At the beginning of September, Goebbels was still expecting Speer to find the promised 50,000 men that month. But the tug of war between the two of them had started, and the conflict deepened as the month progressed. Without a base of support within the party, and seen as unreasonably insistent on protecting his own domain from the sacrifices other areas had been forced to make, Speer faced a losing battle. He had to contend with powerful enemies, not just Goebbels and Bormann, but also Himmler and Robert Ly were among his critics. Attacks by the party and interference at the regional level by the Gauleiter grew. He did his own cause little good when he admitted to Goebbels at the beginning of September that production was holding up well despite the loss of men in exempted positions that he had been compelled to provide for the Wehrmacht. Speer felt his only recourse was to appeal directly to Hitler. He did so in a lengthy memorandum on the 20th of September, defending himself against strong allegations from Goebbels and Bormann that his ministry was a collection of reactionary economic leaders and hostile to the party. Claiming that his task was non-political, he objected to the party's intervention in his sphere of responsibility, and wanted the Gauleiter made responsible to him, not Bormann, in armaments matters. But Hitler was never going to transfer any control over the Gauleiter from the party to Speer's hands. Bormann told the armaments minister in no uncertain terms that, as regards the total war effort, he was subordinate to Goebbels. In any case, Speer no longer had the influence with the dictator that he had enjoyed in earlier years. His repeated argument that this war was a technical one and that more and better weaponry would decide it, rather than simply supplying more men to the Wehrmacht, fell on deaf ears, when Hitler and Goebbels both insisted on the obvious counter-argument that increased supplies of both men and weapons were a necessity. Goebbels, constantly supplying Hitler with progress reports on the success of his total war effort, seemed bound to end up the winner in the conflict. Speer again addressed Hitler directly in rejecting Goebbels' demands for 100,000 armaments workers to be recruited for the September quota of total war recruits, beyond the 200,000 he had provided since the 25th of July. These could not be delivered, he claimed, without impairing armaments production. He needed time to prepare for the large inroads into his workforce, and with difficulty could only manage to offer 60,000 from the 25th of October then the remaining 40,000 by the 15th of November.
To his frustration, he then found, on returning from a visit to the Western Front at the end of September, that Hitler had decided that most of the 60,000 were to be sent to the army earlier than he had stipulated, something he described as an extraordinarily serious and drastic measure. He nonetheless infuriated Goebbels by his obstinacy in resisting further demands to surrender exempted workers from the armament sector. And as the autumn drew on, and Hitler recognized the achievements of Speer, an organizer of genius, in surmounting extraordinary difficulties to maintain armaments production, the latter's bargaining hand became stronger. His efforts had reinstated him in Hitler's favor. Try as he might, Goebbels failed to persuade Hitler to come to a decision to compel Speer to release a further 180,000 exempted workers from the armaments industry. Speer's attritional and time-consuming battle with Goebbels over the retention of his workers had led in the end, therefore, to something approaching stalemate. Hitler had, as so often, proved reluctant to reach a decision in a dispute of significance between two of his leading paladins. The infighting between the heavyweight ministers could, however, find no resolution if Hitler was not prepared to offer one. The long-running dispute over scarce manpower was regarded by Speer as a major drain on his energy and resources. Despite this, he made extraordinary efforts in the wake of the setbacks in the West to enable Germany to fight on. The high point of armaments production for the entire war had been reached by July 1944. The level attained, however, flattered to deceive. It has aptly been described as being like the last sprint of the marathon runner before he sags, energy expended. During the autumn, all spheres of production fell sharply. The main reason was the huge increase in Allied bombing. Sixty percent of all bombs dropped over Germany fell after July 1944. Following the Allied breakthrough in France, September brought a crucial acceleration in the devastating air raids. With Allied aircraft now able to use bases closer to the German borders, and the Luftwaffe more and more paralyzed through destruction and through lack of fuel, sustained attacks on industrial installations and transport networks had become far easier. Raw materials production fell by almost two-fifths in the autumn months. Allied attacks on seven mineral oil works on the same day, the 24th of August, 1944, resulted in a drop of two-thirds in production of aircraft fuel in September, contributing greatly to the ineffectiveness of remaining air defenses. Massive damage was caused to the industrial infrastructure as power stations were put out of action. Gas and electricity supplies were badly affected. Gas output in October was a quarter down on what it had been in March. Repeated attacks on the rail network of the Deutsche Reichsbahn, on the lines, locomotives, other rolling stock, bridges and marshalling yards, as well as waterways and Rhine shipping, caused massive disruption to transport arteries, with huge knockoff effects in supply to industry, not least coal provision from the Ruhr. At least as yet, the coal mines themselves in the West remained largely unscathed. The decline in output of vital weaponry was not to be stopped, despite levels of production attained still outstripping those of 1942. What remains little less than astounding, however, is not why armaments production fell drastically, but how, given the extent and well-nigh insuperable nature of the problems, Speer was able to keep it at such a relatively high level. Speer's rapid grasp, not just of problems, but their possible solutions, or at least amelioration, his enormous energy coupled with unquestioning talent for organization, and the authorization he had to push through changes thanks to his manipulation of his frequent armaments briefings with Hitler, all contributed to his ability in autumn 1944 to paper over the widening cracks. He was preoccupied with doing all he could to maximize fuel supplies, badly affected by airstrikes against the hydrogenation plants in central Germany since the spring, to build up air defenses through increased fighter production, to keep transport moving, and to save all that was possible for industry in the evacuation of border areas.
In pressing the demands of the armaments industry, he strived constantly to protect his own domain from the other big beasts in the Nazi jungle, to prevent the party from undermining the self-responsibility of industry, and to avoid deliberate homemade destruction to industrial installations as German troops retreated to add to that of the enemy. Speer paid two visits to the western border regions in September, the first from the 10th to the 14th of September, taking in Karlsruhe, Saarbrücken, and the vicinity of Metz, the west wall to Trier, then Aachen and Venlo. He identified significant weaknesses in munitions and fuel supplies, and serious problems as territories were evacuated. He established, for instance, that the quartermaster generals of the army in the west had too little contact with business agencies and were failing to make use of the experience of the latter in the western regions to help, for example, master transport problems. He pointed as a way forward to how Hermann Röckling, the steel magnet, had liaised daily with military leaders in the Tsar to ascertain their munitions requirements and organize deliveries accordingly. He recommended setting up an office attached to the headquarters of the Commander-in-Chief West, which could directly incorporate business in producing and delivering the equipment needed by the troops. A simple measure to improve supplies was to use the columns of lorries deployed in bringing back important salvaged equipment from the front and returning empty to carry supplies for the front-line troops the other way, and clarifying organizational lines to make maximum use of the industrial area close to the border in supplying the Western Front directly would, he indicated, save wasteful journeys by lengthy transport routes used for carrying armaments from other parts of Germany. His main concern was that production would continue in the endangered areas to the last minute, and he opposed, therefore, what he saw as premature evacuation. Even under artillery fire, munitions production would go on just behind the front to a very late stage. He sent a series of orders to the Western Gauleiter in September, instructing them to see that production was not curtailed prematurely, and that, given the possibility of recovering the territories vacated, mere rhetoric to placate Hitler, to judge from Speer's later account, the evacuation of industry eastwards should follow only the disabling, not destruction, of industrial plant. Speer's report to Hitler also stressed the shortage of weapons, repeating a point in his running dispute with Goebbels that troops without heavy weaponry were pointless, and that in this war, which is a technical war, a levé en masse is not decisive. Speer's second journey to the Western Front, from the 26th of September to the 1st of October, carried out at such a tempo that his travel companions found it difficult to keep up with him, emphasized the urgent need to shore up the border zone west of the Rhine, and his anxiety about the threat to the Rhineland-Westphalian industrial area, which provided half of German armaments. If significant losses of territory occur here through enemy operations, he warned, it would be far more serious than all the losses in the other theaters of war. His report to Hitler was a further advertisement for his own achievements. The troops were enthusiastic, he commented, about the improved model of the Tiger tank that had been produced. The supplies of new weapons had contributed greatly to restoring morale after the retreat from France, and there was now confidence that a new line of resistance could be held, underlining the importance of delivering more weapons and munitions to the front line. This could not be done, he pointed out, if, as had happened previously, valuable skilled workers were taken out of tank production something which tank commanders themselves did not want to happen. His conclusion was effectively, then, a further plea to make no more withdrawals from the armaments industry to provide recruits for the Wehrmacht. In fact, to a limited extent at least, he was prepared to see manpower go the other way. Desperate to mobilize all labor resources to sustain armaments production, he complained to Himmler at the end of October that Full use of concentration camp prisoners was being hindered through shortage of guards, and suggested, probably to little effect, that a contingent of suitable Wehrmacht soldiers could be transferred to the SS to take on guard duty.
Without Speer's extraordinarily strenuous efforts to sustain armaments production and organize the repeated rapid repair of railway lines and bridges destroyed in bombing, the war would have surely been over earlier. He later gave the impression that he viewed the continuation of the war as senseless from the time of the Allied invasion, and that by September it was a hopeless situation. In recognition of this, everything he did, according to his subsequent account, was directed at preventing the destruction of German industry. Doubtless, this was indeed one objective. Speer had at least one eye on a Germany after Hitler, in which probably he hoped to play some significant part. Germany would need her industry, and in his emphasis on immobilization rather than destruction, Speer was naturally working in full agreement with leading industrialists, who, unsurprisingly, combined an all-out effort to manufacture armaments with thoughts, not to be aired in public, of survival after defeat. But contemporary records from his ministry do not suggest that this was the sole or even the dominant aim. Rather, it seems, Speer was genuinely doing everything in his power to enable Germany's war effort to continue. The extremes of energy and endeavor he deployed are not consonant with someone who thought fighting on was senseless and the situation hopeless. He could have done less without endangering himself. It would have brought the end, which he claimed to see as inevitable, closer. Without doubt, he recognized by this time that final victory was out of the question. Did he also believe, at this point, that total defeat was the only alternative? He appears to have been far from ready to admit that the Reich was doomed. For some months yet, he thought it possible that Germany could avoid the worst. Had he done less to prolong the war, the worst might indeed have been avoided for millions. Of course, it was far from Speer alone. He presided over a huge empire run by an immense bureaucratic machine, 70,000 strong, in early 1943. He had highly able heads of his ministerial departments and ruthless lieutenants in Xaver Deutsch and Karl Otto Zahr, increasingly his arch-rival for Hitler's favor. Zauer himself, said after the war to have ruled by fear and to have treated his staff, as well as his workforce, brutally, was not yet at the point where he accepted the war was lost. At the intersection of the military and industry, Speer had the closest connections with Germany's leading industrialists, keen to preserve their factories, but also still to maximize production for the war effort. And he was backed by the enforcement agencies of the party, the police, the prison service and justice administration, tens of thousands of prisoners had by now been put to work in armaments, as well as being supplied by Fritz Zaukel, the crude and brutal Reich plenipotentiary for labor, with the legions of foreign workers who slaved in armaments factories in near indescribable conditions. But Speer's initiative, dynamism, and drive were the indispensable component that made the ramshackle armaments empire function as well as it did. His personal ambition and determination not to lose his own power base meant that he was personally not ready to capitulate. He remained prepared to use his remarkable energies to fend off attempted inroads into his empire by Goebbels, Bormann, and the Gauleiter, playing on the support from Hitler that he never entirely lost. And, of course, he showed no scruples in the utterly inhumane treatment of hundreds of thousands of foreign workers, forced to slave to enable the Reich to continue fighting long after reason dictated that the war should be ended. 5. The German people, even more so the enemies of the people in the regime's grasp, were subjected to far more rigorous controls as the enemies encroached closer towards the borders of the Reich. Coercion now became an omnipresent element of daily life. Alongside the restrictions of Goebbels' total war measures, and inroads into the workplace through recruitment to the front, when increasingly long hours on the shop floor. Any worker suspected of slacking was threatened with being treated in the same way as deserters. Foreign workers, now constituting around a fifth of the labor force in Germany, were particularly vulnerable to police roundups and investigations of the existence of any subversive material that could result in their being sent to 
concentration camps, or worse. For Germans, orders for evacuation in areas close to the front could come at an hour's notice. In bombed towns and cities, people had to comply with commands barked out by local party officials and by the police and military authorities. Surveillance had become intensified. The regime's suspicions of the population it controlled mounted as memories and fears of a repeat of 1918 revived. Communist cells were penetrated and broken up, their members and other suspected opponents of the regime arrested and often subjected to torture. The police were alerted to the threat of internal unrest and instructed to take immediate measures to nip in the bud any signs of disturbance to public order. The higher SS and police leaders were given powers by Himmler to put down with all means at their disposal any unrest in their areas and immediately to deal with those threatening security and order. Party officials were handed extra weapons to deal with internal unrest or other extraordinary circumstances. Germany was increasingly an atomized, dragooned society run on the basis of fear. It was also by this stage an entirely militarized society. In his new capacity as commander-in-chief of the replacement army, Himmler was able to extend his policing powers to the military sphere. Hitler gave him full authority to establish order in the areas behind the fighting zone and sent him, at the beginning of September, to the western border region to put a halt to the retreat of the rear line's troops. Within 24 hours, according to Goebbels, he had stopped the flood of retreating soldiers and the images of panic that accompanied them. The Gauleiter were instructed that all returning members of the Wehrmacht, Waffen-SS, police, OT and Reich Labor Service, as well as stragglers, were to be picked up and turned over to the replacement army by the 9th of September. Local party leaders were to report to their district leaders by 7 p.m. the previous evening the number of stragglers in their area, and they, in turn, would pass the information to the Gauleiter within two hours, who would then immediately inform the commander of the defense district. Himmler was proud of his achievement in arresting the disintegration in the West and recommended brutal action to deal with manifestations of rear lines poor morale. By the middle of September, 160,000 stragglers had been rounded up and sent back to the front. Himmler's decisive action was rewarded by Hitler by a further remit. It arose from a combination of the increased concern for inner security together with the need felt to provide border protection, especially in the east, following the Red Army's inroads in the summer. Since early in the war, the Wehrmacht had been ready to conscript civilians in an emergency to support local defense operations. The police were also involved in earlier planning for militias. Himmler had, in 1942, set up a countryside watch, later followed by an urban watch, made up mainly of members of Nazi affiliates not called up to the Wehrmacht, to help local police in searching for escaped prisoners of war and repressing any potential unrest from foreign workers. By the end of 1943, the urban and countryside watches comprised in all around a million men. Some Gauleiter had then, in 1943 and 1944, taken steps to form their own homeland protection troops reaching beyond party members to include all men aged 18 to 65. These did not, however, at this stage find favor with Hitler, who sensed they would have a negative impact on popular morale. Even so, as war fortunes deteriorated, the Wehrmacht also prepared plans for larger, more formalized militias. With the Red Army approaching the Reich's eastern frontier, General Heinz Guderian, the recently appointed chief of the general staff, proposed what he called a Landsturm, taking its name from the Prussian militias which fought against Napoleon's army in 1813, to be composed of men exempted, for whatever reason, from military service, who would help to strengthen border protection in the east. Guderian recommended the deployment of alarm units, which would carry out guerrilla-like warfare in their own localities. Every officer would act as if the Fuhrer were present. Guderian advocated the use of cunning, deception, and fantasy, claiming that red Indian-style action 
could be successful in fighting for streets, gardens, and houses, and that the Carl May stories about cowboys and Indians in the Wild West, much liked by Hitler, had proved useful as training manuals. Guderian's fanciful schemes never materialized. They were overtaken by plans for the creation of a nationwide organization under party, not Wehrmacht, control. Some Gauleiter, encouraged by Bormann, had already in August created militias in their own regions. The leader of the SA, the Nazi stormtrooper organization, Wilhelm Schepmann, and Robert Ley, head of the enormous labor front, separately contemplated in early September the construction of a Landstrom for national defense, each imagining he would lead it. Hitler's view, as the conflict between Schepmann and Ley surfaced, was that Himmler was the only person capable of building the envisaged Landstrom. Goebbels agreed, as usual, with Hitler. Schepmann would rapidly succumb to the lethargy of the SA, while, if the task were given to lie, only pure idiocy would come of it. Quietly, however, from behind the scenes, another Nazi leader scented a chance to extend his power. With the enemy close to Germany's borders, east and west, and a perceived possibility of internal unrest, the way was open for Martin Bormann, working together with Himmler, to devise proposals for a national militia, and persuade Hitler that its organization and control had to be placed in the hands of the party, rather than be given to the untrustworthy army, thereby ensuring that it would be subjected to the necessary Nazi fanaticism. By the middle of September, Bormann had worked out drafts, approved by Himmler, for a decree by Hitler, on the establishment of a people's defense. Within a few days, the name had been changed to the more stirring People's Storm, or Volkssturm. Himmler told defense district commanders on the 21st of September that if the enemy should break in somewhere, he will encounter such a fanatical people, fighting like mad to the end, that he will certainly not get through. Hitler's decree on the establishment of the Deutsche Volkssturm dated the 25th of September, though actually signed next day and reserved for publication until mid-October, stipulated that the new militia was to be formed of all men between 16 and 60 who were capable of bearing arms. The Gauleiter, under Bormann's direction, were given responsibility for summoning the men, forming them into companies and battalions, and all attendant organizational matters. The political aspects of the new militia were left to Bormann, acting on Hitler's behalf. This gave Bormann enormous scope for defining his remit. Himmler, as commander-in-chief of the replacement army, not as head of the SS and police, was placed in charge of the military organization, the training, weaponry, and armaments of the Volkssturm. Its military deployment, under Hitler's directive, was in his hands, though he delegated its running to the head of the SS Central Office and General of the Waffen-SS, Obergruppenführer Gottlob Berger. The very division of controls outlined in the decree guaranteed a fashion characteristic of the Third Reich that there would be continuing disputes about responsibility and control. But powerful though Himmler and the SS were, the victor in conflicts over control of the Volkssturm turned out to be Martin Bormann. His constant proximity to Hitler enabled him to fend off attempts to reduce his dominance in this new domain by playing on the unique position of the party to imbue the people's community with a fanatical spirit of National Socialism in the defense of the Reich. Militarily, the value of the Volkssturm turned out over subsequent months to be, predictably, low. The loss of the many men, too old, too young, or too unfit for military service, who would die in Volkssturm service would be utterly futile. The creation of the Volkssturm certainly amounted to a desperate move to dredge up the last manpower reserves of the Reich, but it was far from an admission by the regime that the war was lost. In the eyes of the Nazi leadership, the Volkssturm would hold up the enemy, should the war enter Reich territory, and help Germany win time. New weapons, they presumed, were on the way. The enemy coalition was fragile. The more losses could be inflicted on the enemy, particularly on the Western Allies, the more likely it was that this coalition would crumble. A settlement, at least in the West, would then be possible. Seen this way, time gave Germany a chance.
Moreover, the Folkström would achieve this goal through the inculcation of genuine national socialist spirit. It would embody the true Nazi revolution as a classless organization, where social rank and standing had no place, and through fanatical commitment, loyalty, obedience, and sacrifice. It would also, it was imagined, help to raise popular morale. In reality, these Nazi ideals were far from the minds of the vast majority of those who would trudge unwillingly and fearfully into Folkstrom's service, minimally armed but expected to help repel a mighty enemy. A minority, impossible to quantify precisely, but including many Folkstrom leaders, were, even so, convinced Nazis, some of them fanatical. Even in the dying days of the regime, Folkstrom members would be involved in police actions, and atrocities against other German citizens seen to be cowards or defeatists. So, whatever its obvious deficiencies as a fighting force, the Folkstrom, a huge organization envisaged as comprising six million men, served as a further vehicle of Nazi mobilization, organization, and regimentation. As such, it played its own part in preventing any internal collapse and ensuring that a war rationally lost, would not be ended for some months yet. 6. Germans without weapons in their hands were, by late summer 1944, likely to be holding spades instead. As the enemy approached Germany's frontiers, conscription, also for women, to dig fortifications, trenches, bunkers, tank traps, and roadblocks was introduced. Bormann, here too, orchestrated operations from the center. His agents, the Gauleiter in their capacity as RVKs, organized the work at regional level. The party's district, then local, leaders ensured that it was done. Party affiliates, like the Hitler Youth, assisted in the mobilization and deployment. The police were once more on hand to force waverers into line. Again, as the prospect a fighting on Reich soil loomed ever larger, the impositions of the regime on its citizens and the level of controls to which they were subjected on a daily basis intensified sharply. The frantic fortification building through conscription of the local population had started in the east in July, following the Red Army's breakthrough, when Gauleiter Koch persuaded Hitler to commission the construction of an extensive eastern wall as a bulwark against Soviet inroads. The collapse in the West in August then rapidly necessitated the adoption of similar methods to reinforce defenses, particularly along the West Wall, whose pre-war array of 14,000 bunkers over a length of 630 kilometers was in urgent need of strengthening. On the 20th of August, Hitler ordered a people's levy, under the leadership of four Western Gauleiter, for the construction of Western fortifications. At the end of the month, he empowered additional Gauleiter to enlist civilian workers to strengthen northern coastal defenses as a protection against invasion and to levy the population for work on the West Wall. Extra labor, where necessary, had to be provided by neighboring regions. The entire border of the West Wall on the German side was now to be placed in defense readiness. The RVKs were responsible for arranging the accommodation and feeding of hundreds of thousands of workers and taking steps to evacuate the population in a strip of about two kilometers depth behind the West Wall. As with the Volkssturm, Robert Lai had ambitions of taking charge of the nationwide command of fortification work. Lai, who had a doctorate in chemistry, was among the most fanatical Nazis, possessed of an almost mystical belief in Hitler. At the end of 1932, Hitler had made him head of the party's organization, and a few months later, boss of the mammoth German labor front. The ambitious Lai was also looking to extend his own empire, early in the war taking over responsibility for housing in Germany. But his arbitrary and arrogant exploitation of his power and his public reputation for drunkenness made him enemies in high places. And in trying to take control of fortification work, to the pleasure of Goebbels, who held Lai's organizational capabilities in scant regard, he was to be disappointed. Once more, Martin Bormann, close to Hitler and possessing his confidence, was in a position to gain exclusive control of the new range of powers. On the 1st of September, Hitler gave Bormann sole authority to construct the Gauleiter, in his name, 
on all measures relating to fortifications. No other party agencies had any rights to intervene. Bormann would name commissioners, directly responsible to him, who could commandeer party members where necessary to assist in carrying out the work, through supervision and controls, that is, not through actually digging themselves. Robert Lai, as Reich organization leader of the party, was at Bormann's disposal in providing such members, a clear victory for the head of the party chancellery over one of his rivals. The work began without delay and with great urgency. On the 3rd of September, the Essen National Zeitung spoke of the entire frontier population being involved in extending defenses on the western borders, and the men and women of the regions in the west started with spades and shovels to work to ensure the freedom of our homeland. By the 10th of September, 211,000 women, youths, and men too old for military service, along with 137 units of the Reich Labor Front and Hitler Youth Formations, were engaged in heavy labor on the West Wall. The minimum period for conscription was stipulated as six weeks. After that, Germans, though not foreign workers, could be replaced by others. Bormann reminded the Gauleiter at the beginning of October of the urgency of completing entrenchments before the onset of the cold and wet autumn weather, when women, girls, and youths could be deployed only to a limited extent, and when illness among men was sure to increase and be exacerbated through shortage of equipment, clothing, and accommodation. By this time, the Gauleiter had been given widened powers by Hitler in the event of the war encroaching on German territory. Amending his decree of the 13th of July through the further decrees on the 19th and 20th of September, Hitler recorded the Gauleiter, as RVK's, executive power in civilian matters and operational areas with rights to issue legally binding decrees and directives to all agencies of the state administration. With this, Bormann's own centralized authority was bolstered still further, though Hitler, yet again, muddied the waters, providing for conflict and demarcation disputes, since his decree stipulated that coordination of the measures determined by the RVKs rested with Himmler. Bormann was by this time at the height of his powers. Through his presence at Fuhrer headquarters, his ability to control access to Hitler to a large extent and to influence his thinking, his exploitation of his position to outmaneuver other bigwigs in the Third Reich's constant power struggles, his control of the elaborate party machine, and his capacity for sheer hard work, as his frequent letters to his wife Goethe indicate, he was working almost round the clock. Bormann had become perhaps the most pivotal figure after Hitler himself in the top Nazi echelons, and he was still an absolutely committed true believer. Unlike Himmler or Speer, he appears to have had no alternative personal agenda in mind for a world without Hitler. And unlike Himmler, Goebbels, Goering, and Ribbentrop, he seemed never at any moment to have contemplated any form of negotiation with the enemy as a way of ending the war. He was content to be Hitler's mouthpiece, with all the power that gave him, acknowledging to his wife in late August that it was hard to see a silver lining as the fronts closed in on Germany. He nonetheless added, In spite of it all, our faith in the Führer and in victory is completely unshaken, which is truly necessary, for in this situation very many people begin to soften up, understandably. A few weeks later, he even found it possible to look back upon the catastrophic months of 1944 with some satisfaction, because, despite military collapse in East and West, the national community has stood its test, and we are so far able to overcome the thousand difficulties which the enemy's domination of the air creates for us. His optimism probably arose from necessity. Like the other leading Nazis, he knew he had no future after Hitler. During 1944, the party chancellery that Bormann ran, sarcastically dubbed by Goebbels on one occasion the paper chancellery because of the streams of directives flooding out of it, issued 1,372 circulars, announcements or orders, alongside numerous other instructions and fewer orders. State bureaucracy still functioned, though increasingly as an administrative organ for directives and initiatives emanating from the party. 
civil defense in all its ramifications, organization of mass conscription for entrenchment work, mobilizing non-servicemen for the Volkssturm, providing welfare for evacuees, and implementing the myriad orders for total war, were all in the hands of the party that now controlled Germany as never before. For ordinary Germans, there was scarcely any avenue of life free from the intrusions of the party and its affiliates. In the armed forces, too, the scope for escaping Nazification had diminished. The repercussions of the failed bomb plot, the need to demonstrate loyalist credentials, extended deployment of NSFOs, increased surveillance and fear of falling into the clutches of Himmler, who now possessed greater room for intervention in the military sphere, left their mark on both officers and men. Whether at the front or in the civilian population, as the war had come close to home and the popular base of the regime had shrunk, compliance with ever more invasive controls had come increasingly to dominate daily life. The regime had appeared during the summer to teeter close to the edge, it had survived an internal uprising, but its armed forces had been pummeled in east and west. As summer had turned into autumn, it had stabilized the military situation and redoubled its energies at home to galvanize an often reluctant or truculent population into action, to shore up defenses and provide manpower for the front and the armaments industry. In mid-October, Aachen, by now a ruined shell, its remaining inhabitants cowering in cellars, became the first German city to fall into enemy hands. But by this time, attention had switched to the east. There, in East Prussia, the population was already gaining a horrific foretaste of what Soviet conquest would bring. Chapter 3. Foretaste of Horror Hatred fills us since we have seen how the Bolsheviks have wrought havoc in the area that we have retaken, south of Gumbinen. There can be no other aim for us than to hold out and to protect our homeland. Colonel General Georg Hans Reinhardt to his wife, after visiting the scene of Soviet atrocities near Nemersdorf in East Prussia, the 26th of October, 1944. 1. The disastrous collapse of Army Group Center, steamrollered by the Red Army as its gigantic summer offensive, Operation Bagration, drove back the Wehrmacht, then the smashing of the Army Group's North Ukraine and South Ukraine, and the cutting off in the Baltic of Army Group North left the German East precariously exposed. The scale of the calamity from the German perspective could scarcely be exaggerated. In 150 days, the German army in the east lost more than a million men, dead, wounded, or missing, 700,000 of them since August. Put another way, more than 5,000 men a day were dying. Only around a third of the losses could be made good. On the 1st of October 1944, the overall strength of the Wehrmacht was just over 10 million men. Of the 13 million men who had served since the war began, three million were lost. The disaster on the Eastern Front in summer 1944 was in terms of human loss by far the worst military catastrophe in German history, worse than the First World War slaughterhouse at Verdun, way beyond the losses at Stalingrad. Army Group Center, its operative strength of around half a million men grossly inferior to that of the Soviet forces, was like a house of cards waiting to be knocked over. In the first phase of the offensive, 25 divisions with more than 250,000 men of Army Group Center were destroyed. By the end of July, the Red Army had swept through Belarusia, recovering all the territory lost since 1941, and through eastern Poland to the Vistula. On the northern flank of the advance, the Red Army had also overrun much of Lithuania, including the main cities of Vilnius and Kovno. The borders of East Prussia, the farthest eastern frontier of the Reich, now lay perilously close. In a short-lived incursion on the 17th of August, Soviet troops did in fact cross the East Prussian border near Schirvent, entering the Reich for the first time, though on this occasion they were quickly repulsed. To the south of Army Group's center, further disaster rapidly unfolded, 
Army Group North Ukraine, the former Army Group South renamed earlier in the year, suffered huge losses in intense combat as the Red Army drove into Galicia in southern Poland, taking Lemberg and forcing a German retreat of nearly 200 kilometers over a 400-kilometer wide area. Of the 56 divisions of Army Group North Ukraine, including some Hungarian divisions, 40 were partially or totally destroyed. As Soviet troops on the northern flank pressed on northwestwards to the Vistula and the approaches to Warsaw, the southern flank pushed German forces back to the Carpathians. The desperate German attempt to defend Galicia was a recognition of the strategic and economic importance of the region. By mid-August, almost the whole of the Ukraine and most of eastern Poland were in Soviet hands, while the basis had been laid for attacking the crucial Upper Silesian Industrial Belt, 200 kilometers to the west. Meanwhile, on the 1st of August, Warsaw's martyrdom had begun with the rising of the Polish Home Army. As the Red Army stood inactive in the vicinity, unwilling to assist the rebels, the SS moved in to destroy the rising and pulverize the Polish capital. In the unfolding tragedy over the following two months, the city was turned into a ruined shell, with some 90% of its buildings destroyed and 200,000 civilians left dead amid the terrible German reprisals. In the Balkans, too, where Romanian oil, Hungarian bauxite, and Yugoslav copper were crucial to Germany's war economy, the Wehrmacht suffered crippling defeats, leading to the defection of its allies in the region. The position of the German army group South Ukraine, around half of it composed of war-weary Romanian units, was already weakened by mid-August through the withdrawal of 11 out of 47 divisions to help shore up the battered army group's center and north Ukraine. When a major Soviet offensive began on the 20th of August, many Romanian units, with no further stomach for the fight, deserted. Three days later, following an internal coup, Romania sued for peace and changed sides. During the next few days, Army Group South Ukraine was demolished. The German 6th Army, reconstituted after Stalingrad, was again encircled and destroyed. In all, 18 divisions of the Army Group ceased to exist. The rest were forced into headlong retreat to the west and northwest. Within a fortnight, more than 350,000 German and Romanian troops had been killed or wounded, or had entered captivity. Huge quantities of armaments were also lost, as were the Ployesht oil fields, vital for the German war effort, on which Hitler had always placed such a premium. Bulgaria soon followed Romania's example, switching sides and declaring war on Germany on the 8th of September. German occupation of Greece and Yugoslavia was now no longer viable. Control over the Balkans was as good as at an end. And for the Red Army, the approaches to Slovakia and Hungary lay open, and behind them, the Czech lands and Austria. At the opposite end of the Eastern Front, on the Baltic, Army Group North fought throughout the summer in a desperate attempt to avoid being cut off. The Soviet advance had opened up a huge gap between Army Group North and what was left of Army Group Center. In treaties to Hitler, already in early July and later, to allow Army Group North to withdraw to a more defensible line to the west were predictably rejected. The Baltic could not be surrendered, since Swedish steel, Finnish nickel and oil shale, used by the Navy, from Estonia, were vital for the war effort. But Hitler was also influenced by the need to retain the Baltic harbors for trials of the new generation of U-boats, which, Grand Admiral Dönitz had impressed upon him, still offered a chance for Germany to turn the fortunes of war in her favor by throttling supplies to Britain and cutting off Allied shipment of men and materiel to the continent. Bitter fighting continued throughout July and August as Army Group North was forced to retreat some 200 kilometers to the northwest and evacuate parts of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, though it was able for the time being to prevent the Red Army from breaking through to the Baltic. What contribution, if any, to Army Group North's resilience was made by the fanatical and ferocious leadership of its commander-in-chief, 
Colonel General Schorner, one of Hitler's outright favorites, is hard to say. Schorner, the most brutal of Hitler's commanders, was unremitting in his demands for ruthless and fanatical fighting spirit, and in his merciless punishment of any that he deemed to be falling short of his demands. His tactical errors, however, accentuated the plight of the army group. Almost a quarter of a million strong, comprising three armies, its situation remained precarious, facing Soviet forces on three sides, and mainly depended upon supplies by sea across the Baltic. Meanwhile, by the 2nd of September, Germany's important northern ally, Finland, had pulled out of the struggle and was soon to sign an armistice with the Soviet Union. After a brief lull in the fighting, the Red Army opened a big northern offensive on the 14th of September. By the end of the month, the Wehrmacht had pulled out of Estonia and most of Latvia, with great losses of men and equipment. The main forces had managed to withdraw, however, and were concentrated on a shorter front. A Soviet breakthrough in the area of Riga was held off, though not for long. In early October, the Red Army forced its way through to the Baltic coast, just short of Memel. With that, the main forces of Army Group North were cut off from East Prussia. The German retreat from Riga was by then underway, and the city soon fell to the Soviets in the middle of the month. By the end of October, intense German efforts to re-establish links with Army Group North had irredeemably failed. The Army Group's defenses were by now stabilized. But its 33 divisions were completely cut off on the Courland, the peninsula northwest of Riga. Apart from three divisions that were promptly evacuated and a further ten divisions brought out by sea in early 1945, its main forces, comprising around a quarter of a million frontline troops, so badly needed elsewhere, would remain there, isolated and of little further strategic relevance until the capitulation in May 1945. From the Baltic to the Balkans German armies had reeled at the ferocious onslaught of the Red Army in the summer months of 1944. In those months, the magnitude of the losses and the secession of crucial allies meant that Germany's hopes of a victorious outcome to the war in the East had vanished. Goebbels was among those in the Nazi leadership who plainly recognized this. In September, he took up a Japanese suggestion for separate peace soundings with the Soviet Union and put the proposal to Hitler in a lengthy letter. Hitler took no notice of it. Whether there was the remotest chance of Stalin showing an interest in coming to terms with Germany, when his forces were so rapidly in the ascendancy, might well be doubted. But the issue could not be put to the test. Hitler's silent veto was sufficient to rule out any possibility of an approach. The structures of Nazi rule ensured that there was no platform of any kind for Hitler's adamant refusal to contemplate a negotiated end to the war, east or west, could be deliberated, let alone challenged. In the Soviet Union, as with the Americans and British, the scale of Germany's defeats raised expectations that the war might be almost over. It could have been, too, had Stalin and his military advisers, like the Western Allies, not made strategic errors in their operational planning. Mighty though Bagration was, the attack on four fronts was less decisive than the attack that the Germans had feared most, a huge, concentrated surge through southern Poland to Warsaw and from there to the Baltic coast, east of Danzig, cutting off two entire army groups, center and north, and opening the route to Berlin. The colossal battering the Wehrmacht had taken in the summer fell short, crippling, though the losses were, of the decisive death blow that such a maneuver could have inflicted. The armies of the East, as in the West, could be patched up to fight on. Rapidly dwindling reserves of manpower and weaponry were dredged up. It was a mere plaster on a gaping wound, but it allowed the war to continue for several more months of mounting horror and bloodshed. 2. Behind the capacity to keep on fighting lay, as in the West, attitudes in the Wehrmacht which were not uniform in nature, but essentially resilient, and structures of government and administration, crisis-ridden but still intact. For the civilian population there was little choice but to grit their teeth and carry on, 
In conditions of perpetual emergency, the regime put people under extreme pressure to conform and collaborate. Private space to avoid such pressure dwindled almost to zero point. Ad hoc, piecemeal measures to attempt to hold off the inroads of the Red Army could, therefore, be implemented by a workforce now embracing almost the entire adult and youthful population. Seldom, other than within parts of the Hitler Youth, enthusiastic, sometimes willing, often grudgingly, but scarcely ever rebellious. At the root of the readiness to comply, however reluctantly, a sentiment prevailed that was far more searing and penetrating than in the West. Fear. In East Prussia, the most exposed of Germany's eastern provinces, the fear was palpable. Older citizens still had memories of the incursion of the Russians in the opening phase of the First World War before the Germans finally beat them back, in February 1915. Some 350,000 people had fled in hasty evacuations as the Russians approached in August and September 1914. By the time the Russian troops had been forced out of East Prussia, according to German reports, though there is no reason to doubt their essential veracity, towns and villages had been ransacked, more than 400,000 buildings destroyed, several thousand inhabitants deported to Russia, and around 1,500 civilians killed. Thirty years later, the fear rested not just on old memories. The anti-Bolshevik propaganda, relentlessly pumped into the population by the Nazis, had seemed less abstract in this region than in western outposts of Germany, and for three years soldiers had been passing through East Prussia backwards and forwards to the Eastern Front. Those with ears to hear had heard stories, not just vague rumors, but often concrete detail, of disturbing happenings in the East, not only tales of the intense bitterness of the fighting, but news of atrocities perpetrated against the civilian Russian population, and massacres of Jews had filtered back. The war against the partisans, it was well known, had been brutal. It had been no holds barred. As long as the war had been going well, what German soldiers had been doing to Russians and Jews had been of little concern. Many, influenced by propaganda, had no doubt approved. But now the tables had been turned. The Soviets were in the ascendancy, crushing German forces, pressing on the borders and threatening to break into East Prussia. Elsewhere in the eastern provinces, the danger of Soviet occupation was not so imminent, but the fears were little different from those of the people of East Prussia. The Nazi party had gained some of its greatest electoral successes before 1933 in the eastern regions of Germany largely, apart from the Silesian industrial belt, Protestant and rural. Border issues, resentment at the territorial losses in the Versailles Treaty, and revanchist feelings had contributed to making these regions disproportionately stalwart in their backing for Hitler's regime before 1933. The early war years, sheltered by German occupation of Poland, and the Nazi-Soviet Pact of 1939, had been relatively calm for Eastern Germany. But the start of the war against the Soviet Union in June 1941 brought the regions far closer to the fighting front. Some compensation derived from the new military importance of the eastern provinces, the location of government and army bases close to Hitler's headquarters in East Prussia, for instance, produced some economic benefits for the region. Following the rapid conquests by the Wehrmacht, the reality of war, even in the East, seemed at first far away. The area was also free from heavy bombing. East Prussia suffered from some light Soviet bombing sorties in June 1941, but little more. That increasingly beset the western parts of Germany, from 1942 onwards. In fact, one of its main roles was as a reception area, forced to take in large numbers of evacuees sent from the bomb-threatened towns and cities of western Germany. By early 1944, about 825,000 evacuees were housed in eastern regions. They were often seen as a burden, providing a real test for the solidarity of the much-vaunted people's community. The presence of the refugees in such numbers was a clear sign that the war was close to home. The east had so far been spared the worst, that was now to alter rapidly.
Unsurprisingly, panic had spread like a bushfire through the east in the wake of the Wehrmacht's collapse. As the Red Army's advance then slowed and the German front gained some semblance of stability, the initial panic had subsided. But the population remained subdued, depressed, and acutely worried. A general nervousness prevailed. Any negative news had a pronounced impact on people. The unfavorable and dangerous military situation in the East has such a depressing effect on the mood of the great proportion of the population, the SD reported in early August, that the same anxious fears about the further development of the war can be heard in all strata. Influenced by letters home from the front, and from the stories of evacuees from formerly occupied parts of Poland, people were skeptical about the capacity of the German forces to halt the Soviet advance completely, and were not convinced that the danger for East Prussia had subsided. The fears were that the Soviets would eventually succeed, and everyone, it was said, was aware of the threat of Bolshevism. What that meant in concrete terms was left unstated. But the implications of dire consequences, should the Soviets break through, were plain enough. By early October, following the defection of Germany's eastern allies, the destruction of the Sixth Army in Romania, and the penning in of Army Group North in the Kurland, the mood in the German East sank to zero point. Fear was also a prime motivating factor for many frontline soldiers. Aware, at least in general terms, if not always specifically, of at least some of what German troops had done in the occupied Soviet Union, fear of falling into the hands of the Red Army was intense and highly undesirable. Whatever the feelings towards the British and American enemies in the West, nothing there equated to this. Alongside it went the fear of being one of the growing countless victims of the Eastern War. While fear of dying and hopes of survival were common to all soldiers, of whatever army, on whatever front, the reported casualties and intensity of the battles in the East sent a special shiver of anxiety down the backs of those learning that they had been called up to serve on the Eastern Front. Not surprisingly, though official reports were loath to admit it, there was growing anxiety about the call-up, and anyone summoned to serve fervently hoped it would be in the West, not in the East. As in the West, the attitudes of soldiers actually fighting at the front varied. Army reports in August and September indicated the predictable negative impact of the retreats and recognition of the great superiority of the enemy in men and heavy weapons. Young replacements and older men produced through the coming out of the total war recruitment actions were said to be particularly affected by the nerve-wracking intense fighting with such heavy losses. They feared another major Soviet offensive, and their powers to resist were said to be shaken. Anxiety and war weariness were seen as the cause. Serious, but nevertheless confident, was, however, the somewhat unlikely gloss put on the mood in general. Unconditional trust in the Fuhrer was, of course, ritualistically asserted. But from Army Group North, cut off in the Baltic, it was reported that the known Bolshevist conditions and the fear of never seeing the homeland again if the war were lost served to strengthen fighting morale. And those soldiers whose fighting spirit fell below expectations were subjected to increasingly ferocious discipline. Worries about the threat to East Prussia and their families were recorded from soldiers with homes in the eastern regions. A more positive mood among the troops of the Fourth Army in East Prussia at the beginning of October was said to have arisen from the stabilization of the front and better conditions for soldiers in the area. A summary of the attitude of soldiers on the Italian front the previous month almost certainly applied, too, to the troops in the East. Frontline soldiers, the report indicated, had little time for reflection. Individual events came and went in a blur. Only the general impression remained. The physical and psychological pressures of battle demanded of the soldier that he do his duty to the limits of the possible. Whatever the input of the NSFOs, their impact was short-lived. Very soon, daily worries and cares took over again. Ideals and grand causes were not at stake, the report implied. 
The soldier fights because he is ordered to do so, and for his naked life. As this lapidary comment implies, for soldiers, but also for the civilian population, compulsion and duty were main reasons why people kept going. And what alternative was there? In addition came fear and the strong feeling that the homeland, meaning in concrete terms families and property, had to be defended. Such sentiments could easily be exploited by the regime, but behind the propaganda, the rhetoric, the exhortations, and the hectoring, Belief in National Socialism, in the party and even in the Fuhrer, was dwindling fast. Impossible, though it is to be precise about the levels of remaining support. Whatever people thought, however, the omnipresence of the party and its affiliates was sufficient to keep them in line, all the more so given the urgency of the defense measures that were implemented with all speed and pressure in the eastern regions in the wake of the Red Army's rapid advance. The first priority was to build a network of defense fortifications and entrenchments along the eastern borders of the Reich and strengthen those already in existence. The principle of deeming specific towns or cities fortresses to be held to the last, a tactic unsuccessful in Russia as the Red Army swept around them, was now introduced in eastern Germany as the Wehrmacht retreated. More than twenty such fortresses, including the most important and strategically valuable towns, were established in Germany and the occupied parts of Poland, with eventual disastrous consequences for the inhabitants of most of them. In addition, the organization of a huge program of fortification work throughout eastern Germany at breakneck speed now fell to the party under the direction of the Gauleiter as Reich defense commissars. Over the course of the summer, before the work started to recede in the autumn, ceasing at the end of November, around half a million Germans, many of them youths, older men and women, and foreign workers, were conscripted to do long, back-breaking daily work in East Prussia, Pomerania, Silesia, and Brandenburg in building what became generally known as Eastern Wall, to complement that in the West. An estimated 200,000 were deployed in East Prussia alone. In German-occupied parts of Poland, Danzig, West Prussia, the Wartegau, and what was left of the general government, the central region of Nazi-occupied Poland, the work was undertaken by Polish forced laborers. Frontier defenses in the east had been erected before the First World War. New fortifications were then constructed during the Weimar Republic when Poland was seen as a major military threat. The pre-war years of the Third Reich had seen these extended and new defenses built. Despite rapid acceleration of construction work, and one stretch of almost 80 kilometers along the oder varta rivers that was more heavily fortified than the West Wall, the defensive line was far from complete by the time war broke out. For five years thereafter, with German occupation pushed so far to the east, a heavily fortified line within the Reich frontiers seemed unnecessary. At any rate, it remained largely neglected until the collapse of Army Group Center in summer 1944, at which point no worthwhile defenses stood between the Red Army and East Prussia. The attempt was now made to remedy this deficiency within a matter of weeks through conscripted labor and rapidly improvised organization. On the 28th of July, 1944, transmitting Hitler's decree of the previous day for the construction of fortifications in the east, Guderian, the newly appointed chief of the army general staff, declared that the whole of eastern Germany must immediately become a single, deep echeloned fortress. The state secretary of the Reich Ministry of the Interior, Wilhelm Stuckert, amplified the order, laying out details for implementation of the construction work to the eastern Gauleiter and Hans Frank, boss of the general government. The fortification workers would need spades, pickaxes, blankets, eating utensils, and marching rations. Their overseers were to have pistols and other weapons, a hint of the possible need for harsh action to stamp their authority on a recalcitrant workforce. The Reich Transport Ministry and Railway Authorities would organize transport. Building materials and equipment would come from OT offices, 
Horses and carts were to be used as far as possible for carrying the building materials. Rations would be allocated through provincial food offices, or in the case of the general government, through deep inroads into the provisions of the region. At the beginning of September, Hitler made it clear that command over the fortification work was exclusively in the hands of the party, to be deployed by the RKVs under Bormann's direction. In reality, the Gauleiter, as RKVs, had a good deal of independence in the way they ran affairs in their provinces. Erich Koch, the brutal Gauleiter of East Prussia, one of Hitler's favorite provincial chieftains, led the way in dragooning the population of his province into compulsory labor service. Already on the 13th of July, he had decreed that the entire male population of specified districts, between the ages of 15 and 65, were to be conscripted with immediate effect for fortification work. Anyone defying the order would be subject to punishment by military court. Shops and businesses, not absolutely necessary for the war effort, were closed, and their owners and workers sent to dig. Trains leaving the East Prussian border were controlled, and men taken off them and brought back for construction work. Koch's example was followed by the other Eastern Gauleiter, a report from Konigsberg in East Prussia, noted by British intelligence authorities, indicates the effect of the conscription on daily life in the province. Great simplifications have been introduced in the everyday life of the population. In restaurants, guests must go to the kitchen with their plate, so that all waiters and male kitchen staff can dig. The newspapers no longer publish regional editions, but only one standard edition. Thus, editors, compositors, and printers are released for digging. Every business which is not of importance to the war has been closed. Every East Prussian fit for military service has been called up. The large gates of Konigsberg University have been closed. The students and all men employed at the university are digging. Even harvest workers were taken away from the most crucial point of the agricultural year to dig, though in separate waves so that the garnering of the harvest was not impaired. Anxiety probably underpinned an early readiness to help in the digging operations, notably in East Prussia, close to the front line. Certainly there was a positive initial response to appeals to take part as the local population, most readily members of the Hitler Youth, rallied round in an emergency, though propaganda about the enthusiasm of the diggers should be taken with a sizable pinch of salt. The party itself, though claiming there was a good deal of understanding for the necessity of the digging action, was aware of the extensive criticism of its poor organization of the entrenchment work and lack of conviction that the fortifications had any military value. Practical difficulties, poor accommodation in food, transport difficulties, even a shortage of spades, and the very nature of such cripplingly hard toil, digging the baked ground hour on hour in the heat of summer, soon withered whatever good spirits had prevailed at the outset. Women in Pomerania, wrote to Goebbels, complaining that they had received no medical inspection before deployment, that they had to sleep on straw mats in primitive communal quarters, and that food and sanitary arrangements were lamentable. For foreign workers and prisoners of war, needless to say, the conditions were far worse. The behavior of party officials and overseers often did not help. There were reports of party officials drinking, skiving, siphoning off food and drink meant for diggers, of their high-handed behavior and dereliction of duty setting the worst example to the conscript workers. Driving up to the columns of diggers in a car, inspecting the ranks without picking up a shovel, and bawling at elderly men and women actually doing the work, was not guaranteed to encourage enthusiastic commitment to the task or endear the party to the conscripts. Unsurprisingly, there were attempts to evade the work. Even veterans of the First World War, it was reported in East Prussia, had absconded. Less than enamored by the work they were being compelled to carry out, and worried that the front was so close. They had to be hauled back by the police. The weeks of grinding toil by hundreds of thousands of men and women were militarily as good as worthless. Even Goebbels saw that the East Prussian fortifications erected by Koch were pointless 
unless troops and weaponry were poured in to hold them. On paper, the achievements looked considerable. 400 kilometers of defenses erected in Pomerania, for instance, and a 120-kilometer ring to hold five armed divisions around the newly designated fortress of Breslau. Much was made by propaganda once the Russians had been forced back about the value of the entrenchments, eulogizing about the usefulness of all the hard work that had gone into them. But in reality, the kilometers of earthworks, entrenchments, and hastily constructed, inadequately manned fortifications were never going to stop or even hold up the Red Army for long. Their worth had been severely limited. And of the designated fortresses, Königsberg, it is true, only fell in April 1945, and Breslau held out until the 6th of May. All this meant was that the futile loss of life of civilians, let alone of front soldiers, was magnified. If the digging marathon in the East served any purpose, it was in large part as a propaganda exercise, demonstrating the continued will to hold out. How effective the propaganda function was is difficult to assess. It has been claimed that the endeavor shown in the fortification work bolstered the patriotism of the East German population and their resolve to defend the homeland. That the communal work served as an inspiration elsewhere in Germany, underpinned faith in the party and boosted military morale through showing the troops that, in contrast to 1918, they had the undiluted backing of the home front. Such claims are impossible to test accurately, but almost certainly greatly exaggerated. It would be a mistake to presume that the brash propaganda trumpeting of the fortification effort had no effect at all. Conceivably, it did help to solidify patriotic feeling in eastern Germany, and it conveyed a sense that the actions of ordinary Germans mattered in the fight to hold off the Red Army. But at most, it boosted a readiness from fear, if nothing else, to defend the homeland that was already present. Outside the eastern regions, and perhaps within them too, people were as likely to see the frenetic entrenchments less as an heroic achievement than as a panic move, a sign that the situation was indeed extremely grave. As for faith in the party, this was so sharply on the wane in the summer and autumn of 1944, whatever the lingering reserves of hope in Hitler himself, that it was as good as impossible for the fortifications program to alter the trend, apart perhaps from impressing a few gullible waverers in the eastern regions by the energetic actions of Koch and other Gauleiter. Finally, while soldiers were doubtless gratified to hear of solidarity at home, it is questionable whether their fighting morale drew much inspiration from news of a huge digging program carried out by the young, the old, and female labor on fortifications about whose defensive qualities against the might of the Red Army, a level of skepticism was only too understandable. Whatever the dubious propaganda value of the fortification drive, it was overshadowed by its objective function in providing a further vehicle for control of the population. This is not to say that many of the workers were not idealistic patriots, and not a few of them enthusiastic backers of the party's efforts to mobilize all that remained of the population for the task. But after the first short-lived surge of enthusiasm, not many, it could with some justification be surmised, were true volunteers who would have come forward without being conscripted. The digging program quite literally wore the population out, ground them down into compliance, showed them again that there was no alternative that the party controlled all facets of civilian life. It was a further means of trying to inculcate into the population the spirit of the last stand, with the classic Hitlerian choice of hold out or go under. Reluctant compliance, rather than a readiness to swallow such imperatives, was the stance of most ordinary citizens. Few were prepared to go under, but as the threat to the eastern frontiers of the Reich mounted, they had little choice but to fall in line with the diktats of those in power who were determining their fate. This was the case, too, with service in the Volkssturm, launched in a fanfare of publicity on the 18th of October by a speech given by Himmler at Bartenstein in East Prussia and broadcast to the nation. Keitel, Guderian, and Koch 
were present as Himmler addressed thirteen assembled companies of Folkstrom men. The date had been carefully chosen as the anniversary of the highly symbolic Battle of the Nations in Leipzig in 1813, the clash which had brought Napoleon's defeat on Prussian soil. The day was a crucial one in propaganda depictions, resonating in German history and evoking the legendary defense of the homeland by the Landstrom, as, faced with slavery at the hands of the French, an entire people rose up to repel the invaders. Reading out Hitler's proclamation of the Volkssturm and reminding his audience of the significance of the anniversary, Himmler announced that the Führer had called on the people to defend the soil of their homeland. We have heard from their own mouths, he declared, that we have to expect from our enemies the destruction of our country, the cutting down of our woods, the breakup of our economy, the destruction of our towns, the burning down of our villages, and the extirpation of our people. Of course, the Jews were as ever portrayed as the root of the intended horror. Men of the Volkssturm, stated Himmler, pointing out that East Prussians had formed its first battalions, must therefore never capitulate. There was, for the most part, a skeptical response to judge from the reports on the reception of propaganda. There was a growing feeling that we are being pressed into a hopeless defense, and the announcement of the Volkssturm was often interpreted as confirmation of the exhaustion of Germany's forces. Any early enthusiasm swiftly evaporated as doubts were raised about the military value of the Volkssturm, and anxieties voiced that those serving would not be covered under the international conventions on the treatment of prisoners of war, but would be viewed as partisans. There were fears that they would be summarily executed on capture, and the enemy would take reprisals against the civilian population, views betraying knowledge of how the Germans had themselves behaved in the occupied territories. The regime sought to allay the anxieties and define the duties of the Volkssturm within the Hague Convention of 1907. The fears were not baseless, however, as the treatment of captured Volkssturm men by the Red Army would highlight. In any case, the frequent reluctance to serve in the Volkssturm was in vain. Over the next weeks, the party's organizational tentacles would reach far into German civilian life to drag into service hundreds of thousands of mainly middle-aged men, badly armed and poorly equipped. Few were fired by the fanaticism demanded by the regime's leaders. However, they could rarely avoid service. Exemptions were hard to attain, and the Volkssturm's commanders, many of whom had some background in the military and in the party, or its affiliates, were generally far more committed than the men they led to the ideals of the organization, however limited they were in ability and competence. So detachment from Nazi ideals and fanaticism was not easy in this mammoth organization in the hands of the party with a strength of six million men by the end of November, and potentially embracing twice as many. If only a fraction of this number was actually involved in combat, the further militarization and regimentation of civilian society was massive. The military futility and pointless heavy loss of life among Volkssturm men in action would be fully laid bare in the first months of 1945. But in East Prussia, where Koch had proposed local militias as early as July, the Volkssturm would have an earlier baptism of fire. More than a week before Himmler's announcement of its existence, the Volkssturm had its first taste of action in the outer suburbs of the fortified Baltic port of Memel, north of East Prussia, annexed by Germany in 1939. Two lightly armed companies of Volkssturm men in civilian clothes, with only green armbands to distinguish them, took heavy casualties as they helped to stave off weak Soviet attempts to break the defensive perimeter until regular troops could arrive to stabilize the position. Little over a week later, the Volkssturm was in action again. This time it was within the borders of East Prussia. For on the 16th of October, the Red Army crossed the German frontier into its easternmost region. It was the start of eleven days that would leave a searing mark on the mentalities of Germans in the eastern regions of the Reich, and not just there. 3. 
On the 5th of October, Soviet troops launched their attack in Mamel, and five days later were on the Baltic, surrounding the town. The 3rd Panzer Army, weakened though it had been, managed to hold out in the siege until reinforcements arrived, with the help, as we noted, of much battered Folkstrom units. Two days before the Red Army's attack, local civilians were still frantically digging trenches and anti-tank ditches. The Wehrmacht wanted the area evacuated. But only on the 7th of October were evacuation orders belatedly issued by the party authorities. Anyone not obeying was to be treated as a traitor. Panic and chaos resulted, all the more so when the local district leader of the party countermanded the order and decreed that people should, for the time being, stay where they were. The confusion was all the greater since there had already been an earlier partial evacuation of Mamel and surrounding districts in early August, but the population had returned when the danger had receded. There was initially some sense, therefore, that this, too, would prove to be a false alarm. But when the order to leave was finally given on the 9th of October, it was, for many, already too late. Thousands were left behind, cut off by the rapidly advancing force. Many were reluctant to leave their farms unprotected against what they saw as a roaming mob of prisoners of war and Polish workers. They missed the chance to escape. Most who could, predominantly women, children, the elderly and infirm, since men were generally held back for service in the Folkstrom and other duties, took to the road in horse carts or on foot, carrying with them a few possessions hastily thrown together. Rumors that the Red Army was in the immediate vicinity caused renewed panic. A sense of terror was widespread. Explosions and fear of air raids sometimes caused the refugees to take cover where they could, in the fields away from the road. Women fell on their knees to pray. It was a race against time as main highways became cut off by Soviet troops. Abandoned wagons and household goods littered the roadside. The lucky ones, after an anxiety-ridden wait on the shores, finally crammed into a fleet of little boats that ferried them, though without their livestock and most of their possessions, to temporary safety over the abutting saltwater inlet, the Kurishishof, to improvised billets in parts of East Prussia. Some sought to swim across and were drowned. The last most of those fleeing saw of Mamel was a red glow in the night sky. An estimated third of the population fell into Soviet hands. There were stories of plunder, rape, and murder by Red Army soldiers. The fate of Mamel marked the start of more than two weeks of dread and horror for the population close to the East Prussian border. Worse was yet to come. As General Guderian later commented, what happened in East Prussia was an indication to the inhabitants of the rest of Germany of their fate in the event of a Russian victory. On the 16th of October, the Red Army began its assault on East Prussia itself amid a barrage of artillery fire over a 40-kilometer stretch of the front and intensive air raids on border towns. There was as good as no defense offered by the Luftwaffe, and the German Fourth Army, severely weakened in the collapse of Army Group Center in the summer, was forced to pull back westwards. On the 18th of October, Soviet troops advanced across the German frontier. Within three days, they had penetrated German lines and forced their way some 60 kilometers into the Reich across a front of around 150 kilometers. The border towns of Eitkau, Ebenroda, and Goldap fell into Soviet hands, while Gumbenen and Angorop narrowly escaped that fate, though the former was heavily damaged through air attacks and Soviet troops reached the outskirts. The Soviets reached as far as the village of Nemersdorf in the early morning of the 21st of October, where, despite their finding a key bridge over the river Angorop intact, the offensive halted. The leadership of Army Group Center had expected that the Soviet attack, when it came, would be the prelude to a huge offensive that might break through into Germany's heartlands. As it was, the Soviets' pause in Nemersdorf gave the Fourth Army the opportunity to regroup, muster its strength, and, with panzer reinforcements, attempt a daring and successful encirclement maneuver against superior forces that took the attackers completely by surprise and inflicted heavy losses. Soviet commanders, 
and pressed by the Wehrmacht's counteroffensive, immediately went on the defensive and pulled back their troops. By the 27th of October, their offensive was abandoned. On the 3rd of November, German troops freed Goldup, reduced to ruins and plundered by Red Army soldiers, and two days later the first Battle of East Prussia was over, at a cost of extremely high losses on both sides. A highly damaging Soviet breakthrough to the East Prussian capital of Konigsberg had been prevented. German soldiers, especially those who came from the eastern regions, despite often limited training and inadequate weaponry, had fought furiously to fend off the invaders. Even so, a border strip of East Prussia, 100 kilometers broad and up to 27 deep, stayed in Soviet occupation. The front in this area stayed stable until January, but East Prussians were, from now on, a highly endangered species. The reason why the Soviet attack had halted after occupying a good position on reaching Nemersdorf became plain when German troops were able to retake the village on the 23rd of October, barely 48 hours after it had fallen to the Red Army. What the German soldiers found awaiting them was a scene of horror. The name of Nemersdorf soon became familiar to most Germans. It told them what they might expect if the Red Army were to conquer the Reich. The fate that would overtake Nemersdorf and the inhabitants of neighboring districts was compounded by the lamentable failure of the Nazi authorities, repeated with even graver consequences a few months later, to evacuate the population in good time. Evacuation in the whole imperiled area was chaotic. Koch was the paradigm example of power draining from the center to the provincial party chieftains, a development that would intensify generally in early 1945. Abetted by his deputy, Paul Dargal, he had complete control over evacuation measures. Supported by Hitler, Koch refused to countenance early evacuation because of the fears that it would begin a stampede out of the province and would send defeatist signals to the rest of the Reich. The population were to remain as long as possible as a sign of unwavering morale and determination. The Wehrmacht's own wishes to have the area cleared were ignored. The commander-in-chief of Army Group Center, Colonel General Reinhardt, was himself reduced to paroxysms of feudal rage at Koch's high-handed behavior in the region. When evacuation orders were finally given, they were predictably chaotic in their execution. Dargal and other party functionaries could not be located for hours. A district leader briefly emerged, only to disappear into a local pub and drink himself into a stupor. A lorry commandeered to help with the evacuation did not turn up. It had allegedly been sequestered by a party office to carry off stores of food and drink. At the most critical time, party functionaries, the only people who could give orders, had failed miserably in their duties. Nemersdorf, the most westerly point of the Soviet incursion, was heavily involved in the belated chaotic evacuation. As Soviet troops approached, Inhabitants of nearby towns and villages fled in panic, and at the last minute, horse-drawn covered wagons from all around queued to cross Nemersdorf's crucial bridge. People took what few possessions they could and fled for their lives. Helped by the cover of thick autumnal mists, most in fact managed to get across the bridge to safety further westwards even in the final hours before the Red Army arrived. But for some, inhabitants both of Nemersdorf and of other nearby townships, it was too late. They woke in the early hours of the 21st of October to find Soviet soldiers already in their villages. The battle-hardened soldiers of the Red Army had fought their way westwards out of their own country, through Poland, and now, for the first time, into the country of the hated enemy. As they advanced through wastelands of death and destruction, they had witnessed the legacy of the savage brutality of German conquest and subjugation and the scorched earth devastation of a once imperious army in headlong retreat. They saw the unmistakable signs of the terrible suffering of their own people. Soviet propaganda directly encouraged drastic retribution. Take merciless revenge on the fascist, child murderers and executioners, Pay them back for the blood and tears of Soviet mothers and children, ran one typical proclamation in October 1944. 
Kill. There is nothing which the Germans aren't guilty of, was the exhortation of another. Reaching German soil and encountering for the first time a civilian enemy population, pent-up hatreds exploded in violent revenge. As German troops moved into villages and townships retaken by the Wehrmacht after days of Soviet occupation, they came across the corpses of murdered civilians, grim indicators of the atrocities that had taken place. The worst had taken place in Nemersdorf itself, which came to symbolize these early atrocities of the Red Army. Details of what actually happened in Nemersdorf, however, remain murky. From the outset, fact became difficult to separate from propaganda. Some testimony, given a few years afterwards, which left a lasting mark on the gruesome imagery of events, is of doubtful veracity. According to the most vivid account, provided some nine years later, a Folkstrom man whose company had been ordered to assist in the clearing up of Nemersdorf after the attack spoke of finding several naked women nailed up through their hands to barn doors and crucifix positions, of an old woman whose head had been split in two by an axe or spade, and of seventy-two women and children bestially murdered by the Red Army. All the women had allegedly been raped. The bodies had been exhumed and the findings established, he claimed, by an international commission of doctors. A report compiled by the secret military police dispatched on the 25th of October, two days after the Soviet troops had left the village, to interrogate any witnesses and discover what had happened, paints, however, a somewhat different picture, though one which was grim enough. There had been plundering, the report registered, and two women had been raped. The corpses of twenty-six persons, mainly elderly men and women, though also a few children, were found. Some lay in an open grave, others in a ditch, by the roadside or in houses. Most had been killed by single shots to the head, though the skull of one had been smashed in. But there were no lurid descriptions of crucifixions. A German doctor from a regiment in the district had inspected the corpses. Himmler's own personal doctor, Professor Gebhardt, had, remarkably, also found his way to Nemersdorf within a day of the Soviet troops leaving, though, presumably, Someone of his rank was not needed simply to establish the cause of death. Already, it seems, leading Nazi authorities had earmarked Nemersdorf for special notoriety. Propagandists were swiftly on the scene following the recapture of the area, keen to exploit Soviet ill deeds to bolster the German determination to fight, and not slow to exaggerate where it served their purposes. Naturally, German propaganda made the most of the expose of Soviet atrocities. The most grisly scenes may have been a fabrication. On the other hand, the atrocities were not simply a propaganda invention or later concoction. General Werner Kreipa, Luftwaffe chief of staff, visiting the Panzerkorps Hermann Göring near Gumbinen and in the Nemersdorf area within hours of the Red Army pulling out, claimed in his diary entry that bodies of women and children were nailed to barn doors and ordered the outrages to be photographed as proof. If the photographs were taken, they have long since disappeared. A machine gunner among the German troops who entered Nemersdorf on the 22nd of October recorded in the diary jottings he kept secreted in his uniform the discovery of terrible incidents involving mangled bodies, some mutilated, one old man pierced with a pitchfork and left hanging on a barn door. Sights so terrible that some of our recruits run out in panic and vomit. The numbers killed in Nemersdorf may have been smaller than alleged, though some of the more inflated figures probably included those also killed by Red Army soldiers in other nearby localities. Conceivably, too, there were fewer rapes than claimed, though some certainly took place and the later behavior of the Red Army on its passage through eastern Germany offers no grounds to presume the best of its soldiers. Colonel General Reinhardt visited the district on the 25th of October. He wrote to his wife the following day that the Bolsheviks have ravaged like wild beasts, including murder of children, not to mention acts of violence against women and girls, whom they had also murdered. He was deeply shaken by what he had seen. Whatever doubts are raised about the actual scale of the murders and rapes, 
and necessary though it is to remember the nature and purpose of propaganda exploitation, the atrocities were no mere figment of propaganda. Terrible things did happen in and around Nemersdorf. Moreover, whatever the truth about the precise details of the atrocities, propaganda acquired a reality of its own. In terms of the impact of Nemersdorf, its likely effect was to underpin the determination of soldiers to fight on at all costs in the East, to struggle to the utmost to avoid being overrun by the Red Army, and to encourage civilians to take flight at the earliest opportunity. The image of Nemersdorf turned out to be more important than precise factual accuracy about its horrific reality. 4. The propaganda machinery was soon in action. Goebbels instantly recognized the gift that had come his way. These atrocities are indeed dreadful, he noted in his diary, after Goering had telephoned him with the details. I'll make use of them for a big press campaign. This would ensure that the last doubters were convinced of what the German people can expect if Bolshevism really gets hold of the Reich. Head of the Reich press office, Otto Dietrich, gave out instructions for the presentation of the story by the DNB, the German news agency, responsible for circulating news items within and outside Germany. It is specially desirable, the directive ran, that the DNB report brings out the horrific Bolshevik crimes in East Prussia in a big and effective way, and comments on them with extreme harshness. The monstrous Soviet bloodlust must be denounced in the layout and headlines. It was not a matter of attacks on big landowners and industrialists, it had to be stressed, but on ordinary people targeted for annihilation by Bolshevism. The headlines duly followed, the raving of the Soviet beasts, bellowed the Nazi main newspaper, the People's Observer, on the 27th of October. Bolshevik bloodlust rages in East Prussian border area, and bestial murderous terror in East Prussia, proclaimed regional newspapers in eastern Germany. Other organs of the coordinated press followed suit. Maximum shock was the intention in the stories of plunder, destruction, rape, and murder. Commissions of doctors, it was said, had confirmed the murder of 61 men, women, and children, and the rape of most of the women. There was reference to a crucifixion. Photographed lines of corpses conveyed graphic images of the horror. A front-page photograph of murdered children in the People's Observer had an accompanying warning of what would happen if Germans did not sustain their defenses and fighting spirit. The mood in eastern parts of Germany made a propaganda campaign on the revelations from Nemersdorf timely. Reports from propaganda offices had acknowledged, before news of Nemersdorf had broken, that the gains of territory by the Bolsheviks in East Prussia had produced deepest consternation, all the more so since Gauleiter Koch had declared in a speech only days earlier that no more land would be given up to the enemy. Bitter reproaches were also made against Koch by East Prussian refugees, arriving in Danzig in a pitiable state, and saying that they had first been told by retreating soldiers that the Bolsheviks were on their heels. It was in this climate of wavering morale that Goebbels saw the propaganda value of the Red Army atrocities. The sensationalized propaganda barrage was, however, less successful than Goebbels had expected. The first reactions indicated that there was some skepticism about reportage seen as a propaganda manufacture. In this, Goebbels was hoist on his own petard. Earlier in the month he had given directions to his propaganda specialists to portray the conditions in the areas occupied by the Anglo-Americans exactly as dramatically and drastically as in those occupied by the Soviets. This had been a response to accounts that our people, should it come to it, would prefer to fall into Anglo-American rather than Soviet occupation. Such a possibility could not be left open to the ordinary citizen, the little man, because it would reduce the determination to fight. On the contrary, he must know that if the Reich is lost to whichever enemy partner, there is no possibility of existence for him. In reality, the Nazi authorities were well aware that the people of those parts of the West that had already fallen to the Americans— 
had been on the whole well enough treated, and had often indeed welcomed the enemy, and attuned rapidly to occupation. Goebbels himself recognized that reports of atrocities committed by British and American troops were not believed, and that it was easy for people, apart from party functionaries, to give themselves up to the British or Americans, since they would be treated leniently. People thought the Americans especially were not as bad as they had been portrayed in the German press. Propaganda reports were now telling Goebbels that evacuees from the West were spreading the feeling that peace at any price would be preferable to the continuation of the war. And certainly in parts of the Reich far away from the travails of the East German population, people were inclined to see the accounts of refugees as exaggerated. Propaganda backfired, too, in another way. One report commented that the highlighting of Bolshevik atrocities in the East Prussian border areas was rejected since the propaganda about Nemersdorf signified in a certain sense a self-incrimination of the Reich because the population had not been evacuated on time. The allegations were countered only with weak and false arguments that claimed that the area directly behind the fighting zone had long been evacuated that the surprise Soviet assault had overrun refugee treks, but that the local population of Nemersdorf had already left, that the numbers evacuated by the party had been entirely satisfactory and proof of its energetic and successful work, and, with some contradiction, that people had had to work behind the lines as long as possible to bring in the harvest that was much needed for provisioning the rest of the Reich with food. All in all, Goebbels himself was eventually forced to concede that the atrocities reports are not bought from us any longer. In particular, the reports from Nemersdorf have only convinced a part of the population. Elsewhere, far away from the eastern borders of the Reich, another extremely telling reason was given for being unimpressed by the horror propaganda about Nemersdorf. The SD office in Stuttgart reported in early November that people were calling the press stories shameless and asking what the intention of the leadership might be in publishing pictures of the atrocities. Surely the Reich's leaders must realize, the report went on, that every thinking person, seeing these gory victims, will immediately contemplate the atrocities that we have perpetrated on enemy soil, and even in Germany. Have we not slaughtered Jews in their thousands? Don't soldiers tell, over and again, that Jews in Poland had to dig their own graves? And what did we do with the Jews who were in the concentration camp Natzweiler in Alsace? The Jews were also human beings. By acting in this way, we have shown the enemy what they might do to us in the event of their victory. We can't accuse the Russians of behaving just as gruesomely towards other peoples as our own people have done against their own Germans. There was no need to get too worked up, because they have killed a few people in East Prussia. After all, what does human life amount to here in Germany? The Reich was a large country, and Stuttgart was almost as far from Nemersdorf as it was possible to be. Revealing as these reported remarks are about knowledge of German crimes against humanity, especially of genocidal actions towards Jews, the people of Stuttgart could feel that there was much distance between themselves and whatever Soviet atrocities had taken place on the Reich's easternmost borders. The population of the eastern areas of Germany had every reason to be more alarmed at the proximity of the Red Army. For ordinary civilians, helplessly squeezed between the refusal of the party authorities to evacuate them westwards and the oncoming assault from demonized enemy forces, the horror propaganda from Nemersdorf almost certainly helped to induce a sense of intense fear. Certainly there was profound relief when the Wehrmacht beat off the incursion and some stability returned to the area. In trumpeting the successes in repelling the enemy, propaganda did not hesitate to emphasize the value of all the work that had gone into building the fortifications in the east, which, it was claimed, had held up the Red Army. The Folkstrom engagement was also glorified. But Goebbels was keen not to overplay the miracle of East Prussia. It was important, he remarked, not to praise the day before evening. This was a sensible sentiment. When the Red Army returned to East Prussia, this time to stay, in January 1945, blind panic, not determination to fight to the last, 
characterize the behavior of the vast majority of the civilian population of the region. It would be as well, however, not to presume that skepticism or cynicism about the propaganda reports about Nemersdorf meant that Goebbels' efforts had been fruitless. Contrary to indications that the atrocity stories had failed in their impact, the summary report from propaganda offices in mid-November claimed that those who had initially doubted the written accounts had altered their views in the light of the published photographs. People were filled with hatred, ready to fight to the extreme. However varied the response of the civilian population had been, it seemed certain that for two groups in particular, groups that bore power, Nemersdorf carried a message less of panic than of the need to hold out at any cost. For representatives, high and low, of the Nazi party and its affiliates, the violence and cruelty of the invaders in East Prussia had offered a foretaste of what seemed certain to await them should they fall into Soviet hands. Hitler himself reacted characteristically to the news and pictures from Nemersdorf. He swore revenge and fanned the flames of hatred, his most junior secretary, Tradel Junga, later wrote. They're not human beings any more. They're animals from the steppes of Asia, and the war I am waging against them is a war for the dignity of European mankind, he fumed. We have to be hard and fight with all the means at our disposal. Hitler, least of all, was under no illusions about his fate, should the Soviets capture him. On no account could that be allowed to happen. The route he would eventually take out of catastrophic defeat was already prefigured. He had informed the Gauleiter of Vienna and former Hitler youth leader, Balder von Schirach, as early as mid-1943, that the only way he could end the war was by shooting himself in the head. He extended the implications of his own fate to that of the German people. He had told his assembled Gauleiter as long ago as October 1943 that the German people had burnt their bridges. The only way was forward. Their very existence was at stake. He was not alone in the sentiment that there was nothing to lose. Goebbels was glad that bridges had been burnt. It bound people to the cause. In informing party leaders of the mass killings of the Jews the previous autumn, Himmler had also been deliberately spreading the complicity, so that those present knew that there was no escape from the conspiracy of the implicated. At lower levels of the party, too, the behavior of many functionaries on the approach of the enemy attempts to conceal membership of Nazi organizations, burning insignia, hiding uniforms, and most commonly flight, betrayed their anxieties about what awaited them if they fell into enemy hands. But where the petty apparatchiks might hope for safety in obscurity, the Nazi bigwigs were left with no obvious choice other than to hold out. Desperation bred determination. The other crucial sector in which the impact of Nemersdorf and all that it signified was unmistakable was within the army, especially among those soldiers who came from eastern parts of Germany. In the West, the collapse following the Allied breakthrough in France had brought disarray and damaged morale. The recovery there could not conceal the fervent desire among many soldiers for a swift end to the purgatory of continued fighting. It was possible to see falling into enemy hands in the West as a release. The likely death sentence appeared to be to fight on rather than end up a captive. In the East, the feelings were very different. Colonel General Reinhardt reflected undoubted widespread sentiments when he saw what the Soviet troops had done in East Prussia almost immediately following their expulsion from the area. He wrote to his wife of the rage, the hatred, which fills us since we have seen how the Bolsheviks have wrought havoc in the area that we have retaken south of Gumbadon. There can be no other aim for us, he added, than to hold out and to protect our homeland. For soldiers from East Prussia and neighboring regions, it was no longer a matter of abstract patriotic defense of the homeland, however, let alone fighting for the cause of the Fuhrer. The lives and well-being of their loved ones were at stake. The fury and thirst for revenge at what had been done was palpable. I was there yesterday, the 25th of October, 1944, in this area to visit my troops 
after their successful attack, Reinhardt went on, and experienced the blind fury with which they have slain entire regiments. A glimpse, if at a later date, of the impact of events in East Prussia on the mentalities of ordinary soldiers far from the areas in possession of the Red Army is provided by the diary of a member of the Wehrmacht Commander-in-Chief's staff in Norway. Reports of murder, torture, rapes, abduction to bordellos, deportations, had a devastating effect on the troops, he recalled. It encouraged the mystical belief that salvation would come at the last. Those with a clearer view of the likely future kept quiet, since maintaining the discipline that, below the surface, had weakened, was the imperative, and this seemed feasible only with the aid of false hopes. Concern for relatives was, however, growing by the hour. Of course, soldiers, even those from the directly affected eastern border areas of the Reich, did not all think alike. But sufficient numbers fighting on the eastern front, and also many of those transferred to the west, appeared to have been convinced that they were indeed engaged, as Hitler and Goebbels and others kept reminding them, in a struggle for their very existence, and that of their comrades and loved ones back home. The Soviet incursion served as a graphically horrible reinforcement of existing stereotypes about the Bolsheviks. It was not, in the first instance, a matter of firm ideological belief in Nazi doctrine or the redemptive powers of the Führer. It was simply a belief that, in the East at least, it was a life-or-death struggle against barbaric enemies. And for those less than wholly convinced, there was the intensified apparatus of repression, control, and severe punishment within the Wehrmacht itself. A rising trend in death sentences for desertion, unwillingness to fight, undermining morale, and other offenses, mirror the decline in Germany's military fortunes. The war of annihilation on the Eastern Front had always been qualitatively different from the nature of the conflict in the West. The ideological confrontation in the East, the savagery of the fighting on both sides, the barbarization of warfare that openly targeted the wholesale destruction of civilian life, and not least, the genocidal dimension present from the launch of Operation Barbarossa in June 1941, had no real equivalence in the West, even though their impact was felt throughout the German-occupied parts of the European continent. This is not to underplay the severity of the bitter fighting in the West, such as in Normandy following the Allied landings, where German troops, certainly down to the collapse in mid-August, had fought tenaciously and with losses that for a time matched the rate of attrition in the East. Nor is it to forget the harshness of civilian life, under German occupation beyond Eastern Europe, let alone the tentacles of genocidal policy that reached out into all corners of the Nazi Empire. The subjugated peoples of the Balkans, Greece, Italy, in the last phase of the war, and other countries, suffered grievously from mounting atrocities and merciless reprisals for any form of resistance as occupying German forces became more desperate. The Germans perpetrated atrocities in the West, too, most horrifically, the massacre by the Waffen-SS of hundreds of villagers at orador sur glen in France in June 1944. But what was rare in the West was the norm in the East. Awareness of the fundamentally different character of the war in the East and West had been recognized throughout German society since the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941. The incursion of the Red Army onto German soil and the terrible experiences for the civilian population that ensued now sharpened the perceptions of that division between Eastern and Western fronts, both for soldiers and civilians. For the latter, experiences of the war in the West were now almost entirely dominated by the wanton destruction and terror from the skies. Goebbels' postbag was almost exclusively taken up with letters, which he thought, to some extent alarming, about the effects of the air raids and the despair that there was no defense against them. What was the use of morale, the letter writers were asking, if the bombing was wrecking the means to carry on the fight? The letters, Goebbels remarked, reflected a worrying level of apathy in continuing the struggle. 
For most people in the western regions, so badly afflicted by the bombing, the end of the war could not come soon enough. They would mean liberation from the misery. True, few preferred the prospect of life under an occupying force, but life would nevertheless go on. Propaganda claims that conquest by the Western Allies would destroy German existence were widely disbelieved. There was little fear of the Americans or British. The fear here was of the bombers. Fear, fear, fear. Nothing else is known to me, wrote one mother in September 1944, worried sick about her daughter at school as bombers crossed the skies in broad daylight, and anxious too about her husband at the front. At least he was in the West, she wrote. To fall into the hands of the Soviets would mean the end. In the eastern regions, fear of the Soviets was all-encompassing, and borne out by Nemersdorf and what that signified. It encouraged the readiness among civilians to dig ditches, undergo any necessary privations, and do all that was humanly possible to fend off the worst. It also produced mass panic when occupation was imminent. Naturally, people in these regions, too, desperately wanted the war to end. But for most of them, still largely unaffected by the bombing that was a daily scourge for the Western population, the end of the war in any acceptable way had to entail release from the dreadful fear of a Soviet takeover and saving their families, possessions, and homeland from occupation by a hated and feared enemy. So desire for a rapid end to the terrible conflict was mixed with the desire for the war to continue until those ends were attained. This meant that hopes had to be invested in the capacity of the Wehrmacht to continue the fight and to stave off the worst. For soldiers, the divide between East and West was little different. Certainly troops on the Western Front fought doggedly and resolutely. According to later reflections of a high-ranking officer under Modell's command, they had no great ideals any longer, though there was often still some flickering belief in Hitler and hopes in the promised miracle weapons. Most of all, they had nothing more to lose. Their fighting qualities were often grudgingly admired by the Western Allies. But outright fanaticism was mainly to be found among units of the Waffen-SS. And... For most soldiers, the prospect of capture was not the end of the world. On the Eastern Front, fanaticism, though not omnipresent, was far more commonplace. The mere thought of falling into Soviet hands meant that holding out was an imperative. No quarter could be expected from the enemy. Nemersdorf showed, it seemed, that fears of Soviet occupation were more than justified. The propaganda imagery of Bolshevik bestiality was correct. The war in the East could not be given up. There could be no contemplation of surrender when what was in store was so unimaginably terrible. 5. Increasingly dreadful though the predicament was of the German population, bombing incessantly in the West and living in terror of Soviet invasion in the East, the fate of Nazism's prime ideological target, the Jews, was infinitely worse. Hitler had sought in the spring to harden fighting morale and commitment to Nazi principles of all-out racial struggle when he addressed a large gathering of generals and other officers about to head for the front. He told them how essential it had been to deal so ruthlessly with the Jews, whose victory in the war would bring the destruction of the German people. The entire bestiality of Bolshevism, he ranted, had been a product of the Jews. He pointed to the danger in Germany posed by Hungary, a state he depicted as completely under Jewish domination, but added that he had now intervened through the occupation of the country that had taken place in March, and that the problem would soon be solved there, too. The military commanders interrupted the speech on several occasions with rapturous applause. They were being made complicit through their knowledge of what had happened to the Jews in much of Europe and was now happening in Hungary. In the summer of 1944, as the Red Army was smashing through Army Group Center in Belarusia, trainloads of Jews were still being ferried from Hungary to their deaths in the massive extermination unit at Auschwitz-Birkenau in Upper Silesia. By the time the deportations were stopped in early July, by a Hungarian leadership responding 
to the mounting pressure from abroad, the Nazi assault on the largest remaining Jewish community in Europe had accounted for over 430,000 Jews. The crematoria in Auschwitz struggled to keep up with the numbers being gassed to death, more than 10,000 a day that summer. At the end of July, the Red Army, advancing through Poland, had liberated Madinek near Lublin and encountered for the first time the monstrosity of the death camps, publicizing the findings in the world's press, though few in Germany had access to this. Auschwitz-Birkenau was, however, still carrying out its grisly work. With the closure of Belzec, Sobibor, and Treblinka in 1943, and a final burst of exterminatory work in Kelmno in the summer of 1944, Auschwitz-Birkenau, the largest death camp, was the last in operation. Jews from the Lotz ghetto in Poland were gassed there in August. Transports from Slovakia and the camp at Theresienstadt, on which had once been Czech territory, arrived in September and October. In November, satisfied that the Jewish question had, to all intents and purposes, been solved through the killing of millions and anxious at the growing proximity of the Red Army, Himmler ordered the gassing installations to be demolished. It is striking how little thought of what might be happening to Jews appears to have impinged upon the consciousness of Germans, wholly and not unnaturally preoccupied with their own suffering and anxieties. Propaganda continued to pour out its anti-Jewish vitriol, blaming Jews for the war and linking them with Germany's destruction. But these were by now weary, platitudinous abstractions. Most ordinary citizens appear to have given no consideration to the actual fate of the Jews, or to have pondered much about what might have happened to them. Relatively few people within Germany had first-hand detailed knowledge of the murderous events that continued to unfold to the East. The final solution was, of course, officially still preserved as a closely guarded state secret. But in any case, overwhelmed by their own anxieties, Few Germans were interested in what was happening, far away, to an unloved, where not thoroughly hated, minority. For most, it was a case of out of sight, out of mind, apart from the nagging worry that the ill deeds perpetrated by German overlords might well come back to haunt them in defeat and occupation. This concern was present in two ways, both more subliminal than overt. As the reported comments from Stuttgart, referred to earlier, indicate, there was a gathering sense that Germany was now reaping what it had sown, that the misery its population was undergoing amounted to retribution for what had been done to the Jews and others. And another sentiment not infrequently encountered in this period was that the Jews would return with the occupying forces to take their revenge. The sentiment, commonplace enough, was directly expressed in one letter home from the front in August 1944. You know that the Jew will exact his bloody revenge, mainly on party people. Unfortunately, I was one of those who wore the party uniform. I've already regretted it. I urge you to get rid of the uniform. It doesn't matter where, even if you have to burn the lot. Not a few, especially no doubt among hardened Nazi believers, felt that the bombing and destruction of German towns and cities itself amounted to that revenge. Incessant Nazi propaganda about the power of world Jewry had made a lasting mark. For the few Jews remaining within the Reich, living as pariahs, keen to keep a low profile, with almost no contact with non-Jews, it was a shadowy world, a completely uncertain, highly precarious, anxiety-written existence, though in ways that contrasted with the anxieties and uncertainties of the mass of the population. The academic, Victor Klemperer, an intelligent observer living in Dresden, whose marriage to a non-Jew had enabled him to avoid deportation, was full of apprehension simply at the late return of his wife from a rare and brief absence from their home. She was carrying parts of the secret diary he was keeping, to be hidden by a friend in Pirna, not far away. If it should fall into the hands of the authorities, it would spell death not just for himself, but for his wife and for friends he had mentioned by name. He and his wife did share with the mass of the population the fear of bombing. However, here too there were 
Major Differences Bombing for Nazism's victims was a sign of Germany's impending defeat and personal liberation from a terroristic regime. But Klemperer's existential fear was that he would survive a raid, be evacuated, separated from his wife, and sent somewhere to be gassed. There was anxiety, too, shared with friends, about surviving another winter of war with provisions of food and fuel scarcely sufficient to keep a person alive. Another winter is a horrible prospect, he wrote. Another acquaintance looked grimly into the future, foreseeing malnutrition, shortage of medicines, spread of epidemic diseases, no end to the war, and eventually death for all remaining bearers of the Yellow Star. Klemperer was aware, if without detail, of the fate of the Jews of Eastern Europe. In these very days, he was given another report by a soldier on leave of gruesome murders of Jews in the East. His reaction to the events in East Prussia also contrasted with that of the non-Jewish population. While they had their fears of Bolshevism confirmed, his own worry was what the implications were for Jews. He remarked on the new agitation against Jews unleashed by Martin Muschmann, the Gauleiter of Saxony, then added, and the Bolshevik atrocities in East Prussia, about which the people probably believed, could be turned against us. For the countless other victims of the regime, Jews, hundreds of thousands in concentration camps, more than seven million foreign workers and prisoners of war, and further millions of former political opponents of the Nazis, the end of the war was a moment they yearned for. In autumn 1944, however, that end was still not in sight. Their misery was set to go on. 6. Intense war weariness was by now widespread throughout much of German society, within the civilian population and also among ordinary soldiers. One keen foreign observer in Berlin recalled, long after the events, his sense that autumn the Germans felt themselves to be in an avalanche gathering pace as it headed for the abyss. What made them carry on was a question repeatedly in his mind and that of his associates. Beyond terror, he thought, inertia and habit, apathy and the need for some normality, a search for routine even in the midst of extreme abnormality, which he saw as not a specific German but a universal characteristic, provided some explanation. To such speculation could be added the sheer debilitating lethargy that arose from constant intense anxiety about the fate of loved ones, ever-present fear of bombing, the daily dislocations of sheltering from or clearing up after air raids, overwork and exhaustion, the queuing for greatly reduced rations, malnutrition, and the constant sense of helpless exposure to events beyond anyone's control. Since there was no option, no obvious course of action open to individuals that would not result in self-destruction, and would in any case change nothing, people simply got on with their lives as best they could. Politically, the war weariness meant extensive and growing aversion to the Nazi regime, though with no potential to turn sentiment into action. Not just the Nazi party, but Hitler himself was drawn into the front line of criticism for bringing war to Germany and causing such misery. An outward sign was that the Heil Hitler greeting was disappearing. Providence has determined the destruction of the German people, and Hitler is the executor of this will, was said by one SD station at the beginning of November to be a common view. Except in such negative ways as a cause of the horror and obstruction to ending it, Hitler, once almost deified by millions, had come by now to play little overt part in people's consciousness. A dwindling proportion of Germans were, it is true, still unbending in their support for the regime, retaining a fanatical determination to fight to the last. Most, however, increasingly saw themselves as victims of Hitler and his regime, often now overlooking how they had, in better times, idolized their leader and cheered his successes, and how their own treatment of others was rebounding in misery for themselves. The war had come home to Germany, a battered, broken country, its industrial and transport framework collapsing, 
besieged by economically and militarily superior forces to the East and West. Whatever hopes had been invested in wonder weapons had largely evaporated. Only further devastation lay in store. Most people simply wanted the war to end and hoped that Anglo-American occupation would keep the Bolsheviks from their throats. Such feelings, if not universal, were widely held, though to no avail. They were not shared by those in power, by the regime's leadership, the high command of the Wehrmacht, military commanders, and those directing the party, whether at the center or in the provinces. Moreover, though the system had taken a terrible pounding through military defeats and relentless bombing, it still continued, more or less, to function. Astonishing resilience and even more remarkable improvisation enabled state, party, and military bureaucracies to operate, if not normally, then still with some effectiveness. Above all, the mechanisms of control and repression were in place. No organizational capacity to challenge them existed. And at the very pinnacle of the regime, there was, as always, not the slightest inclination to contemplate either negotiation or surrender. Hitler made this plain yet again in his proclamation of the 12th of November. He left no one in any doubt. As long as he lived, the war would go on. He had, in fact, been planning for weeks what, given the resources available, would almost certainly be a final, desperate attempt to turn the tide. Remaining on the defensive could prolong the conflict, he reckoned, but would never wrest the initiative from the enemy. A decisive strike was imperative. If such a venture were to be attempted, the imperiled Eastern Front appeared to be the obvious choice. After all, the prospect of a Bolshevik breakthrough and ultimate victory was too ghastly for anyone to contemplate. The Army Chief of Staff, Guderian, responsible for the Eastern Front, put the case strongly. But against Guderian's advice, Hitler was adamant that an offensive would have the greatest chance of success, not somewhere along the extensive Eastern Front, but at a specific, vulnerable point of the Allied lines in the West, with the intention of driving on to Antwerp. Inflicting an incisive defeat on the Western Allies would not simply be crucial for the war in the West. It would also revive morale, and then allow forces to be transferred to the East to bolster the chances of repelling the expected winter offensive of the Red Army. If it failed, however, not only would the Western Allies be able to continue their march on the borders of the Reich against a greatly weakened Wehrmacht, but the Eastern Front would be left enfeebled and exposed. It was, as all in the know could see, a highly risky strategy. A betting man would not have put much of a wager on its chances of success. But from Hitler's perspective, it was almost all that was left. If it doesn't succeed, I see no other possibility of bringing the war to a favorable conclusion, he told Speer. On the 16th of December, the new offensive was unleashed on the Americans with unexpected ferocity. Germany's last serious military hope of affecting the outcome of the war now lay in the balance. Chapter 4 Hopes Raised and Dashed Victory was never as close as it is now. The decision will soon be reached. We will throw them into the ocean, the arrogant, big-mouthed apes from the New World. They will not get into our Germany. We will protect our wives and children from all enemy domination. I shall march once more through Belgium and France, but I don't have the smallest desire to do so. If only this idiotic war would end. Why should I fight? It only goes for the existence of the Nazis. The superiority of our enemy is so great that it is senseless to fight against it. Contrasting Views of German Soldiers During the Ardennes Offensive December 1944 1. All the hopes of the German leadership now rested on the great offensive in the West. If successful, it could, they thought, prove a decisive turning point in the war. If it failed, the war would be effectively lost. But remaining on the defensive would simply mean eventually being crushed between the advancing Western and Eastern powers, 
who would be able to exploit their superior resources and seemingly limitless reserves of manpower. General Yodel, responsible for strategic planning, summarized the thinking at the beginning of November. The risk of the great aim, seeming to stand technically in disproportion to our available forces, is unalterable. But in our current situation, we can't shrink from staking everything on one card. The card to be played was a swift and decisive military strike aimed at inflicting such a mighty blow on the Western Allies that they would lose the appetite for continuing the fight. This would lead to the breakup of what was perceived as an unnatural coalition of forces facing Germany. Hitler's own characteristic thinking was plainly outlined in his address to his division commanders four days before the beginning of the offensive. Wars are finally decided, he asserted, by the recognition on one side or the other that the war can't be won any more. Thus, the most important task is to bring the enemy to this realization. Even when forced back on the defensive, ruthless strikes had the effect of showing the enemy that he had not won, and that the war would continue, no matter what he might do. He can never count on a capitulation. Never. Ever. Under the impact of severe setbacks and recognition that success was unattainable, the enemy's nerve will break in the end. And Germany's enemy was a coalition of the greatest extremes that can be imagined in this world, ultra-capitalist states on one side and ultra-Marxist states on the other. On one side, a dying world empire, Britain, and on the other side, a colony seeking an inheritance, the USA. It was ripe for collapse if a blow of sufficient power could be landed. If a few heavy strikes were to succeed here, this artificially maintained united front could collapse at any moment with a huge clap of thunder. The first deliberations for an offensive in the West had taken place at precisely the time of German crisis on that front, during the collapse in Normandy in mid-August. By mid-September, the decision for the offensive, given the code name Watch on the Rhine, later changed to Autumn Mist, was taken. Utmost secrecy was of the essence, only a few in the high command of the Wehrmacht and among the regime's leaders were in the know. Even Field Marshal von Rundstedt, restored as Commander-in-Chief West on the 5th of September, was told only in late October of the aims of the operation. Jodl's plans for the attack went through a number of variations before Hitler's order to go ahead was given on the 10th of November. Then, the intended launch of the offensive in late November had to be postponed several times because of equipment shortages an unseasonal good weather. The attack was depending on poor weather to ground enemy aircraft, before the final date was set, at the 16th of December. The military goal was to strike, as in 1940, through the wooded Ardennes, in the gap between the American and British forces, advancing rapidly to take Antwerp, and in tandem with German divisions attacking towards the south, from Holland, cutting the enemy lines of communication with the rear, encircling and destroying the British 21st Army Group and the 9th and 1st U.S. Armies in a new Dunkirk. It would, according to Hitler's directive for the operation, bring the decisive turn in the Western campaign and therefore perhaps of the entire war. The situation on the Eastern as well as the Western Front had deteriorated drastically since the idea for the offensive had initially been conceived. On the Eastern Front, the Soviet incursion into East Prussia had, it is true, been repelled, but the most acutely threatened area had meanwhile become Hungary, a crucial source of oil and other raw materials. German troops were engaged there in bitter attritional fighting throughout the autumn in fending off the Red Army's attempt to take Budapest, ordered by Stalin at the end of October. In the West, meanwhile, American troops stood on German soil in the Aachen area, after taking the city in late October, their advance during the following weeks in the densely wooded hills beyond the West Wall, the Hürtgenwald, between Aachen and Eupen and Duren, to the east, had encountered ferocious defense and proved extremely costly to the Americans. By the time the Ardennes offensive began, the American advance had reached only the river Ruhr, near Ulick and Duren. Further to the south, the Americans had greater success, though again at a cost. 
and only after tough resistance by the Wehrmacht. In Lorraine, General Patton's 3rd U.S. Army eventually forced the surrender of the heavily fortified town of Metz on the 22nd of November. Though, battle-weary and combating driving rain, sleet, and mud as well as the enemy, it was unable to continue the advance to Saarbrücken. In Alsace, the 6th U.S. Army Group of General Jacob Devers, encountering weaker German defenses, drove through the Vosges Mountains to take Strasbourg on the 23rd of November and reached the Rhine near Kale. Even so, the German leadership, attributing typically the fall of Strasbourg to treachery within Alsace, was encouraged by the stiffened resistance during the autumn that had held the Western Allies at bay. In the eyes of Hitler and his chief military advisers, Keitel and Jodl, the enemy inroads since the summer strengthened rather than weakened the case for the planned Western offensive. The pressure, military and economic, on Germany was relentlessly intensifying. The tightening vice, they felt, could be loosened only through a bold strike. German losses of men and equipment had mounted sharply over the autumn, predominantly on the Eastern Front but also in the West. But so had those of the enemy. American casualties and fierce autumn fighting for relatively minor territorial gains totaled almost a quarter of a million men, dead, wounded, or captured. Hitler impressed upon his commanders that the time to strike against an enemy that had suffered high losses and was worn out was ripe. Beyond that, the Eastern Front, the heavy fighting in Hungary notwithstanding, was for the time being seen to be relatively stabilized, though no one was in doubt that a big new offensive would soon be launched. This was seen as all the more reason to press home the advantage of a German offensive in the West without delay. Heavy priority was accorded to the demands of the Western offensive in allocation of men and armaments. Three armies of Army Group B were to take part. The 6th SS Panzer Army, led by SS Colonel General Sepp Dietrich, one of Hitler's toughest and most trusted military veterans, and the 5th Panzer Army, under its brilliant commander and specialist in tank warfare, General Hasso von Manteuffel, were to spearhead the attack in the north and center of the front. The 7th Army, under General Erich Brandenburger, was assigned the task of protecting the southern flank. Some 200,000 men, in five Panzer and thirteen People's Grenadier Divisions, were assigned to the first wave, supported by around 600 tanks and 1,600 heavy guns. However, many of the men were young and inexperienced. Some divisions came, already battle-weary, from the fight on the Tsar. Fuel shortages were a major concern, even with some supplies taken from the hard-pressed Eastern Front. And an even bigger worry was the weakness of the Luftwaffe. All available planes, including two-thirds of the entire fighter force, were assembled for the attack. Hopes had to be placed in bad weather, limiting the massive supremacy in the air of the Allies. Even so, the Wehrmacht began with a substantial numerical advantage in ground troops and heavy armaments in the 170-kilometer-wide attack zone. The element of surprise would be vital to make this momentary superiority tell. But even surprise would not be enough if the offensive could not be sustained. There were grounds enough for skepticism about the chances of success. Both Rundstedt and Field Marshal Model, Commander-in-Chief of Army Group B, thought the aim of Antwerp, around 200 kilometers away, far too ambitious given the strength of available forces. They favored a more limited aim of beating back and destroying the Allied forces along the Meuse, between Aachen and Liège. But Hitler wanted no little solution, no ordinary victory. He would not be moved from the aim he had stipulated for the offensive. In the end, Rundstedt and Model declared themselves to be fully in agreement with Hitler's ambitious plan. Privately, both remained extremely dubious. Model thought it had no chance. Dietrich and Manteuffel also bowed, their own doubts still unassuaged to the imperative. Like most military commanders, they saw it as their duty to raise objections to the operational plan, but then, when these were rejected, to fulfill to the best of their ability the orders of the political leadership, however futile they deemed these to be.
Hitler still had the capacity, however, to make the impossible seem possible. Manteuffel himself accepted that Hitler's addresses to the divisional commanders on the 11th and 12th of December had made a positive impact. The commanders, he wrote later, took away from this conference a picture of the enemy's overall situation. They had been given an appreciation of the situation from the one source in a position to see the full military picture, and it seemed to give an assurance of favorable conditions. In the top echelons of the high command of the Wehrmacht, there was no readiness to back the well-founded misgivings of those who would lead the offensive. Keitel and Jodl were daily in Hitler's immediate proximity and remained heavily under his domineering influence. Both remained believers in his unique qualities as Führer, adepts of his form of charismatic authority. If they harbored doubts, they kept them to themselves. Jodl refrained from any criticism of Hitler's decision even when interrogated by his Allied captors in May 1945. On the 15th of December, Rundstedt put out his order of the day, exhorting his troops on the eve of battle. Soldiers of the Western Front, he proclaimed, your great hour has struck. Strong attacking armies are marching today against the Anglo-Americans. I don't need to say any more. You all feel it. It's all or nothing. Modell's own ringing exhortation followed. We will not disappoint the trust of the Fuhrer placed in us, nor that of the homeland, which has forged the sword of retaliation. Advance in the spirit of Leuton. This was a reference to the legendary victory of Frederick the Great in the Seven Years' War, almost two centuries earlier. At 5.30 a.m. on the 16th of December, an hour-long artillery barrage began. About 7 a.m. before sunrise on a frosty morning, with thick cloud offering protection from enemy aircraft, the German infantry marched out of the dawn mist and began their assault. Germany's last major offensive was underway. The stakes could scarcely have been higher. They were indeed, as Jodl had put it, all placed on one card. 2. Nor had the civilian leadership of the Reich given up hope that depressing autumn. Whatever illusions Nazi leaders harbored, however ready they were to delude themselves and listen to their own propaganda, they were intelligent enough to see how rapidly the situation was deteriorating. Yet they still hoped against hope that Hitler would find a way out, that the Allied coalition would collapse under the weight of its own contradictions, or that the deployment of new wonder weapons could bring a dramatic change of fortunes. Few Nazi leaders were apprised of the plan for the Ardennes Offensive. One who was, however, was Albert Speer, among the most resigned about Germany's inevitable fate, to go from his later account, but possibly the most crucial of Hitler's immediate lieutenants in enabling the war to continue. Without Speer's efforts, drive, and organizational skill in the autumn of 1944 in making the armaments available, the Ardennes Offensive would not have been feasible, however much Hitler and his top military aides wanted it. It is striking, in fact, how late the almost complete collapse of the economy took place, and how great the efforts were, even then, to overcome the increasingly insuperable difficulties. In their post-war interrogations, Speer and the leading figures in his ministry were adamant that the damage to Germany's economic infrastructure only became insurmountable during the autumn of 1944 largely as a consequence of the systematic destruction of the transport and communications network through a relentless Allied bombing campaign that had begun in October. Whatever their private thoughts about Germany's chances of avoiding defeat, the action of Speer's able and energetic subordinates showed they were far from resigned to inevitable disaster. They performed organizational near-miracles, if in part by grossly inhumane exploitation of foreign workers, to enable the economy to continue functioning at all, prolonging the war in its most destructive phase. Some, indeed, most notably Karl Otto Sauer, the ruthless head of the technical department, retained an astonishingly optimistic view of Germany's chances almost down to the end of 1944. By the autumn of 1944, it was impossible to manufacture enough to compensate for the losses. 
Heavy air raids caused a sharp drop in the availability of steel for manufacture of ammunition. Coal production was cushioned until late autumn by reducing deliveries for winter stocking, but catastrophic from November onwards, while serious shortages of most indispensable basic products mounted in the second half of 1944. Speer reckoned that there was a drop in armaments production of 30 to 40 percent across 1944, worsening sharply as the year went on. By late autumn, there were critical shortages of fuel and gas. The emergency needs of the Luftwaffe could be met only until around October. Aviation fuel levels could not be sustained following the attacks earlier in the year on the synthetic oil plants, though minimum production of motor spirit and diesel oil continued to the end of the war. By autumn, anti-aircraft defense was being accorded priority over fighter production. Speer estimated that some 30% of the total output of guns in 1944 and 20% of heavy caliber ammunition together with up to 55% of armaments production of the electrotechnical industry and 33% of the optical industry went on anti-aircraft defenses, meaning diminished armaments provision for the front and a weakening in the fighting power of the Wehrmacht. Emergency transport arrangements meant that armaments production could be more or less sustained until late autumn. By then, increasingly damaging attacks on the transport network, including crucial attacks on canals in late autumn, were causing massive disruption to both civilian and military supplies. To the growing concern of the OKW, the severe lack of fuel and other supplies so evident at the outset of the Ardennes Offensive, which worried Modal and Dietrich, arose in good part from the transport difficulties as the number of railway wagons available for armaments fell by more than a half. Speer went so far as to claim that transport problems, meaning that adequate fuel supplies could not be provided to the frontline troops on time, were decisive in causing the swift breakdown of the Ardennes Offensive. Speer's departmental heads broadly agreed with his assessment that late autumn was the time when the economic crisis became overwhelming. According to Hans Carroll, head of the Raw Materials and Planning Departments, the concentrated Allied attacks on the Reich's transport system had an increasingly drastic effect on production from October onwards and became a decisive factor after December. He estimated that the drop in output owing to lack of transport facilities was around 25% from June to October, but 60% between November and January 1945. The effects on the distribution of raw materials were particularly severe. Werner Bosch, in Carroll's department, highlighted the critical shortage of cement needed for building works, including the extensive underground factories run largely on slave labor, as supplies halved from November onwards. He allocated the dwindling supplies through rigorous rationing on a system of priorities. He claimed after the war that he had realized by spring 1944 that the war could not be won, and thought, as he imagined did Speer himself, that Germany's leadership should have sought peace terms as soon as possible. As it was, however, he remarked, people in his position could do nothing except get on with their own work. Whatever his post-war claims and his private reflections at the time, Bosch, in getting on with his own work, so effectively in the interests of the war effort, had helped to keep things going, even in such desperate straits. The impact of the transport crisis on iron and steel production in the escalating crisis of the autumn was extremely grave. Supplies from Belgium and France had dried up during the summer, but German production remained almost at full capacity until September, before entering upon a steep decline from October onwards, and was down by half in December, from two to one million tons in the month. Hermann Rochling, head of the Reich Iron Federation and a member of the Technical Department in Speer's ministry, pointed out the huge drop, about 350,000 metric tons a month, in raw steel when Lorraine and Luxembourg fell out of production. Then the big fall of around 50% in production from the Tsar and the Ruhr district, partly on account of disruption of the railways through bombing. In the Ruhr, Germany's biggest industrial heartland, 
Steel production had been sustained at relatively stable levels, despite increased difficulties, during the first nine months of 1944, according to Dr. Walter Rowland, head of the main committee for the iron-producing industry in the Speer Ministry and deputy chief of the Reich Iron Federation. Reserves were, however, almost used up by September. Then, from October, a drastic deterioration set in as the transport crisis deepened. According to Gunter schulze felitz head of the Energy Department, the total capacity of Germany's power stations had expanded during each year of the war. Electricity supplies held up well until November, but then declined sharply as coal deliveries became seriously impaired. By November, coal stocks at power stations were down by 30% compared with the previous year. Many had sufficient coal for only a week. As most of the reports acknowledged, the impact of the incessant air raids on transport installations was uppermost in the production problems by late 1944. By the end of the autumn, the difficulties were becoming impossible to surmount. Without the constant improvisation in all production areas by Speer's capable subordinates, the decline would undoubtedly have set in earlier and been more steep. Richard Fiebig, head of the main committee for railway vehicles, pointed out, for instance, that through efficiencies, his department not only succeeded in balancing the losses of workshops through bombing and loss of territory, but we actually increased the output. From September... 1,100 to 1,200 locomotives per month were being lost to enemy raids. But 6,800 were being repaired each month during the autumn in spite of decreasing repair capacity. Extraordinarily rapid, though inevitably piecemeal, repairs were also made in towns and cities, in factories and workshops after bombing raids, thanks in no small part to the surplus of manpower through inactive production that the raids themselves had made available. From autumn onwards, between 1 and 1.5 million people were, at any one time, engaged on work resulting from air raid damage. Perhaps most remarkably, according to Zauer, owing to long gestation periods in production, the total output of weapons increased continuously throughout 1944, reaching its absolute peak for practically all weapon types in December 1944. Zauer was prone to excessive optimism and invariably ready to convey this to Hitler. He went so far as to claim, as one of the best-informed men in Germany as to the war situation, that on a purely statistical basis, Germany's situation on the eve of the Ardennes offensive looked good. He pointed out that Germany's total number of soldiers under arms was greater than ever before, as was production of guns, tanks, and U-boats in that month, and the quantity of weapons and ammunition in the hands of the fighting troops. Of course, as he acknowledged, when it came to the quality of the troops, which had certainly fallen as increasingly the young, ill-trained, or battle-weary were conscripted, it was a different matter. Zauer's final point, emphasizing the great numerical strength of the Volkstrom, whose fighting capabilities were widely derided within both the Wehrmacht and in the civilian population, a sufficient indication of the spurious grounds for his apparently optimistic outlook. Nevertheless, it is striking that, far from being resigned to inevitable defeat, Sauer still felt that at the outset of the Ardennes offensive, Germany held many good cards. Speer certainly did all he could during the deepening transport and production crisis that autumn to sustain the faltering German war economy. His efforts included a visit to the Ruhr and three to the Western Front to inspect the extent of the crisis and assess what improvised measures could be taken to improve the dire situation. Each time he reported directly to Hitler, enabling him to put specific proposals in his briefings in the full expectation of gaining Hitler's approval. On the 11th of November, he informed Hitler of the increasingly serious situation in the Ruhr district, subjected to systematic intense bombing that autumn. Transport was the overriding concern. Speer appointed a plenipotentiary, the head of the Reichsbahn administration, Dr. Karl Lammertz, with powers to coordinate transport throughout the region without waiting for directions from Berlin, 
and also organized emergency measures to keep supplies moving, including food for the civilian population, and set industry to work again. These involved deploying 50,000 foreign workers supplied by Bormann by removing them from digging fortifications, another 30,000 taken from the armaments industry, a sign of the desperation, and 4,500 skilled electricians, pipe layers, and welders brought in from other parts of the Reich. The Gauleiter were ordered by Bormann to draft the local population of their areas, if necessary, to help in the removal of damage. Some 10% of mine workers were envisaged for this work, even at the cost of temporarily reducing output from the pits. Another extraordinary reflection of how bad the situation was. Other emergency measures were put in place to clear the waterways. The local population was to be mobilized, as in times of flood emergencies, to help in repairing the damage. Despite all this, Speer pointed out, it was not possible in the short term to prevent a drastic drop in production. The severity of the damage meant that stockpiles of coal sufficed for no more than ten days and would be exhausted by the end of November if no great improvement could be made. Rail transport, gas, and electricity supplies were seriously threatened. He was, therefore, instigating an emergency program, including strict allocation of railway wagons and priority for coal transportation, that would guarantee at least partial armaments production and sustain current levels of arms deliveries in the short term. Between the 15th and 23rd of November, Speer visited several units of Army Group B, the Krupp Works at Essen, and several other major concerns in the Ruhr. He made a number of recommendations to overcome the damage to waterways, shipping and bridges, and improve anti-aircraft defenses, he urged the accelerated expansion of aerodromes to take the Messerschmitt 262 jet fighter and other modern planes and more efficient use of the labor force. He was critical about the sluggishness in providing the necessary labor from other parts of the Reich, especially when 128,000 men from the Ruhr, among them skilled workers, had been conscripted for fortification work outside the area when they were so badly needed to restore the damaged Ruhr industrial heartland. He wanted alterations in steel allocation, with priority to be removed from U-boats and shifted to restoration of transport and reconstruction of Ruhr industrial works. Otherwise, he could propose only minor improvements. Lack of transport meant people were having to walk long distances to work each day over damaged roads. There was a shortage of shoes, which Speer requested be provided from elsewhere in the Reich. Because of damage to power stations and electricity cables, many people were without lighting. He recommended a special action to provide candles and other means of lighting, including pit lamps. Factories could not contact each other since the telephone system was not fully working, and the Reich Postal Service did not have the manpower to restore the system. He advocated a communications regiment from the Army to be sent to restore and maintain a communications system for industry. Overall, the tenor of his report was that, despite the huge damage, there were still unused capacities of labor and resources, if systematically deployed, to overcome the worst. Hitler accepted Speer's recommendations at their meeting at the end of November. He agreed, for example, that the Reich should provide a labor force of between 100 and 150,000 to assist the Ruhr, and that all workers from the area conscripted for digging elsewhere should be returned. He also ordered an improvement in shoe provision for the Ruhr. In the build-up for the Ardennes Offensive, Speer paid another shorter visit to the Western Front between the 7th and 10th of December, visiting mainly units of Army Groups B and G to hear their experiences and suggestions on the armament situation. Major improvements were no longer possible. The armaments industry was by now scraping the barrel. This had not prevented Speer, however, just before leaving for the Western Front, impressing a selected audience with an array of improved weapons in preparation. He was reduced to recommending incentives, additional army stores, goods, or leave, for troop units with especially low losses of weaponry. He also encouraged intensified propaganda efforts by the NSFOs 
to explain how well the armaments industry was performing despite all difficulties, and to combat rumors on shortages of tanks and fuel that were damaging troop morale. He pointed out to Hitler that Tsar coal and gas were keeping the whole of southwest German industry going. The severe consequences, if the Tsar fell, to the enemy were obvious. Speer's third trip to the Western Front took place in the second half of December, during the Ardennes Offensive, when he took soundings from a number of units of Army Group B. There was little concrete return from his visit. The most significant part of the report emphasized again the crisis on the railways. The Reichsbahn network in the region had, he reported, been almost completely smashed beyond repair. Sepp Dietrich complained that his troops were getting no munitions because the communications routes had been destroyed by air attacks. Other methods had to be deployed to ensure that materials were delivered and that inefficiencies, such as leaving loaded wagons at the mercy of air attacks, were reduced. Speer recommended the deployment of party local leaders who, together with station masters, could organize alternative transport, get railway wagons unloaded, and convey important communications by car or motorbike to the army commanders. However, minor improvisations to try to keep things moving could not gloss over, even for Hitler, the fact that the end was approaching. With the end of the war and the onset of a post-Hitler era plainly in view, Speer's considerable energies were not least directed, in collaboration with industrial leaders and the army, at preserving what could be saved of German industry. Industrialists were under no illusions about the outcome of the war. Their main concern was avoiding the total destruction of their industries in a futile struggle so that they could be swiftly restored and continue in operation when Hitler was gone. Albert Fogler, head of the Federated Steelworks and among the Ruhr's foremost industrial magnates, a long-standing Hitler supporter, asked the minister directly, in full recognition of the desolate state of the economy, when Hitler would end the conflict. We're losing too much substance, he said. How shall we be able to reconstruct if the destruction of industry goes on like this only a few months longer? Neither Speer's later actions to fend off Hitler's scorched earth order, nor that order itself, came out of thin air. Under the ever more obvious fiction that immobilizing rather than totally destroying German industrial installations would enable them to be restored to working conditions as soon as the areas lost to military action were retaken, Speer had been issuing corresponding directives both on the eastern and western fronts since July. In early December, he had to contend with instructions from Keitel indicating Hitler's wish that, where industrial installations could be quickly reconstructed to serve the enemy, they should be completely destroyed, not just paralyzed. Keitel emphasized, in particular, that the Tsar coal mines should on no account be allowed to fall, undestroyed, into enemy hands. Speer evidently intervened directly with Hitler to have the order amended. The same day he wired Zarbrucken, all directives stating that coal mines are not to be crippled but destroyed are invalid. The Führer has again stipulated today that he only wants the coal mines to be crippled in the way we have established. Four days later, Keitel transmitted Hitler's decision that industrial installations endangered by the enemy in the area of Army Group G were merely to be crippled, not destroyed, and that all contrary orders were cancelled. Speer's exertions to head off the destruction of Germany's industry were not, however, over yet. The big conflict with Hitler on this front still awaited him. Speer was clear-sighted enough to see the scale of the mounting disaster, but his strenuous efforts to keep the collapsing war economy functioning never wavered. Whatever motives he had, his efforts helped to maintain his position of power and influence at a time when they were under threat. To one so power-conscious, this mattered. Of course, Speer and his able subordinates in the armaments ministry, realists as most of them were, apart perhaps from the incorrigible super-optimist, Zauer, knew full well that they could not prevent the inexorable disintegration of the war economy. Without their extraordinary endeavors, and capacity for improvisation, however, it is difficult to see how the German war effort could have staggered on until May 1945. 3. 
The other members of the power quadrumvirate, Goebbels, Himmler, and Bormann, also strived to the utmost during the fraught autumn weeks to ensure there was no slacking of the war effort. They gave no hint whatsoever that the war was unwinnable, maintaining a complete grip on the population through propaganda, organization, and unrelenting coercion. One task was to provide the Gauleiter, crucial figures in the power apparatus in the regions, with the backing they felt they needed. Towards the end of October, Bormann had passed on to Himmler a copy of a communication from Gauleiter Friedrich Karl Florian, the provincial boss of the Dusseldorf area and spokesman of the Western Gauleiter, about the extremely serious and difficult situation caused by air raids on cities and the transport network. Florian stated that this could not be mastered and could become threatening unless accelerated aid from the Reich were forthcoming. Meetings with individual ministers or their officials had so far been without powers of decision. The Western Gauleiter now sought new ways to persuade Hitler to order a meeting of ministers, to be chaired by Bormann, to coordinate measures on food, transport, armaments, labor, and other urgent issues without delay. Bormann agreed to the meeting, but at Hitler's request handed responsibility for it to Himmler. The meeting took place on the 3rd of November, attended by representatives of the party, the Wehrmacht, business, and state secretaries from relevant ministries in the insignificant location of klein Berkel in Lower Saxony, not far from Hummeln in the Hanover area, well secluded from the threat of air raids. One of Himmler's bright ideas was that towns away from the beleaguered western and eastern areas could sponsor a lorry carrying an electricity generator. The town's name would be proudly displayed on the vehicle, which would come with a driver. In this way, Himmler suggested, something could be done in good spirit and with humor. Just as unpromising was his suggestion of creating mobile flak units on trains and lorries to shoot down low-flying bombers. This initiative was to be accompanied by a competition for sharpshooters, organized by the party, with the winners rewarded with the Iron Cross Second Class. Another suggestion, unlikely to be overwhelmed by a rush of volunteers, was the setting up of short training sessions on defusing bombs, so that ordinary citizens, not just specialists, could help save lives, although often at the expense of their own. Lessons could be learned from the Russians, who, if no motorized vehicles were available, used ponies and traps, sledges, and even prams to carry munitions to the front. We have a lot to learn in improvisation, remarked Himmler. Manpower had to be pumped into the regions of Essen, Dusseldorf, and Cologne-Aachen for fortification work to free up labor from these areas to repair the railways. Keeping coal moving and the arteries to the front open was vital. Men were to be housed in barracks and fed in canteens. He would have Bormann dispatch 100,000 men from the regions in central Germany to help build the entrenchments. Himmler undertook to provide additional labor from Polish, Slovakian, and Russian prisoners of war for railway work. He would also supply around five to six hundred prisoners currently held in four goods trains belonging to the SS Railway Construction Brigade, and find another ten trains stuffed with prisoners to complement them. Another forty thousand workers were to be drawn from the mammoth construction body, the organization taught, and five hundred vehicles commandeered from Italy to move them around. He exhorted the Gauleiter to coordinate emergency food distribution following air raids to ensure that one area was not privileged over another. He emphasized the value of the Volkssturm to be provided, he declared, with 350,000 rifles before the end of the year. The Warsaw Rising had shown, to Germany's cost, he implied, that there was no better defensive position than a ruined city. The Volkssturm existed to mobilize the endless resources within the German people for patriotic defense. Fighting to the last bullet in the ruins to defend every German city had to be indeed, not just words. It's hard to imagine that his own words were greatly reassuring for his audience. He ended with a rhetorical flourish, perhaps heard with differing levels of conviction, evoking patriotic defense, a vision of the future, and loyalty to Hitler.
We will defend our land and are at the start of a great world empire. As the curve sometimes goes down, so one day it will go up again. He believed all present agreed that the difficulties, however great, could be mastered. There are no difficulties that cannot be mastered by us all with dogged tenacity, optimism, and humor. I believe all our concerns are small compared with those of one man in Germany, our Führer. All that was to be done was no more than duty towards the man whom we have to thank for the resurrection of Germany, the essence of our existence, Adolf Hitler. Himmler had naturally been unable to offer any panacea, and was in no position to meet the Gauleiter's demands, given the scale of the transport crisis. The Gauleiter were far from satisfied. All they gained was the hope that sufficient aid would come from the Reich to tide over the worst of the crisis. For the rest, they had to resort to self-help, and passing on to the district leaders responsibility for repairs to the railway in their own areas. The meeting, Goebbels concluded, had come to nothing. If the Gauleiter were left to cope as best they could, Himmler's address had nevertheless ruled out any alternative to retaining a positive and constructive approach to the worst difficulties. As high representatives of the regime, they were expected not to bow to problems, a sign of weakness and lack of resolve, but to show initiative in finding improvised solutions. Not least, Himmler appealed to their loyalty to Hitler, whose charismatic authority rested ultimately on the personal bonds built into the Nazi system. And as arch-loyalists for many years, who owed their power entirely to Hitler, and who had nothing to lose, the Gauleiter were far from ready to contemplate deserting him. Their bonds to Hitler might have weakened, but they had not broken. The public face of the regime was still not flinching. The notion of the power of will to overcome difficulties, central to the operation of charismatic authority throughout the system, ran, in its essence, completely counter to impersonal bureaucratic administration, the basis of all modern states. The party had always distinguished between the positive, desirable qualities of leadership of people and the negative, arid attributes of mere administration. Leaders, at whatever level, made things happen. Bureaucrats simply administered rules and regulations, which invariably, unless overridden by will, blocked initiative and sapped dynamism. Yet the party, despite its unbureaucratic ethos, in seeking to implement the wishes and long-term goals of the Führer, had, of course, in reality always been intensely bureaucratic as an organization. The tension in trying bureaucratically to work towards unbureaucratic ends, had been there from the start, had increased greatly after the takeover of power, and had intensified dramatically in conditions of total war. In late 1944, when less and less could be achieved, the party bureaucracy went into overdrive. Time and energy were expended by a bloated party officialdom on the most trivial matters. The party chancellery squandered countless hours, for instance, drawing up regulations on the minutiae of Volkssturm service, stipulating duties, regulating training periods, laying down rules about clothing and equipment, dealing with exemptions, and, among the most notable absurdities, designating letterheads and service seals, and providing detailed descriptions of the insignia to be used by different ranks. Goebbels described the bureaucracy involved as laughable, but it was unrelenting. When Bormann moved to Hitler's new field headquarters in Siegenburg, near Bad Nauheim, in Hessen, prior to the start of the Ardennes Offensive, he found teleprinters were unsuitably installed, no teleprinter cables connected, neither typewriter desks nor shelves set up in the tiny room where my typists have to work. Even so, the bureaucratic output from his party chancellery continued unabated. The regime's unfolding of bureaucratic, controlling energy at all levels was little short of astonishing. Orders poured out. Every official, however minor, groaned under the suffocating load of paperwork on the desk, despite efforts to save paper. 
The Reich Post Minister wrote to all the offices of state, at both Reich and regional levels, complaining bitterly that the postal system was greatly overburdened to the increase in bureaucracy. A swelling mass of communication, like an avalanche, was how he described it, at precisely a time when the damage to the rail network and postal installations, together with loss of personnel in the Wehrmacht, had gravely affected the efficiency of the service. His urgent entreaties to reduce the level of post fell on deaf ears. More and more was controlled, orchestrated, regulated, ordained, militarized, directed, and organized, yet less and less resulted from all the effort, except, crucially, the stifling of all remaining limited levels of personal free space in the system. If total society has a meaning in the sense that little or nothing not subjected to regime control existed any longer, and that opinion deviating from the official stance could be openly expressed only at great personal risk, then Germany, towards the end of 1944, was approaching such a state. As living conditions worsened drastically under the pounding from Allied bombs, the pressure on the population intensified. The total war effort, for instance, far from subsiding after the extreme exertions of the late summer, redoubled its attempt in the autumn to dredge up all possible remaining reserves of manpower for the Wehrmacht. Goebbels pointed out at the beginning of November that by this time 900,000 extra men had been provided for the Wehrmacht, but he admitted it was not enough. The losses in the previous three months had numbered 1.2 million. He wanted Hitler's support for pressing a reluctant Speer to surrender more men from the armament sector. Speer eventually agreed to give up 30,000 men, although only temporarily, until they could be redeployed once the transport situation had improved. Goebbels could not accept the condition, so the matter was left to be resolved by Hitler. As so often, no decision was forthcoming. More important for Goebbels, however, was for him to have authority from Hitler to comb out the Wehrmacht for additional personnel to be sent to the front, as he had done earlier in the civilian sector. He finally managed to gain Hitler's signature to a decree to this effect on the 10th of December. Goebbels felt revitalized, bursting with new energy, and determined to overcome all opposition within the army itself to raise new forces for Hitler. He expected once more working through a small directing staff and the Gauleiter at the regional level, to attain very positive results in the new year. He was convinced that only his total war drive had made the coming Western offensive at all possible. He now hoped, he said, to be able to give the Fuhrer the basis of an offensive army in the East, as the combing out of the civilian sector had provided one for the West. It was, of course, wishful thinking. But in these weeks, Goebbels veered between an evident sense of realism about Germany's plight, brought home to him most forcefully through the destruction of one German city after another, through Allied bombing, which, unlike Hitler, he saw at first hand in visits to bombed-out localities, and continued hope that willpower, shored up by propaganda, would sustain the fight, whatever the odds, until the shaky enemy coalition cracked. The political crisis in the enemy camp grows daily. It was only one of repeated assertions that the internal divisions and the losses they were suffering would split the coalition before long. Numerous diary entries hint at skepticism about Germany's position, and when he viewed the impressive new, highly modern U-boats being built in Bremen at the end of November, he sighed despairingly that it was all too late. Yet he had far from given up hope. Following a long talk with Hitler, lasting deep into the night, a few days later, when the embattled Fuhrer exuded confidence, expounded excitedly on the forthcoming offensive, and envisioned a grandiose rebuilding of German cities, and revitalization of culture after the war, Goebbels was so excited that he could not sleep. He was still, as he always had been, in thrall to Hitler. Propaganda, in his view, had the vital task of reinforcing the will to resist and strengthening the backbone of the nation again and restoring its diminished self-confidence. Ceremonies held throughout Germany 
where the newly created Folkstrom swore their oaths of allegiance, around 100,000 men, in ten separate ceremonies in Berlin alone, on Sunday, the 12th of November, were part of this task. In seasonal mist and with the ruins of the Wilhelm Platz as a macabre backdrop, Goebbels addressed the arrayed Folkstrom men from the balcony of the propaganda ministry. Some are already armed, he recorded in his diary, unwittingly acknowledging the impoverished levels of support for the new organization. In fact, rifles, bazookas, and some machine guns had been handed out just before the ceremony. Few of the men knew how to use them, but in any case, they had to give them up again once the ceremony was over. Silence fell across the square as, lacking uniforms, they doffed their caps and hats in an oath to the Fuhrer, before marching past in sacred earnestness. Everything was filmed to make a big impression in the newsreels. The optical effect was excellent, remarked Goebbels' aide Wilfred von Oven. But what the cameras did not show were young boys and soldiers on leave standing on the footpaths and doing their best not to laugh at the march past. The Folkstrom was not worth a shot of powder, in von Oven's view. As a further attempt to maintaining fighting spirit, Goebbels had, in 1943, commissioned the color film Kohlberg, a grand spectacular aimed at turning the defense of the Pomeranian coastal town of that name, during the Napoleonic Wars, into an heroic epic to inspire the present-day defenders of the Reich. By the end of 1944, the film, with an enormous cast of extras, apparently including 187,000 soldiers, temporarily removed from active service at a time when new recruits for the front were being so desperately sought, was almost ready. Goebbels was hugely impressed on seeing a rough cut at the beginning of December, by what he called a masterpiece that answered all the questions now bothering the German people. He had great expectations of the film, which he thought worth a victorious battle in its likely impact on the mood of the public. But he feared scenes of destruction and despair would have the effect that, in the current situation, many Germans would decide against viewing it. As the comment betrays, Goebbels was fully aware of the uphill task he faced in overcoming the deep pall of gloom in Germany as the disastrous year of 1944 neared its close. 4. The reports reaching Goebbels from the regional propaganda offices left no doubt of the worrying state of morale. News of the success in repelling the Red Army in East Prussia made scarcely a dent in the depressed mood in early November. Feelings ranged from extreme anxiety about the future and anger at being left defenseless as bombs rained down on German cities to wearied resignation, also among party members, especially in the West, and fatalism. Large parts of the population just wanted peace at any price. In Western regions, where the population was most exposed to the nightly horror of devastation from the skies, now being inflicted upon most of Germany's big industrial cities, the mood was at rock bottom. Amid the jangled nerves and constant worry, Goebbels noted, outright anger towards the party, held responsible for the war and its consequences, could be heard. It was scarcely surprising. Cologne, for instance, was subjected to another huge attack on the night of the 30th of October in what one witness described as the city's death blow. The quarter of a million people still living there, until the heavy raids started, there had been around 800,000, had no gas or electricity. The little water available was only to be had at hydrants in the street. The NSV distributed meager food rations to people standing in queues. Almost all remaining habitable parts of the city were now destroyed. There was a stampede to leave as masses of refugees gathered with their few possessions at the Rhine bridges. But an immediate organized evacuation was impossible because of lack of transport. The rail crisis meant trains could not be laid on. Any military vehicle going east was stopped and loaded to capacity with those fleeing the city. There was much bitterness directed at the regime and a sense of the futility of the conflict. The exodus lasted for more than a week. Cologne was now virtually a ghost city, as Goebbels put it, 
this lovely Rhine metropolis, as at least for the time being, to be written off. Among the remnants of the population, housed in impoverished barracks or surviving in cellars in the ruined shell of the city, groups of dissident youths, foreign workers, deserted soldiers, and former Communist Party members took to despairing kinds of partisan-like active resistance, which reached its climax in December. With hand grenades and machine guns that they had managed to steal from Wehrmacht depots, they waged their own war against the Cologne police, killing the head of the Gestapo in the city, and in one incident, engaging in a twelve-hour armed battle with police before being overwhelmed. Only with difficulty did the Gestapo attain the upper hand before taking savage vengeance on the two hundred or so members of the resistance groups whom they arrested. No similar action materialized in the other cities of the rhine ruhr industrial belt, but hundreds of thousands experienced similar misery to that of the population of Cologne following the devastating raids on Bochum, Duisburg, and Oberhausen, and other major cities of the region over the autumn. The mood in the Ruhr was bad. The air war was creating a downright despairing mood, Goebbels noted from the reports reaching him. There was only a single topic of conversation, the war weariness of all people. Still, there was no collapse of discipline, either in the workplace or in the army. People carried out to the best of their ability what they took to be their duty. There were no signs of sabotage, strikes, or, beyond the events in Cologne, other prominent forms of resistance. Dr. Walter Rowland thought shortly after the end of the war that the reason for what he saw as the extraordinary effort made by workers who had little enthusiasm for the war or the regime was that each single person felt clearly that, on the one hand, there was no opportunity for the individual to take action against the war. However, if the war was lost, then, in contrast to 1914 to 1918, Germany also, and with her possibilities of existence for the individual, would be lost. Such fears were given sustenance by the propaganda gift of the Morgenthau Plan, as the program prepared by the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau, to split up post-war Germany into a powerless, dismembered country with a pre-industrial economy, swiftly became known to the German public. On the 12th of December, Goebbels went to the Ruhr district to assess the situation for himself, and while he was there witnessed a heavy air raid on Witten, turning much of the town into a raging inferno. He also saw the misery of the 100,000-strong population of Balkum, deprived of all amenities, existing in primitive conditions and cellars, and little more than holes in the ground. His speech in the Krupp factory in Essen failed to rouse the grim-faced workers, who had been dragooned into hearing him, collars turned up against the bitter cold, hands deep in their pockets. The applause was meager, and had scarcely died down when the sirens began to wail. The propaganda minister and his entourage had swiftly to take cover, in the vaulted cellars deep underground, where they encountered gray, disconsolate faces. Little was said, but the glances on the men's faces were not friendly. Goebbels was made fully aware of the strength of feeling among the party and industrial leaders of the Rhine and Ruhr about the failings of Goering, blamed for the inability to protect German cities against the gangsters of the air. And also Ribbentrop, held generally in contempt, and seen as inept in his conduct of foreign policy, but came away convinced of their continued blind, unshakable faith in Hitler. In early December, Goebbels was still persuading himself that faith in the Führer is largely unshaken, and many, after seeing the troop build up near the Western Front and sensing a coming offensive, are again beginning to believe in a German victory. It was in the main a delusion. It is true that among the party elite, those wielding power in the regions as well as at the center of the regime, there were no signs that loyalty towards Hitler was starting to flake. And in enabling the regime to continue to function, this is what mattered. Among the civilian population, however, beyond party diehards and sections of youth 
it was in the main a different matter. By the end of November, propaganda reports were indicating the danger of a crisis in confidence in the leadership, which can no longer be ignored. The concern was seen as important and urgent. For the first time, Hitler had failed to speak in person. Himmler read out his proclamation at the annual gathering in Munich of the party Old Guard for the Putsch commemoration on the 8th of November. Immediately, rumors flared up, mostly arising from foreign speculation, that he was dead or seriously ill, had suffered a nervous breakdown, or had fled and that Himmler or Goebbels had taken over. Still, popular belief in Hitler had not altogether vanished, and indeed, even at this late hour, there were those who clung as a drowning man clings to a piece of wood to their long-held faith in the Führer and in his ability to save Germany. But such people were in a dwindling minority. Hitler's charisma, in the sense of its popular appeal, was by now fast-fading. On the eve of the Ardennes offensive, Goebbels recorded in his diary a somewhat sobering assessment of popular feeling on the basis of the reports, themselves inevitably tending to emphasize the positive wherever they could, sent in by the regional propaganda offices. The skepticism in the German public continues, he noted. There's no proper faith in German powers of resistance. There have been too many military disappointments recently for the people to be easily able to build up 